Good morning. Welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. I'm Councilmember Adrienne Adams, the chair of this subcommittee. Before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that translation services are available in Spanish, Cantonese, and Mandarin. Please go out of the double doors if you need these services in the back into the rotunda to obtain translation services for this hearing. We are joined today by Council Members Ku, Richards, Gordenchik, Ayawa, Kozlowitz, Chin, Drum, Levin, Salamanca, Van Bramer, and Lanceman and Richards. Today's hearing is on the proposed ULERP actions needed to create a new borough-based jail system. Approval of the ULERP applications would not only facilitate the construction of four new borough-based jails, but would lead to the closure of the detention centers at Rikers Island, the Manhattan Detention Center, Brooklyn House, and the Vernon Bain Correctional Center, creating a new opportunity to transform our criminal justice system. The work to close Rikers Island has been ongoing for years. It started with formerly incarcerated individuals and criminal justice reform advocates demanding more of us. With firsthand knowledge of how inhumane and destructive Rikers Island was, they set forth to make a change no one would have believed possible at the time. Joined by Judge Jonathan Lippman and the City Council, they boldly recommended that the city close Rikers Island and instead build new borough-based jails which were designed and operated more compassionately, closer to the homes of detainees so those precious social links with family and friends could be maintained. The mayor, to his credit, embraced these recommendations and started the public process of planning and siting these new facilities. We now have an opportunity to learn from the mistakes of our past and plot a new course for our future. But there are certainly many substantive issues left to resolve first. We must ensure these new buildings are able to successfully integrate into their respective communities, accompanied with reasonable local investments. We must also make the necessary design improvements policy changes, and programmatic investments to create a criminal justice system focused on restoration and not punishment. I recognize that there are many community-based constituents and stakeholders who feel strongly about this project. Through the many public hearings in the ULERP process, we have already heard from community residents concerned about the impact of the new buildings on their quality of life. We've heard from the criminal justice advocates and the formerly incarcerated who understand the principles that compel us to close and demolish the existing correction centers, as well as those who want to ensure we reform our criminal justice system and treat communities that have been devastated by mass incarceration with the dignity they deserve. The City Council takes our role in the process very, very seriously. We've been actively listening to the public, to all the public feedback to date. Likewise, we will be listening to you today and will carefully consider all these concerns over the next few weeks in the lead up to our vote. The borough-based jail system ULERP application is comprised of 13 related items or land use actions. I will briefly describe them now. Application number N190334ZRY is for an amendment of Article 7, Chapter 4 of the Zoning Resolution in order to create a citywide special permit for a borough-based jail system. Application number C190336ZMX is for an amendment of the zoning map changing from an M1-3 district to an M1-47X district and establishing a special mixed-use district, MX-18, bounded by East 142nd Street, a line 100 feet southeasterly of Concord Avenue, East 141st Street, and Concord Avenue, Borough of the Bronx. Application number N10337ZRX is for an amendment of Article 12, Chapter 3 of the Zoning Resolution of the City of New York for the purpose of establishing a mixed-use district 
and modifying Appendix F for the purpose of establishing a mandatory inclusionary housing area for property located in the borough of the Bronx. Application number C190338HAX is for the designation of an urban development action area, approval of an urban development action area project for such area, and the disposition city-owned property located at 320 Concord Avenue and 745 East 141st Street, Block 2574, PO Lot 1, in the borough of the Bronx. Application number C190333PSY is for the site selection of the following properties for borough-based jail facilities. 745 East 141st Street, Block 2574, PO Lot 1, Borough of the Bronx. 275 Atlantic Avenue, Block 175, Lot 1, Borough of Brooklyn. 124 White Street, Block 198, Lot 1, and 125 White Street, Block 167, Lot 1, Borough of Manhattan. And 126 02 82nd Avenue, Block 9653, Lot 1, 80 25126th Street, Block 9657, Lot 1, and the bed of 82nd Avenue between 126th and 132nd Streets, Borough of Queens. Application number 190335ZSX is for the grant of a special permit pursuant to proposed section 74-832 of the zoning resolution to modify these regulations, floor area radi uh, ratio requirements, height and setback requirements, permitted parking requirements, and loading berth requirements of the underlying zoning to facilitate the construction of a borough-based jail facility on property loaded, located in an M1-3 district at 320 Concord Avenue, Block 2574, PO Lot 1, Borough of the Bronx. Application number 190339ZSK is for the grant of a special permit pursuant to proposed section 74-832 of the zoning resolution to modify the floor area ratio requirements of the underlying zoning and the applicable special district, the height and setback requirements of the underlying zoning and applicable special district, the permitted parking and loading berth requirements of the underlying zoning, and the special ground floor use and transparency requirements of the applicable special district to facilitate the construction of a borough-based jail facility on property located at 275 Atlantic Avenue, Block 175, Lot 1, and the portions of State Street between Borum Place and Smith Street proposed to be demapped under a concurrent related application within the special downtown Brooklyn district Borough of Brooklyn. Application number C190116MMK is for an amendment to the city map involving the elimination, discontinuance, and closing of State Street between Borum Place and Smith Street above a lower limiting plane and below an upper limiting plane, the adjustment of grades and block dimensions necessitated thereby, and authorization for any acquisition or disposition of real property related thereto in the borough of Brooklyn. Application number C190340ZSM is for the grant of a special permit pursuant to proposed section 74-832 of the zoning resolution to modify the floor area ra ratio requirements, height and setback requirements, and loading berth requirements of the underlying zoning to facilitate the construction of a borough-based jail facility on property located at 124-125 White Street, Block 167, Lot 1, Block 198, Lot 1, and the portions of White Street between Center Street and Baxter Street proposed to be demapped under a concurrent related application in the borough of Manhattan. Application number 190252MMM is for an amendment to the city map involving the elimination, discontinuance, and closing of a volume of a portion of White Street from Center Street to Baxter Street within limiting planes, the adjustment of grades and block dimensions necessitated thereby, and authorization for any acquisition or disposition of real property related thereto, borough of Manhattan. Application number 190341PQM is for the acquisition of property for a borough-based jail facility located at 124 White Street, Block 198, Lot 1, Borough of Manhattan. 
application number 190342ZSQ is for the grant of a special permit pursuant to proposed section 74-832 of the zoning resolution to modify floor area ratio requirements, the height and setback requirements, the permitted accessory parking requirements, the permitted parking garage requirements, and the loading berth requirements of the underlying zoning to facilitate the construction of a borough-based jail facility on property located at 126-02 82nd Avenue, aka 80 through 85, 126th Street, Block 9653, Lot 1, Block 9657, Lot 1, and the portion of 82nd Avenue between 126th Street and 132nd Street proposed to be demapped under a related concurrent application, Borough of Queens. Application number 190117MMQ is for an amendment to the city map involving the elimination, discontinuance, and the closing of 82nd Avenue between 126th Street and 132nd Street, the elimination of two public places within the area bounded by Union Turnpike, 132nd Street, Hoover Avenue, Queens Boulevard, 82nd Avenue, and 126th Street, the adjustment of grades and block dimensions necessitated thereby, and authorization for any acquisition or disposition of real property related thereto, Borough of Queens. Carl. Thank you. We have been joined by Councilmember Powers. At this time, we will have a statement by Chair Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Chair Adams, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we are here to discuss the administration's plans to close Rikers Island and Site 4 borough-based jails. There are no shortage of horror stories about the conditions on Rikers Island. Heart-wrenching accounts from individuals who have experienced life on the island have led us to this pivotal moment in our city's history. As a council member, I have toured the facility and seen firsthand the shocking environment in which people are housed. If we are ever going to have a fair jail system in New York City, it starts with shutting down Rikers. While this objective is clear, the path in which this application has navigated has, has left many disappointed. Following the recommendations of the commission led by Judge Littman, the administration set out to create a jail system that was more efficient for people in the system. Among the policy goals laid out, citing locations that were close to borough, to borough courthouses and existing detention complexes were necessary in order to improve access to legal representation and streamline transfers between jails and courts. In Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn, the city fulfilled this goal. In the Bronx, however, the administration picked a site that is located two and a half miles from the Bronx Courthouse and has been discussed as an area for large-scale affordable housing development. Community stakeholders, elected officials alike, immediately spoke out against this location for an array of reasons. Despite a pledge to have meaningful community engagement, the details surrounding the Bronx jail has felt more like a one-sided conversation strictly meant to check off a box. Even after opposition from the community board and the borough president, the administration continues to ask Bronxites to approve a plan that would develop one of the tallest buildings in the borough without so much as seeing a single design concept. Had the city had a better track record with the South Bronx, things could have been different. In the late 80s and 90s, the community found itself in a similar conversation. As an answer to accommodate the surging population on Rikers Island, the Dinkins administration opened up an 800-bed floating detention center in Hunts Point, the Vernon C. Bain Correctional Center, also known as the Barge, under the pretense that it would be a temporary solution. 27 years later, yes, 27 years later, in the face of an annual statistic showing a declining jail population, the Barge remains in operation casting a large shadow over the community for its own repressive legacy. I have relayed this message countless times to top administration officials and to Mayor de Blasio himself, 
Until the city acts on its long overdue promise to close the barge, the South Bronx cannot and will not accept the new jail. When criminal justice reforms meant 16 and, 70, 16 and 17 year olds would be transferred out of Rikers Island as part of Raise the Age, the South Bronx welcomed them to the Horizon Juvenile Detention Center in my district because it was the right thing to do. Given the circumstances surrounding the borough-based jail application, it is clear the proposed location is not the right one for the community. I call on the administration to listen to the community and do its due diligence in exploring all siting options at the location where the Bronx jail belongs, near the county courthouse. Furthermore, I call on the mayor to deliver on the promise his predecessors have failed to accomplish and sink the barge during his remaining time in office. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. We are joined today by the applicants for the borough-based jails application who will present the project. We will hear from them first, and then we will hear from members of the public. If you wish to speak, please fill out a white uh, speaker slip, which you can obtain from the Sergeant at Arms. In order to hear from as many members of the public as possible, each speaker will be given two minutes to testify, and we ask that public please keep your testimony to two minutes in length. If you're not able to condense your full testimony to two minutes, you may submit your full testimony in writing in person here today by giving it to the Sergeant at Arms or by emailing it to hearings at council.nyc.gov. Please write borough-based jails in the subject line if you choose to email additional testimony. Thank you in advance for your cooperation in this regard. And I now call on Elizabeth Glazer and Anna Kaplan from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and Commissioner Cynthia Bran and Brenda Cook from the Department of Correction. Before you begin, counsel will swear you in. Please each raise your right hand and before responding, state your name into the mic and your red light should be on. Do you each affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the council today and also in response to council member questions? Dana Kaplan, yes. Elizabeth Glazer, yes. Cynthia Brain, yes. Brenda Cook, yes. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Adams and members of the subcommittee on landmarks public siting and maritime uses, I and the other members of the council who are here today. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Glazer and I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Uh, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I'm joined, as you noted, uh, by uh, the Commissioner of the Department of Correction, Cynthia Brand, uh, Brenda Cook, the Chief of Staff uh, of uh, the Department of Correction, and my colleague, Dana Kaplan, who's a deputy director in my office. Um, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice advises the mayor on public safety strategy, and together with our, our partners inside and outside of government, develops uh, and implements policies that promote safety and fairness, reduce unnecessary incarceration, and build strong and safe neighborhoods. Today, we begin the final phase of the Uniform Land Use Review pr Procedure for the administration's plan to close the jails on Rikers Island and create modern and humane borough-based jails. It has truly taken a city to reach this point, and it will continue to take the commitment and work of many as we build justice. The leadership of the former and present city council speaker, the local council members and elected officials, and the voices and driving energy of those with lived experience in the justice system and the grassroots organiz organizations around close Rikers, as well as the former chief judge of the state of New York, Jonathan Littman, have all been crucial parts of the journey that got us here. And the city is grateful for their partnership and for their fierce advocacy. Our city is at a key moment. Over the past five years, uniquely in the nation, we have experienced steep reductions in the number of people in our jails, even as crime has continued to decline and the touch of enforcement has lightened. The work that produced these results is the foundation of the smaller, safer, and fairer justice system that we have achieved so far and that we continue to build upon. Today, we have the lowest incarceration rate of any big city in the nation while fewer than half the people uh, enter Rikers today than did when the mayor took office. 
Over the past six years, the number of people in custody on any given day has fallen from approximately 11,700 to 7,000. This is a long distance from the almost 23,000 people that were held in our jails at its height. For us, closing the jails on Rikers Island is not simply about changing locations or constructing new buildings. Our goal is to create buildings that stand as new models for justice, and they must be equally uh, ambitious in their design and function uh, to the transformational changes that have taken place and must continue to unfold in the city. And critically, they must provide the environment to promote culture change within. Together with our partners, we're working with urgency and making concrete progress on this every day to meet our goal of a new borough-based jail system by 2026. Creating a smaller, safer, and fairer jail system is a matter of justice. No one should be detained who could safely remain in the community, but it's also a practical matter. The fewer people in detention, the easier it will be to create a justice system that reimagines and refashions the culture and purpose of our jails. Based on the successful work we have already done together, we believe that by 2026, we will reach our goal of not more than 4,000 people in custody. Our projections are based on the 25 plus year trend of reductions in the jail population, the effect of continued reductions in crime, shortened case lengths, and continued expansions of safe alternatives to detention. Under the new borough-based jail system, the proposed new facilities would be fairer, designed to improve the health, educational, and social outcomes of those incarcerated, promote the dignity of all who are incarcerated, work, or enter the buildings, located in communities to increase access to families, attorneys, and social service providers, and in buildings designed to integrate into neighborhoods and serve as civic assets. They will be safer, designed to reduce violence with improved lines of sight due to modern layouts, smaller housing units, and better monitoring practices. And they will be more efficient, better connected to the rest of the justice system by improving access to courts, attorneys, and service providers and thus reducing associated transportation costs and unnecessary delays. Our jails hold up a mirror to the fair functioning of our justice system. We see these buildings as reflecting the best of our city and of a smaller, safer, and fairer system rooted in respect for the dignity of all who are incarcerated and work within them. Our proposed jails reflect a future that we have begun to sketch with many partners, New Yorkers, nonprofits, community leaders, justice system agencies, and others. Uh, this Euler process is a vital step forward on this path towards creating the safest and most humane justice system possible. Commissioner Jan Brand will now deliver testimony, and then after the commissioner's testimony, uh, Dana Kaplan and Brenda Cook. Uh, will uh, take you through a presentation of uh, the city's proposal. And then, of course, we'd be very happy to answer all your questions. Good morning, Chair Adams and members of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses, as well as all the other council members who are here with us this morning. As you know, my name is Cynthia Brennan, and I am the Commissioner of the Department of Correction. I'm pleased to be joined at the table with my Chief of Staff, Brenda Cook, and the leadership from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, all of whom I've been very proud to work with in a collective effort to support the creation of modern jail facilities for New York City that match our modern jail practices. The Department's commitment to closing Rikers Island and building a smaller network of modern community-based jails is rooted in an understanding that all New Yorkers deserve a criminal justice system that is smaller, safer, and fairer. That includes not only those who are detained, but also their family members and loved ones, the attorneys who represent them, and the dedicated staff who work in the city's jails, all of whom are entitled to facilities that reflect the department's modern values. In New York City, we are building an overall justice system in which crime continues to decline. Fewer people are incarcerated and more resources are dedicated to supporting those who become involved with the justice system. At the Department of Correction, we believe that a new borough-based system will deepen this commitment, 
while further ensuring that all New Yorkers are treated with dignity and respect. For this reason and more, I am pleased to join you this morning to express the department's commitment to closing Rikers and discuss the positive impact a borough-based system would have on everyone living and working in the department's facilities. As you all know, DOC is a vast, complex organization. We currently operate 11 separate jail facilities on and off Rikers Island, as well as two hospital prison wards and court facilities in each borough. In addition, we operate support services divisions, including our transportation division and facility maintenance division. Our staff are responsible for the care and custody of approximately 7,000 individuals every day and process over 39,000 admissions annually. The department itself is comprised of approximately 12,000 members of staff, a total which does not include employees of Correctional Health Services, the Department of Education, Board of Correction, and the Bronx District Attorney's Office, all who also work in our facilities. In addition to the program providers and volunteers who provide services to the individuals in our care. Simply put, this department is tasked with providing safe and appropriate living and working spaces for thousands of individuals on a daily basis. Our staff should be able to conduct their, conduct their important and challenging work in buildings designed to enhance security and safety, just as the individuals in our care should be housed in facilities that support their well-being and rehabilitation. Unfortunately, that is not the case on Rikers Island or in our Carroll Borough facilities, all which are woefully out of date. Our buildings are decades old, have experienced significant wear and tear, and in many cases, have unfixable structural elements that contribute to the negative impacts of incarceration. These buildings have outlived their usefulness. Some of our facilities, such as the case of temporary mods installed in the 1980s, have remained operational for more than 30 years beyond their intended use. Keeping our facilities in a state of good repair requires ongoing attention and significant capital commitment, both of which take time and resources away from the true purpose of the department. This agency is committed to being part of a 21st century approach to criminal justice but in order to do that, we need 21st century facilities. For the department, closing Rikers is an opportunity to build new modern jails that align with and enhance correctional best practices. Though conversations about design are only just beginning, we are working with all stakeholders to ensure that new jails will be designed with enhanced safety and security in mind. In addition to better lines of sight for our officers, these facilities will localize activities like recreation and programming in order to reduce movement, which in turn reduces opportunity for violence. Localized program delivery also ensures that any alarms or emergency events will disrupt services for as few individuals as possible. Further, we intend for our new jails to be climate controlled, ensuring more humane living and working conditions for everyone who steps foot into a department facility. Additionally, the department has experience operating high-rise jail facilities and remains confident that safety and security can be achieved in the proposed new buildings. The department recognizes the fundamental importance of keeping individuals in custody connected to their families and communities. Community connection is linked to positive post-incarceration outcomes and remains critical to an individual's success both in and outside of the department's custody. Due to the remote location of Rikers Island and the cramped and narrow spaces in our borough facilities, visiting a loved one in the department's care is a challenging experience. New borough-based facilities will not only ease the burden on families and loved ones, but also enable the department to create visitor spaces that welcomes the community and ensures an environmental design that isn't a barrier to much needed connection. Over the past year, the department has been proud to partner with agencies like MockJ to listen to the concerns of community members. We are committed to being a good neighbor, and I am proud that these conversations have led to some positive immediate changes, including a community beautification effort outside of the Manhattan Detention Center. Since the inception of this borough-based jail plan, 
my staff and I have attended countless community meetings and public hearings to discuss a number of important questions and concerns related to the borough-based facilities and the work of the Department of Correction. I remain consistently impressed by the passion of New Yorkers and their strong commitment to their communities. Our goal is to fit seamlessly into and support these communities of Chinatown, Borham Hill, Maud Haven, and Kew Gardens. Should this plan move forward, we will continue to work with all stakeholders to ensure that this important dialogue remains open. As I have previously testified before this council, the Department of Correction takes its culture change efforts seriously, and we are not waiting to move into new facilities to begin this important work. <coughs> I am aware that there are voices in the community that have suggested that the department is incapable of the kind of culture change these new facilities demand, and I believe it's entirely appropriate for New Yorkers to question the way their jails are managed. I would like to assure those who hold these concerns that this is not the same department as it was five years ago. We have not only reformed many of our practices, but we have become national leaders in forward-thinking correctional practice. Since 2014, we have engaged in historic reforms to create a safer and more humane jail system. Providing engaging programming is a key component to the department's 14-point anti-violence agenda as a program engagement reduces idle time and supports detainees in focusing on their future. Prior to this administration, the department provided an average of less than one hour a day of non-school programming. Today, the department offers a wide variety of programming that promotes wellness and assists with successful reentry. The department is also continuing its rollout of tablet-based programming. In May of this year, the department entered into a two-year partnership with CUNY Institute for State and Local Government to solidify the department's vision for organizational culture and identify the explicit goals and actions necessary to achieve it. The partnership will further result in the creation of robust performance metrics and a performance management system, which will be used to evaluate the department's success in, its, in achieving our important culture change goals. Helping individuals maintain connections to family and support networks is critical. In order to combat the barriers that impede visitation, we implemented a free visitor bus that provides hourly transportation to and from the island on visit days from Harlem and Central Brooklyn. In the first year of operation, the buses provided over 75,000 free rides to and from the island. Further, we partnered with the Children's Museum of Manhattan to offer mothers in custody an opportunity to visit with their children at an off-site location. This program has gained national attention, and we have been contacted by other jurisdictions across the country looking to replicate our model. Significant reforms have been, used, been made in the use of punitive segregation, both by eliminating its use for adolescents, young adults, and those with serious mental illness, and by creating program and therapeutic-based housing units that offer targeted support for individuals following an infraction. Since 2014, the department has reduced the number of individuals in punitive segregation by approximately 80%, and we continue to be a national leader in punitive segregation reform. In order to ensure that everyone in our custody is safely and appropriately housed, we have implemented a policy of housing by gender identity, we have also recently hired a director of LGBTQI initiatives to support the department in providing responsive programs and housing options to all individuals. Further, we have begun meeting bi-monthly with advocates and experts on transgender policy issues in order to better inform our policies and practices. We are proud of these achievements over the past several years and look forward to creating a new system that is safer, more humane, and promotes better outcomes for individuals, families, and communities. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify about the critical need for borough-based jails for the City of New York and for your continued support. My colleagues and I are, are available to answer any questions. All right, uh, good morning, uh, Chair Adams and members of the City Council. Thank you, of course, for your time and attention to this critical matter. 
and I will, I'm Dana Kaplan, and I will walk you through the presentation and overview of the city's proposed plan. So first of all, uh, to be clear, of course, the purpose of uh, what brings us here today is the closure of the jails on Rikers Island as well as the closure of the barge. We agree that both the jails on Rikers and the barge are not emblematic of the justice system that we are committed to building. And that has been made clear by many of the community organizations, justice-involved individuals and leaders in this room that have made this the clarion call for New York City. We are talking about moving from a system, as was said earlier, of 11 active city jails to four. Eight active jails on Rikers Island, nine before the closure of GMDC, to four proposed facilities citywide. This is moving from what is right now over 11,000 active jail beds, uh, over 13,000 before the closure of GMDC, to a total system-wide capacity of 4,600. So this is a significant reduction in the capacity of our city's jail systems across the board. And of course, we remain focused not just on the facilities themselves, but as Commissioner Brand spoke of, the continued focus on culture change, reentry, and community engagement. The goals of this are to build a system that is more fair in terms of more humane facilities that have better health, educational, and social outcomes and have fewer people in them, safer by providing smaller housing units with better lines of sight that are better for both people in detention and safer for facility staff, and more efficient efficiency in terms of being closer to the courts so that people are not woken up at three or four in the morning uh, to travel long distances, and so that service providers, attorneys, and loved ones can visit their uh, families much easier or their clients. It cannot be said enough the extent to which this is an incredible reduction in the number of people in detention that is historic. In the early 1990s, we had over 22,000 people in detention on a given day in New York City. We had over 11,000 people in detention on a given day when this mayor took office. We are hovering around 7,000 today, and we are planning for an average daily population of no more than 4,000 people in detention by the time these facilities are open. This has been not an accident, but it has been the intentional work and advocacy of countless individuals, nonprofit providers, the changing efforts and culture within our city's courts, uh, the action of public defenders, and an investment of hundreds of millions of dollars from the city into programs such as supervised release and crisis management programs that have helped us to drive down crime as well as diverting individuals from detention. Obviously, this has been uh, quite a process to get us uh, here to date. I just want to highlight some of the key changes that have been made in this plan before I go through the different sites. So the changes that have been made to this plan to date is that we are proposing a smaller system overall. One, as a result of bail reform, we have updated what were our initial projections of an average daily population of 5,000 individuals to an average daily population of 1,000 fewer people. We have also made a change to reflect a smaller inefficiency rate, so we're planning for about a 15% uh, swing space consideration. These changes uh, have been one of the factors that have already reduced the height of the proposed facilities and the proposed maximum envelope, as well as the density of our application. In response to feedback that we've received from both justice organizations and from neighborhoods, we have made some changes to the plan, including removing the proposed arraignment court from the Bronx facility, removing the centralized special medical annex from the Queens facility, and in response to the direct feedback that we received from countless different women's service organizations and focus groups with formerly incarcerated women, staff, and families of women in detention, we are proposing to centralize the women in one location at the Queens site to allow their own dedicated intake and visiting spaces. And finally, as a result of design build, we now believe that all of this is possible on a shorter timeline than initially anticipated by June 2026, or a total of nine years from when we first announced our commitment to close the jails on Rikers Island. I'll turn to Brenda Cook, who will walk us through what the building blocks are of the program that comprise the square footage uh, that we are seeking approval for at each facility. Good morning. What's depicted on the slide in front of you is a 
rendering of a proposed housing unit in one of these new borough-based jail facilities. Some key components of modern jail design, in particular, I would highlight the smaller size of the housing unit, so the maximum living capacity would be smaller than most of our housing units in our outdated um, existing department facilities. The layout, as the commissioner mentioned, and uh, Director Glazer as well, has improved sight lines, unobstructed uh, views for those officers who are responsible for ensuring the safety and supervision of those living in the unit, providing services and programs in the space on the unit. A specific highlight as well is the direct access to outdoor recreation space for each and every housing unit in these modern new facilities. This is important and an important distinction, both as to the humanity, dignity, and uh, in, uh, supportive environment for both those living and working in these facilities. We presently have at our facilities one primary main outdoor recreation yard that has to be managed on a schedule to accommodate each person's opportunity for an hour in out, outdoor each day. These directly adjacent recreation yards with direct supervision would allow free access for everyone for the duration of, of the day. There's also increased spaces provided for the delivery of tailored programming, education services, space for televisit, uh, and other meetings with uh, clinical or medical providers. The day, the day rooms and the cells on the unit will have direct access to light, sunlight, and be bright and spacious. With respect to the, what's driving the height and then therefore the density of the facilities that uh, we are proposing as part of this ULERP application is the component parts that were represented uh, therein. And on this slide you can see a distribution of the approximate uh, allocation of square feet per bed and each of these facilities as Dana mentioned is proposed for 1,150 beds. And so the largest allocation of square feet for each of those available beds is dedicated to the residence program, which includes things like education space, classrooms, other program space for hard and soft skills learning, library, the commissary, gym, chapels, and mosques. There's additionally a sufficient, uh, more than sufficient, and more than our current facilities allocation of space for the residents, for their housing units, for processes of new admissions into the facility that are, that are humane and dignified, and that provide special populations in our care, more right-sized housing units that are smaller and available, available to provide therapeutic services. Also what's unique about the facilities in some respect that we're proposing here for New York City in order to meet the goals of our justice reform are things like the health services and the community space and the space in the lobbies and visitor and public spaces in these facilities. For people who have been by one of our borough facilities or visited any of our borough or department facilities on Rikers Island, as the commissioner identified, our visiting spaces are insufficient for supporting the connections that we know are so important to maintain while in custody to have a successful reentry upon exit. The proposed visiting spaces in these facilities will be spacious, support specific places for families and children to visit with those in detention. There will be spaces in the lobby for those who have come to pay bail or have an inquiry or want to connect with a service provider or greet a loved one or family member or friend who is exiting the facility. All of these building blocks contribute to the ULERP application and the size and density that's been proposed as the maximum envelope for this application. So as Brenda outlined what the program is and the building blocks of each facility, I thought it would be helpful to just uh, share a little bit about what the process was by which we developed these building blocks. So first of all, as I acknowledge in the beginning, when we began this effort to develop the plan for the closures of, closure of Rikers Island, we also obviously considered the work that had been done to date, the work of the Littman Commission and the justice and design efforts, uh, as well as the past reform efforts that the mayor's office itself had been, uh, under, had been underway with. We formed a justice implementation task force with three different working groups focused on 
design, culture change, and reducing the jail population. The design and culture change working groups work with us to develop a set of design principles that form the basis of this master plan. We have done peer reviews with both correctional and non-correctional architectural and design experts to give input into our considerations for the components of this program. We've done focus groups with formerly incarcerated individuals, service providers, facility staff, public defenders, met with district attorneys, local elected officials, the Board of Correction, all in order to understand how we could build a justice system that is fundamentally different than the one that we have today. And we developed a set of four neighborhood advisory councils or committees in each of the uh, neighborhoods and boroughs of the proposed facilities to give us guidelines or develop a set of guidelines and recommendations, guidelines and principles on things including facility design, uh, integration with the neighborhood, as well as other community needs. We've had on-site tours with neighborhoods, with neighbors in the, uh, around this proposed facilities, small group, group meetings, and of course, a number of public hearings and open forums. When we looked at the developing the proposed facilities, we considered some primary criteria for how we would select these sites. The primary criteria would that, was that they would be close to the courthouse, city-owned property, transit accessible, and sufficient site area. These are the criteria that allow us to close Rikers Island as quickly as possible, to ensure that we have proximity to the courthouse and so that attorneys, service providers, and loved ones can use public transportation to visit, their, uh, to, to visit people in detention, and sufficient site area to be able to provide the program. In three of the four boroughs, we were able to meet these criteria where there are existing DOC facilities. In uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn, of course, the existing open Brooklyn House of Detention and Manhattan Detention Center. In Queens, the site of the closed Queens Detention uh, Facility, which is open for court production but no longer houses people for overnight detention. In the Bronx, it was a more complicated site selection process because the current DOC facility is, of course, the barge. And we do not believe that a floating boat is the appropriate site for a criminal justice reform plan, nor is it close to public transportation. So in the Bronx in particular, we had to look at a number of different sites before we determined that the site of the current NYPD tow pound is the most viable. I'll walk you through each of the four locations. So in Brooklyn, as I said, we are proposing to demolish the current Brooklyn House of Detention and build a new facility that would have housing, support services, localized medical care, retail, and community facility space. It's, of course, at the intersection of the Burham Place Civic Corridor and the Atlantic Avenue Commercial Corridor. This is the uh, kind of the access diagram. Uh, the ground floor along Atlantic Avenue and the southern part of Smith Street is proposed to be occupied by community-defined uses to provide an active street frontage along these corridors. The public entrance would be located on Burham Place, the borough's main civic corridor. Staff entrance and loading would be on State Street, which is where these functions are currently located, and vehicle parking would be located on Smith Street. I should note that one of the things that we've heard consistently across neighborhoods is the importance of providing below-grade parking to the greatest extent possible in order to address the use of existing street parking by DOC or, or staff vehicles, and so that is something that we have accommodated at each of the locations. This is uh, just an illustrative uh, building slide that uh, shows that the podium base of the buildings has the overall shared building support, such as community space, public lobby, mechanical, mechanical systems, visiting intake kitchen, locker rooms, parking, gymnasium, et cetera. And then the housing units are provided above. As an, illust an illustrative rendering of, while we don't have exact designs for this facility or over the facilities because this is a design-build project, uh, this is an uh, illustrative rendering that demonstrates the extent to which the vision is to have a more active pedestrian uh, experience and less of the kind of wall that one experiences right now with the Brooklyn House of Detention. In the Bronx, as I uh, noted, we had to look at a number of different locations before determining that the most viable site would be the site of the current NYPD tow pound. So 
So uh, as you can see, the site of the current NYPD tow pound is abutted on one side by the Bruckner Expressway and on the other side by a more residential neighborhood. What we're proposing to do in this site in particular is uh, to develop the detention facility on the site that is adjacent to the Bruckner Boulevard and then separated by a service corridor provide for a mixed use uh, affordable housing development, which we understand to be a community identified need and which will ensure that for the residents on that side of Concord Avenue, uh, what they are uh, facing is uh, housing development. Again, an illustrative uh, representation of the building. And then, of course, the mixed-use housing development opportunity on Concord Avenue, which we anticipate will provide approximately 235 residential units and which will be an HPD project. In Manhattan, we are proposing to demolish and replace the existing Manhattan Detention Center on 124 and 125 White Street and replace this with a detention facility that will maintain a pedestrian access on the White Street Arcade that on both sides will have community determined uses. The intention is to provide a pedestrian experience without the uh, parking or street parking or vehicular access that is currently provided. And this is something that we have heard is a top priority of the community. Again, uh, the illustrative building. That is an illustrative rendering of the arcade through White Street. And more visuals. And finally, on the Queens site, uh, we are proposing the demolition and replacement of the Queens detention facility. Uh, specifically, we are proposing to use the footprint of the ex existing detention facility as well as part of what is an adjacent municipal surface parking lot. The intention is to use part of the footprint for both the uh, proposed facility and then build a surface multi-level parking lot that would actually provide more parking spaces to the neighborhood than what is currently provided because we have heard that parking in itself is a key concern for the, the Queens neighborhoods. Uh, at the Queens facility site in particular, what we are proposing is that there would be both the men's facility as well as a women's detention facility. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, we got a significant amount of feedback from different women's organizations uh, that it was the most appropriate model of care to have one centralized women's facility. We are proposing that for the Queen's site because it is uh, both where we had uh, planned the maternity and nursery units, where we can provide a dedicated female-only intake, visiting, uh, programming, recreational uh, uh, services. We had heard that that was a key concern and where it's also located near Elmhurst, where women from in DOC custody who require elevated medical care are currently taken. Again, the uh, building representation, and then a rendering of uh, what could be possible post-design. The ULERP actions themselves uh, that we are seeking approval for, uh, Chair Adams already read through them, but just at the high level, we're seeking approval for both system-wide actions, site selection for borough-based jails, a text amendment to create a borough-based jail system special permit, as well as specific actions for each site, which are listed here, and we can speak to and address any questions you have. And finally, looking ahead where we are in the process. So, uh, obviously, we are in the final stage of ULERP approval after a process that has been long, intensive, and certainly began uh, long before this, even, this process even began in terms of the, the decades-long call, perhaps, for the closure of Rikers Island. Uh, assuming passage of this ULERP application, we will be able to begin the procurement process uh, for RFQ, an RFQ and four RFPs. Uh, to design and construct the four design build projects to put us on a timeline of completion by 2026. There will be many opportunities for continued design review, which we can speak to, but we can just, just at highest level, we'll note that we, there will be ongoing updates to the Planning Commission, the Public Design Commission, and continued community engagement. 
We understand that this is a serious and incredibly important endeavor for the city of New York. This is an historic opportunity and a moment in which we have incredible responsibility to get this right. We have benefited greatly from the last several months of engagement that we have done with people in this room and beyond to understand what the key concerns and considerations are that can make sure that when we close the jails on Rikers Island, we can do so with confidence that we are both building a better justice system and ensuring strong and vibrant neighborhoods. We are committed to continuing this process moving forward and look forward to working with you, members of the council, to make sure that we can make this the best possible plan, as well as people in this room and outside of its doors, to take seriously our responsibility to build a better justice system for all of New York. Thank you so much for your time this morning, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions, um, as well as we have a number of uh, different members of the administration and city agencies who are here who I'll help call up to speak specifically to uh, questions that you all might have. Thank you very much for your testimony, your thorough testimony, uh, all of you this morning. We are very uh, grateful uh, to have you here um, and uh, provide us with um, such a detailed explanation and history. Um, this is an extremely critical endeavor for the city of New York. Before I yield to Chair Salamanca and other colleagues for questions, I do have a couple. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge we have been joined by Council Members Gibson and Lander. Can you help us to understand your time frame for closing Rikers and building the new facilities? I'd like to invite up uh, Deputy Commissioner Jamie Torres Springer from the Department of Design and Construction who can speak to the specific schedule. Thank you, Dana. Um, good morning, Council Members. Uh, Chair, thanks for your question. So the Department of Design and Construction will be responsible for delivery of the borough-based facilities, working very closely with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the Department of Corrections. Uh, we're working in anticipation uh, of, of a uh, potential ULERP approval. We're working on a full program management plan for the delivery of the facilities. Um, we're in the process of developing that and we'll provide updates as we go. I can certainly say uh, the major milestone is the completion of the four borough-based facilities for beneficial occupancy in 2026 and the closure of Rikers and the barge at that time. Thank you very much. And at w we've been joined by Council Member Inez Barron. At what rate do you expect the population to decrease? So we're projecting right now that there will be no more than 4,000 people in custody in 2026. Um, this is obviously a projection, uh, and there are a lot of, we're at a very dynamic moment in the criminal justice system with bail reform that will be implemented in January of this coming year. Uh, so that number could well go down. Right now, uh, we think it'll be around 4,000. Okay, um, with that reduction, when are the existing facilities due to come offline and new facilities constructed? Thank you for that question. So as Dana mentioned earlier, uh, in connection with our current uh, population reduction, the Department of Correction is committed to both decommissioning entire facilities or portions of facilities uh, as a, a, in, in recognition of, of a reduced population. And so we plan to be responsive to our population reduction and, and downsize the f size of the footprint of either the existing uh, facilities in whole or in part between now and, and 2026. Okay, that's, we're gonna take a look at the time frame where we know that some, some say it's too little, some say it's an extended amount of time. Um, Looking at uh, DOC for a second, what are the Department of Corrections current staffing levels? We have uh, approximately 10,000 uniform staff and 2,000 civilian staff. And what is the Department of Corrections staffing plan for the new borough-based jail facilities? 
So since we don't have an interior design for these buildings, we, we don't have a staffing plan as of yet because we don't know how the inside of the housing units will look. But because of the efficiencies that we will have in these buildings, the staffing um, will be reduced. How are you currently preparing the staff for the reduction, or are you currently preparing the staff at DOC for the reduction? So we have um, gotten confirmation from the city that we will not be experiencing layoffs through staff. Um, as our population reduces, we will be um, downsizing our staff through attrition. How are you informing the staff? So we have um, open forums with our staff, the, the wardens and the uniform leadership as well as the non-uniform leadership have been speaking about this. Um, it's been in the news, staff have asked questions, we've given the, uh, the assurance that there will be no layoffs. We've had conversations with the union leaders as well. Along those same lines, Commissioner, what type of feedback are you getting from those discussions? Uh, it's, it's mixed. Um, some people can't see 2026, 27 in the future. Um, it's hard for them to imagine that. They want to be assured that they will have a job with the reduction in population and, and smaller and more humane, safer jail system. Um, so we are doing our best to assure them of that. Okay, thank you. Along different lines, what kinds of investments will you make to prevent or divert people from the criminal justice system or reinvest in communities that have been devastated by mass incarceration? So we are building right now on what has been quite a strong foundation of investment uh, to ensure that people don't go into the justice system period uh, and that when they come out that they have the full supports uh, that they will need. We anticipate that as we move forward, especially with bail reform, um, that we will be putting, uh, we will be uh, looking at and expanding those supports. So supervised release, which is has given judges, has, has probably driven about half of our reduction in our jail population, um, has given judges an opportunity between jail and nothing at all. Uh, and we, that's been very enthusiastically uh, supported by, um, by the judges, by defenders, and by prosecutors. Uh, and we anticipate that that will uh, continue to expand uh, as we move forward. Um, we also have put big investments into efforts that really kind of civilianize the way in which we look at safety. Uh, so big investments in things like uh, the crisis management system, uh, neighborhood ComStat uh, that really builds neighborhood supports uh, for reducing violence before it even happens. Uh, we think that's a very, very important part of our uh, future plan. I would agree. Uh, my last question before I yield to my colleagues has to do with the cost, and it's been spoken about at great length, the expense of this project. The administration estimated the total cost of construction for four borough-based jails for a population of 6,000 people to be $8.7 billion. Now that the population has been reduced to 4,000, what is the updated estimated cost of construction? Uh, I'll, I'll answer that, Council Member. We'll, we, are, we are sticking with that estimate um, based on a lot of work left to do as we move through the design process, which I'm happy to talk about in, in more detail. Um, we'll provide updated estimates as we move along at the key milestones. Is there any particular reason why that, that figure remains the same if the population is uh, decreased? Um, the, uh, the estimate that informed that budget is based on the place that we're at, um, and uh, it, it would make sense for us to carry enough contingency uh, as we move into design, as we refine those designs. Okay, thank you. I'm sure my colleagues will expound a little bit more on that subject. So I am going to yield uh, to Chair Salamanca for questions. 
I, I neglected to swear in one of our panelists answering questions, so please um, state your name and do you affirm that the testimony you have given and that you will give in response to council member questions will be truthful. Jamie Torres Springer, I do. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Adams. Um, so I have a few questions about, my, my questioning is going to be focused on the Bronx location and, um, and I also have some questions on the barge, the Bernie C. Bain Center. Um, my, my, my first line of question in terms of, besides the tow pound, what other locations did the city consider for a Bronx site? So we, we looked at a number of different locations. Obviously, one of the locations that we looked at was the uh, site that was closer to the courthouse, so uh, the Sherman, uh, Sherman Avenue location. We looked at not just the site of uh, the uh, surface parking on Sherman Avenue, but also another parking lot there and the underutilized section of the existing family court uh, and or the family court annex. So the challenge with that site in particular is that those are three not exactly uh, contiguous locations. They are not all city owned, but beyond that, it was uh, almost an awkward zigzag configuration, which would have had real challenges in terms of lines of sight, transport, uh, and uh, staff safety within the building. There would have been uh, challenges in terms of providing direct light uh, into uh, the facility, and it's a, a smaller square footage. So it would have been uh, about twice the uh, tw about twice the size or twice the height as uh, the proposed location. So that is the uh, other site that we did look at seriously, and those were really the constraints that we faced in that location. Um, when you mention about not all the the the, the sites or the lots were city-owned land, mm -hmm. you know, you're referring to they were state they're, they're owned by the state, correct? Correct. Did the city approach the state? to ask for permission or ask for a transfer uh, of the lots? Was I wanna, that ever considered? I want to be very clear that there were challenges with that site in terms of the square footage itself and the configuration of those sites. And so there were some fundamental concerns with the viability uh, that uh, prevented us from moving forward. Right. Did the city consider any other city-owned sites? Yes, we looked at a number of different city-owned uh, sites, and you know, as you know, council member, we've you know we've we've had these conversations with uh, a number of other Bronx uh, elected officials, and there were sites that were uh, certainly much farther. Uh, there were a number of different issues. It was a more complex site selection process just given uh, the fact that there was no existing DOC facility that provided that direct court access as we had in the other boroughs. So we did look at a number of different sites uh, and uh, believe that the site of the proposed facility is the most viable location. Did the city consider community feedback when selecting this location? So uh, there were a number of different inputs into, the, into this uh, decision. Obviously, this was a decision that was made at the highest level, uh, and the mayor had a number of different conversations on this. Uh, we certainly considered a number of different perspectives. The criteria across the board has been consistent in that we were looking for sites that were accessible to public transportation, city-owned, had that relative proximity to the courthouse as much as possible and sufficient square footage. But did the city speak to the community before deciding that you're gonna pick this site? So I, I, I just wanna say this was not a decision that was taken lightly. Uh, it was a decision that was made by the highest members of the administration. Uh, and you know we believe that this is the most viable location. Obviously, we take seriously the community feedback that we are receiving on this and are committed to working with uh, the council, with members of the Bronx community, members of the Neighborhood Advisory Council and Committee uh, to understand what their concerns are and address them as best we can. You do understand the community input is before you make a decision. Mm -hmm. Once you make a decision, you're basically just telling us this is what we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll move on to my questions here. Um, the barge, 
um, that's located in my district. Um, you do understand that should this plan pass, and I, I, I don't know what your uh, order of building these new uh, borough-based jails, uh, what the order is, but should the Bronx be first, there will be three jails in a three-mile radius in the South Bronx. We have the Horizon Detention Center, which is in my district, and then a mile south, you would have this new Bronx jail, and a mile south from that, you have the Horizon, I mean, you have the Vernon C. Bain Center. Um, the barge, the boat, um, you know, it came in 1992. David Dinkins was mayor then. And the reason that they brought in the barge was because of the overflow uh, of detainees in Rikers Island. Uh, it closed in, um, in 1995 because there was a reduction in detainees in Rikers Island. But once again, it opened up again in 1998 and has been open ever since. Um, I know that you're, the numbers of, of detainees in Rikers have decreased dramatically. Why is the barge still open? So I, uh, I'll, I'll kind of open and speak to the issue, and then perhaps the Department of Corrections can speak uh, more specifically about the, the current use of the barge. One, I just want to acknowledge, uh, Councilmember Salamanca, the, you know, your concerns and perspective on this. And we take seriously uh, the, uh, obviously, the, the stated commitment that we also want to see the barge closed as part of this project and uh, to not have that be a continued vestige of uh, what was exactly, as you said, not intended to be a permanent solution and, and not representative of what we feel is the right justice system. We are, of course, working through what the timeline and phasing and sequencing is of the entire program in terms of how we can uh, bring the existing uh, borough facilities offline. And the Department of Corrections can speak to exactly what the considerations are in regard to the barge specifically. Thank you. So uh, thank you for your question. And what we are considering as our uh, population has been decreasing um, are the number and uh, locations of the facilities that are necessary. Uh, a number of the existing facilities on Rikers Island had uh, portions of uh, facilities over the past, as our population has decreased dramatically since you know, even as uh, Director Glazer and, and uh, Director uh, Kaplan mentioned um, from a tight in 1991, we had temporary structures, modular buildings um, that, that accommodated uh, those, uh, many of those additional beds that no longer exist. With respect to the size of our uh, current capacity and our, our beds presently in light of our, our current population, we're evaluating the physical plants um, of each of our existing facilities, the nature of the housing uh, dynamic that's available at those facilities, whether or not it's uh, celled units or dormitory space, um, the uh, types of risk classification um, that those housing units can accommodate, um, the other uh, infrastructure issues um, with respect to, you know, mechanical, uh, the roofs, um, it, all of all of these things, the efficiencies um, that with which we can run it from a staffing perspective. And so all of those considerations are, are uh, underway. Those are the cons considerations that led us to close GMDC um, a year ago, that led us to take um, a number of uh, more than 500 uh, decommissioned, from more than 500 beds earlier this year, and we'll continue to guide our, our discussions uh, about which areas of which facilities and which entire facilities um, will come offline and when. I still don't understand why the barge is still open. Based on, based on the considerations that just, I just outlined, uh, the department will, will be evaluating all of our facilities under those circumstances in, in light of the population um, set daily census. Um, so as part of this, I, my understanding is these borough-based jails is a 10-year plan, correct? Or nine-year plan? Yeah. And within that nine or 10-year plan, when, within this current plan, when is the barge scheduled to be closed? So uh, we know that by the end of 2026, uh, we will be able to close all of the jails on Rikers and the barge in terms of the specific sequencing of bringing offline the existing borough facilities uh, and then opening new borough facilities. That is a timeline that is still being developed. 
um, the detainees that you have there, um, it was my understanding in having um, conversations with you, um, uh, you mentioned that uh, the, the detainees that you have there are for health-related issues? Uh, no, I think, oh, my, I believe what you're referring to is our conversation about air conditioning specifically. And so uh, the Vernon C. Bain Center, the barge, and uh, the Manhattan Detention Complex are the only two facilities out of the department's 11 facilities that are fully air conditioned. And so with respect to the medical designation of heat sensitivity and uh, the climate controlled um, environment that uh, those, those individuals require, um, there are a number of folks, yes, that are housed at the Vernon C. Bain Center uh, that are de medically designated as heat sensitive by correctional health. Yeah. Madam Chair, I just have two more questions and I'll, and I'll wrap up. Um, the detainees that you have in the barge right now, are they waiting for sentencing or they've been sentenced already and they're waiting to be transferred out to state facilities? So the almost, uh, you know, almost nearly 90%, uh, 80, 80 to 90, 85 to 90 percent of our population are pretrial uh, detainees. And so um, uh, Vernon C. Bain Center, the barge, is also a new admission facility for anyone coming into custody from uh, Bronx courts. And so the uh, bulk of those that are housed at uh, the Vernon C. Bain Center are uh, detainees. At uh, each of our facilities, um, we have a small number, um, uh, usually a, housing, a, a single housing unit, um, uh, approximately, of individuals who are sentenced and serving out a steady sentence of a year or less um, uh, in order to um, uh, 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 work in, in certain um, employment and job um, throughout the department and, and necessary uh, functions. So the bulk of those at Vernon C. Bain, like the rest of our department, are pretrial detainees. All right. And then finally, you do understand that the barge is, in essence, an annex of Rikers Island. The horrors that happen on Rikers Island are also happening in the barge. And I find that a 10-year plan to shut down the barge is irresponsible and unacceptable. If this mayor is really serious about shutting down Rikers, he can start with the annex of Rikers Island and shut down the barge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. We are now going to have questions in this order. Council members Ayala, Chin, Kozlowitz, and Levin. We have also, we were joined by Council Member Reynoso as well. So Council members Ayala, Chin, Kozlowitz, and Levin in that order. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know that uh, my colleague, Council Member Salamanca, spoke, uh, asked about the site selection, but could you, could you explain um, during that process, because I remember it being pretty extensive, um, what, what, was the, what, what was the experience like? How many, how many sites did the administration actually look at in terms of, because I believe it was the number between 11 and 15 sites that were vetted at that time? Yes, uh, I think that uh, I know there were at least 11 sites that we looked at and we solicited uh, suggestions uh, for, for sites that was part of the, the process. And how many times did the administration go back and revet those same sites? So uh, we did uh, uh, an initial vetting and consideration of all of those sites based off of the criteria that I had uh, mentioned previously, uh, we asked a number of members, uh, lo local elected officials, to suggest additional sites. Uh, the sites that we felt were closest to meeting the criteria, uh, we uh, engaged uh, the master plan consultants in helping us consider. And so uh, the site that we looked at most extensively uh, was the, uh, uh, the other Sherman Avenue uh, courthouse location considering its use in a number of different configurations. Um, but I think that reflects that it was certainly something that we took seriously. Were there other sites that had been, that had been suggested to the administration that the administration then went back that were not part of the initial core sites that had uh, been identified? I'm sorry, so you the administration mm -hmm. had, was it 11 or was it 15? I don't remember. I don't know. I remember it was at least 11. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I think that there were some sites that we had not initially looked at and uh, had then been suggested uh, by uh, some members of the Bronx delegation that we then took a, a follow-up look at uh, and considered uh, and then reported back. And so, again, the issue with the courthouse versus the pound 
was a matter of the the structure the the, the way that the configure the the two state lots mm -hmm. adjoining the one city owned lot was configured yes it's uh so initially we had looked at just one of the uh, lots and it the all 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 of the lots are very small so i should say that to begin with uh so we looked primarily at one lot and uh, determined it was very small. It was suggested that we look at other uh, nearby sites and uh, consider other lots, including the suggestion to look at the underutilized sections of family court, which is why we uh, considered the use of the family court annex in particular. Those three sites are not exactly contiguous with each other. There is the grand jury rotunda that uh, kind of breaks up the site. And so we would have, uh, it would require demapping of uh, a street. And then again, it was kind of a, a snake or zigzag formation. So it's not a continuous site. And where, where exactly were those lots located? Actually, so Julia, do you wanna, uh, perhaps come up and Ju Julia Kirsten with the Deputy's Mayor's Office of Operations was also part of this and so can perhaps provide some additional detail. Sure, sure. Um, uh, you have to be sworn Council's in. going Sorry. to swear you in. Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Please state your name when you answer. Julia Kirsten, yes. Yes, so um, the site that, that uh, Dana was talking about also included some lots directly across the street next to the family court annex. We looked at that. We also considered uh, possibly demapping portions of streets to allow for greater site area, um, determining that in addition to the, the areas not being next to each other and the lot size not being large enough, it would um, cut off a lot of the movement through the community and neighborhood by taking portions of the street out of the street grid. So there were a number of considerations around that site, making it not entirely feasible, um, in addition to the, the property ownership concerns. And all of this happened after we made the announcement here at, uh, at City Hall that site selection had been made. So after the fact, we stopped the clock and went back and asked the administration to revet all of those sites and then added multiple sites to be looked at. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, we obviously uh, shared our identification of the existing NYPD tow pound uh, and heard uh, requests that we look more seriously at other sites in the Bronx. And so we did go back and consider a number of different uh, locations. We did that additional analysis and uh, at the conclusion of that additional work and effort, uh, determined that the NYPD tow, pot remained, NYPD tow pound remained uh, the most viable site. And can you explain how tall, the, uh, does anyone know what the, the total, the height of the existing courthouse on 161st Street is now? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but we can get back to you with that information. But the proposed site for the, the lots behind the criminal courthouse would have been, would have allowed for a significantly taller building to be housed right smack in the middle of the courthouse behind the, the criminal courthouse building, is that correct? Yes, it would have been much taller than the courthouse. How much taller? Uh, I, so I don't know the relative uh, height of the courthouse, but we do know that when we looked at what a uh, comparable program was at that side at the, uh, to the, of our current program, when we used the portions of the site that were viable, uh, and would allow for a contiguous floor, floor plan, it would have been upwards of a 500 foot facility. Now the Lipman Commission recommendations indicated that these courthouses, the, these sites should be uh, positioned in communities that were the least residential to minimize the impact on the residential communities. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with that. Would you uh, say that the 161st Street site is non-residential? So we uh, certainly know that there is a mix of residential and industrial use. And so uh, one of the considerations that we have made as uh, part of the proposed plan is that the portion of the site that would be used for the proposed detention facility is the portion of the site that is closer to the industrial use and the Bruckner. 
and that the portion of the site that is adjacent to a residential neighborhood is where we are proposing a mixed-use residential facility. I mean, knowing the, uh, the 161st Street site pretty well, um, my perception is that it's pretty heavily residential, and I'm trying to, to just uh, make the distinction because a lot of criticism has been given to the fact that the Concord site is primarily residential, and I would argue that the 161st Street is just as heavily, if not more so, uh, populated by residents that live in the immediate vicinity of the courthouse. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. <laughs> Um, now, one of the, uh, obviously there are a lot of concerns regarding the siting of the pound. Um, a lot of those concerns are related to safety, uh, to impact on the property value of the adjacent homes. Could you speak a little to what the administration, um, how the administration prepares to address some of those concerns? Yes, so I will uh, turn it over to the Department of Corrections who can speak a little bit about what the, uh, the work is that they do um, in communities, but I think it is very important just to note that in uh, neighborhoods where there are existing detention facilities, and this is something that we looked uh, very uh, closely at um, when the site of the Manhattan Detention Center and the Brooklyn House of Detention, that when those facilities opened, or in the case of the Brooklyn House reopened, we did not see any negative impact on property values, but and, and significantly we did not see any negative uh, impact on crime in the neighborhood. And so I know that that was also, uh, there was also a study that the Littman Commission, I believe, was involved in that looked at those same questions and determined that there was not a negative impact uh, in uh, in New York City of having detention facilities in neighborhoods as it relates to crime and property values. Um, now that being said, the issue of safety is one that we take very seriously and, and we certainly want to make sure that we are working closely with your office, uh, working with NYPD and you know other community leaders to develop whatever appropriate safety plans are and again, Department of Corrections can speak to how they uh, operate in neighborhoods. Good morning. So internally, we have our own patrols that do perimeter checks routinely on the outside of our buildings. We also have the exteriors uh, outfitted with cameras to capture every angle. Additionally, we have a compliance and safety center that monitors real time, live view, all the exteriors of our building all over the city. And we work closely with NYPD to identify any issues outside the building. But we, what we have found is people don't linger around the outside of the jails. And so we haven't experienced um, crime around any of our facilities. Now, the courthouse also houses inmates temporarily, right? Sometimes for a day while they're in court, they release inmates from the 164th Street courthouse, right? Yes. Has there been an uptick in crime in that area? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Um, the, the concern that I had when um, obviously this came before me was the fact that the pound is situated in the poorest congressional district. This is a, a, a community that has been disenfranchised for many years and has seen the lowest levels of investments that I've ever witnessed. And in an attempt, you know, to, to make this right, you know, I have asked the administration uh, to take a, a holistic, more comprehensive, you know, view of the entire Mott Haven community and what it, the impact of a facility of this magnitude coming to the community would mean. Um, and we have asked for uh, a series of, of local community investments because we believe that that the community, that we need to build a community around this facility so that this facility does not become the focal point of the South Bronx. Could you elaborate on what the, uh, the, the what commitments the administration is willing uh, to commit to? What, what is your thought process around that? So I, you know, should just say that, uh, Council Member Ayala, you have been a strong advocate for the other community needs uh, that uh, are part 
of the Mott Haven and South Bronx community. And I, I know that this has been a top priority for you. And uh, we, as you know, have participated in a number of different meetings with you, with local community leaders and members uh, to understand what the key priorities and concerns are, uh, as well as we received a significant amount of feedback on in this area in regard specifically from the Bronx Neighborhood Advisory Council. Uh, we have your list and the list from the Bronx Neighborhood Advisory Council of what are the key identified priority investments and we are taking that list very seriously and uh, we will be working with you on, on making sure that we are able to address some of those outstanding needs and concerns for the Mott Haven community in particular. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I think a lot of us support the important goal of closing Riker and building a more just, humane criminal justice system. And I think with this four borough-based jail, one of the important things is that we do have to look at community impact. And the site in Manhattan, originally it was 80 Center Street, which is on the other side of the criminal court and away from the Chung Park Senior Building. And at that time, the administration was saying that, oh, if we empty out the MDC, that could be given back to the community as a community facility. Then the plan changed to go back and abandon 80 Center Street. Uh, maybe you can also explain the reason why that was changed. And now we're back to the original site of the MDC, which is right next to the Chong Park Senior Building, which has 88 units. And they also share one of the walls with MDC. So one of the biggest concern that I have, and also from the community, is how do we protect the seniors and their caregiver during the demolition and the construction years that's gonna happen? How do we protect them from the noise, from the dust, you know, from the traffic? Um, those are the, you know, big concern. So I wanted to, you to first address the site change and then what DDC are gonna put in place to protect the senior while the demolition and construction are happening. Absolutely, uh, and thank you, Council Member Chin, and uh, also, you know, just want to thank you for your uh, strong advocacy on behalf of the tenants and uh, Chung Pak in particular. Uh, obviously, we know that this is a key concern of yours, something that we've heard from the Manhattan Neighborhood Advisory Committee, and, and we take this very seriously. Specific to 80 Center Street, uh, it, it obviously, as, as you are well aware, we had initially proposed and considered uh, the demolition of 80 Center Street uh, to be used for the detention facility. And part of the consideration there had been that it was uh, closer to the Civic Center, further from uh, the, the Chinatown uh, neighborhood, and also would have returned uh, one of the, the buildings to uh, a community use. As we went through the process, it became clear that the relocation of the existing tenants of 80 Center Street would have added a significant time and cost to the project overall, which would have impeded our overall goals to close Rikers as quickly as possible. Uh, and we also heard community concerns uh, about what the potential shadow impact would be on Columbus Park. And so as a result of those uh, factors, we determined that the site of the existing Manhattan Detention Center, 124, 125 White, was uh, the more viable location and advanced that as part of this ULERP project or proposal. Um, I should say that we uh, remain committed to ensuring that there is still community development opportunities uh, provided as part of this because we know that that is something that was lost in that relocation back and that it requires us to be particularly mindful 
of what the impact is of the seniors as we go through this demolition and construction uh, process, uh, as well as, of course, how we can address the needs of Chung Pak. And so uh, I will turn to Jamie and Julia to speak about what the uh, plans are in terms of mitigation, and then we can also uh, speak to additional questions you have. Thank you, Dana, and, and thanks, Council Member, for your, your partnership uh, in all our, of our work. Um, as you know, uh, DDC takes very seriously and is uh, highly constrained by requirements to mitigate and monitor uh, air quality, uh, noise, dust, traffic impacts. Um, this is all fully outlined in the EIS, uh, and so all of our work here, uh, our contractors will be required to follow federal, state, and city legislation uh, related to uh, noise control, adhere to DEP's noise code. Um, for this project, we'll also be going above and beyond those standard mitigations and controls. We'll have independent on-site air quality, traffic, and noise monitors in place that would detect vibrations, uh, noise, or traffic above safety thresholds. And when that occurs, we would be able to trigger a stop work uh, in order to remedy the situation. Our contractor will also be developing a transportation management plan for construction and a construction health and safety plan. Uh, in addition to that, our intention is to have uh, full-time, 24-7 community construction liaisons uh, available uh, at, for each of the four facility constructions that will be available, obviously, to members of council, members of the community, and other stakeholders uh, to call at any time to provide information, remedy problems that emerge, and so on. One of the requests that was made by um, the Chong Park Management, I think it was raised in, in the community meetings, um, was that the senior building has an outdoor garden on the 13th floor. And when constructions are going on, they won't be able to even get a little bit of sunlight. Uh, so the, the request is that the city help build an enclosure, a glass enclosure, so that the senior can still be able to go out, get sunlight, while your demolition is happening and then there's also other needs to make sure that the senior building remain permanently affordable. I mean, and also the small businesses that are impacted. There are 6,000 square feet um, that are at the MDC that have a number of small businesses. They're gonna have to be relocated or they have to go out of business. And then also the, the small businesses along Chong Park on Walker Street Definitely, the business is going to be you know, disrupted, and also other small businesses along Baxter, Baxter Street, because the streets are so narrow. Uh, so are the city right now working on concrete plan to address uh, the needs and help for these small businesses? Yes, so I think that we can, uh, th that there, Julia can speak to some of this, and then also DCAS is here who uh, can also offer some additional information about the communications and conversations with Chung Pak to date around what their concerns are uh, during relocation. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member, for the question. Um, we, we are committed to working with your office and with Chung Pak to make sure that we can address their needs and uh, look forward to continued engagement with you and them in looking into the possibilities. And I think uh, DCAS is here who can speak more to the relocation plans. Um, please state your name before responding. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give in response to council member questions will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Matthew Burke, I do. So yes, we have an ongoing dialogue with, uh, with Chung Pak right now, who is a tenant of the cities, um, and we are working with them actively um, to come up with relocation plans for their subtenants, which are small businesses. Are you gonna get it done before we have to vote on this? That is the intention. Okay, that, that have to be in there. Um, I wanted to go back to the community facility because when it was at 80 Center, the diagram that was 
shown and was talked about was 20,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And I think when you move back um, to the MDC, the city was also making that commitment. And then all of a sudden we found out that 6,000 of that space is actually the retail space. Mm -hmm. And the community don't want to lose any of those retail space. So then the community facility now is much less. It's down to maybe 14,000. And then from your design, it's nothing that really is a, a large space. So what I'm asking for is that the commitment from the city to look for alternative mm -hmm. of the community facilities, mm -hmm. um, community uh, space that is owned by the city, that can be added to the community facility space. Because one of the, um, the important aspect of the community that we have always talked about was a cultural performance center. Mm -hmm. And initially we thought that, oh, the city is gonna make a commitment for that when it was at 80 Center and that disappeared. Mm -hmm. So we still want to hear directly from the city that the commitments still stand, that they are actively looking to support more community space for us. Yes, and uh, just to, so as you noted, obviously there is the uh, you know, minimum of 20,000 square feet of uh, community-oriented space that is in 124, 125 White Street. Uh, we know that there are existing small businesses in uh, the detention faci facility right now that are managed by Chung Pak. And so a consideration has been uh, you know, how to ensure continuity for, for those businesses or for Chung Pak, as well as uh, then what is the appropriate use uh, for that the community would work to identify for the additional square footage that is in that facility. We have heard uh, requests to expand the square footage uh, within the facility itself. And of course, the constraint there is that we understand that the height and the density of the facilities are a key concern. And so adding additional square footage within 124, 125 White Street could have the negative impact on uh, what the, the other neighborhood and community concerns are. That being said, uh, we are not limited to looking at uh, community space just at that location and have certainly heard what some other uh, key needs are and priorities from the neighborhood and, and yes, are committed to working with you, council member, on ensuring that uh, we can commit to community space that is not just limited to that location. Okay, I have two more questions here. One is on Columbus Park. I mean, that is one of the heavily utilized park in Lower Manhattan. And facility there are not great, especially the bathroom, the pavilion, and it needs a lot of investment from the city. And that's something the community has been asking for. And that is what we want, make sure that the city do commit to helping to fix up that park uh, so that seniors and community residents can continue to be able to use it. And one of the reasons why AD Center um, was off the table because of your the environmental impacts that it would cast a big shadow on the park. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that that park is, you know, protected. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the major, you know, community investment that we are asking for. Mm -hmm. Finally, is that I really do have a big problem with the height because that is going to tower over the senior building and the surrounding low-rise tenement it's gonna be the tallest building there. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure, I mean, I can see from your design, we wanna make sure the, the facility is humane, um, is safe, and I can see the reason why you have to have those services in there. But what we wanna look at is that, how is the city working with the state continue to push for criminal justice reform and also there are other alternative programs to incarceration that we can start doing now that can bring down the population even more so that we don't have to build such big facility. Because the other one that I haven't heard at all is that we in the council, among my, you know, the four of us, we've been pushing for that detainees who have serious or mental health issue or health care need, they should not be in the detention facility. 
they should be you know, in a facility that can give them the services that they need. And I, we heard that their discussion with Health and Hospital in terms of providing facility there for people who have mental health issue or other um, health issue that they can have a place for them so they don't have to be in the detention center. And that would help us bring down the population. And in return, that would help us bring down the height. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us here, because our footprint is small, then it's, it's the height, it's not so much the bulk. But we want to be you know, sure that when the design bill go into effect, that calculating the number of detainee that could be decreased with specialized facility, that we don't have to have such a tall building in our community. So uh, as it relates to Columbus Park, I, you know, I, I think we recognize what a valuable community asset that is uh, and obviously have been having conversations with your office about what the needs are uh, in that park in particular and, and are committed to, to working on, on that issue with you. Uh, as it relates to the height of the facilities, uh, you know, we also understand that this is a core concern and consideration, and we are committed with working with you, council member, and other members of the council uh, to develop the best possible plan to address this and, and to bring down the heights of the, the facilities. Obviously, as you acknowledge um, and note, you know, one of the key uh, concerns and considerations that we're looking at is how to ensure that we do that in a way that doesn't compromise the fundamental program and services uh, available for people in detention and, and things such as smaller housing units and uh, uh, the, you know, the, the things that are actually part of this reform plan. Um, there are a number of uh, you know, ways in which we're committed to continuing to work on um, you know, how, how to reduce the population, but as it speaks, as just in a specific response to the reference that you made to consideration of whether a subpopulation of people uh, could be housed uh, in a more hospital-like environment, we do have a feasibility study that is currently underway that is looking at whether there is a subpopulation of people with particularly acute and complex medical, mental health, behavioral health issues um, that could be uh, better served in a hospital environment. And as we uh, have the determination of that feasibility study in the near future, we'll be able to share, and that, that may have some implications. Chair, I think in the coming weeks, we're gonna have a lot of work to do. We have to get these answers and we have to get these commitment before we are committed to vote. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna start off with the easy ones. What will be the staffing of the Department of Corrections at the Queens facility? Again, since the inside of the buildings have not been designed, we don't know what the housing areas will look like, therefore we don't know what the ratio of individuals in custody to staff will be, and so we don't have a plan for that yet. But you, but you do know how many pr prisoners will be there. So we, uh, the Queens facility will have 1,150 beds. That's the same as all of the other proposed sites. Uh, we anticipate that will uh, house just under about, about 1,000 individuals. Uh, we anticipate that that will be 200 of those uh, 1,000 will be female. What would be the uh, shifts of these uh, correction officers? Do they, uh, right now, they have shifts, right? Correct. And what are they? Um, there are standardized day shift, uh, mid-afternoon to evening and overnight shifts, and then there are modified shifts that start at various hours throughout the day. And we do that because we have to accommodate court and other appearances and um, different operational practices that we need people staged throughout the day. Well, I have to know what the traffic will be in Queens. I know what it is right now. And I would have to know the shifts of the correction offices, and I would also have to know what 
are the visiting hours because between the hours of 8 in the morning and 10 in the morning, Queens Boulevard is, has a lot of traffic. So Julia. And, and I do not want to add to it. There are two highways there. You have the Van Wyck Expressway and you have the Grand Central Parkway. And I do not want to add to it. And at night, between four and seven, you cannot drive down Queens Boulevard more than 10 miles an hour, if that. So that is very important to me of how that's going to be worked out. Uh, thank you very much, Council Member. We have heard from both yourself and the community that traffic is a key concern for this area. Um, we've already taken a number of steps to help address some of the potential traffic um, problems that might um, result from this project, and we look forward to continue working with you to do that. Um, we are planning for parking for staff on site and additional public parking. That should help alleviate uh, both members of the public and staff from circling the neighborhood looking for parking. That should um, help limit some of the impacts. Uh, we are also providing for a number of standard um, mitigations, signal retiming, lane restriping, those sorts of things to help address uh, potential traffic impacts. In addition, and I think this is, um, you know, what will be really helpful is that we're planning to conduct uh, regular traffic monitoring of the um, conditions uh, on the ground because our analyses are, are um, sort of forecast, but what's, what's really important is what people are really experiencing, and that will help give us the information we need in real time to address the um, impacts that are occurring as they occur. Well, I hope you sit down and consult with me because I'm living in Queens in that area not far, 57 years, and I know it very well. And I've worked in that area since 1988. So I see it every day. I can look out of my office building and see the traffic on every highway and Queens Boulevard. And we must deal with that. Um, <clears throat> tell me about the women's facility. Has there been a decision made? So uh, we are, of course, proposing that the women's facility be located uh, in this site. As I said, in the, this was a change initially. We had proposed that there be women's housing units, which are within each of the four proposed facilities. And we received a significant amount of feedback from different women's organizations, service providers. We did focus groups at Rosie's with uh, women in detention and facility staff. We did uh, focus groups and sent out questionnaires to a number of different women's service organizations. We heard overwhelmingly uh, that there was a recommendation that the women all be ho housed at one location to provide the best level of gender responsive services and programs, uh, as well as to ensure that there was not the vulnerability of being uh, a, a woman in a, a you know a small number of women in a facility primarily designed for male a male population. We are proposing that that be at the Queens location where we could provide uh, what would essentially be a separate experience for women in detention while we would have just some shared administrative uh, support space to uh, have as an efficient uh, uh, plan as possible. Um, we are committed to working with uh, different women's service organizations on developing things such as plans for transportation, just recognizing that obviously uh, while far more accessible than Rikers Island, that uh, it would require um, traveling uh, for people to visit their loved ones in detention um, to one location. So we're committed to continuing our work with different women's organizations on this issue. Okay, now the number, if the Queens facility does come to Queens, mm -hmm. it will be included in the 1150. Correct. Yes. Okay, because at the beginning, and I fought very hard, I was not going to support this if you had the infirmary, because mm -hmm. if, you, if the infirmary came into Queens, it would no longer be a, a, a friendly pr uh, facility. Mm -hmm. And I fought very hard that that wouldn't happen. You would have the buses coming back, and you would have more people coming from every borough, and that's unacceptable, mm -hmm. you know, to me. 
the height of this building is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely unacceptable to me. Mm -hmm. It cannot be that tall. Mm -hmm. We had a facility for 40 years right there. It's still there. I've toured it. There were 500 prisoners in that facility. It's only eight stories high. And if you're going to put double the amount, that brings it up to 16. Mm -hmm. You have four stories. If you went to 20, you would have four stories that you could do your facilities, all the different uh, facilities in. 27 stories is absolutely unacceptable to me and to my community. My community is not happy with this whole proposal, mm -hmm. but 27 stories is unacceptable. You went down two stories, it was 29 originally. That's not enough, it's not sufficient enough. Mm -hmm. Council member, I, you know, thank you for, uh, you know, your uh, concerns and perspective on this. Obviously, we heard you as it relates to that specialized medical annex, uh, and we, you know, r responded by removing that from the proposal, and we are absolutely committed to working with you to bring down the height of this proposed facility. Because I just want to say, I've been around the block a few times, mm -hmm. and I know, I know for sure that when this administration is gone, which is in two years and a couple of months, and I'll be gone also, that they're going to decide if there's extra room mm -hmm. to start putting people in there from all over. Mm -hmm. And that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Understood. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for um, for being here today and for your testimony and for all of the uh, collaboration over the last year and a half um, with uh, the constituents in, in the district I represent, downtown Brooklyn. Um, I have uh, just a few questions. I don't want to take up too much time as I do want to get to uh, my colleagues. Um, the first question I have is um, around the existing Brooklyn House of Detention um, and uh, my first question is, do, do, you, do you see that as a possibility to fix the existing Brooklyn House of Detention or fix it up or rehab it? Is it rehabable? Um, why is it insufficient for the next century um, going forward? Thank you for that question. And our answer is a resounding no. Mm -hmm. um, the facility itself, um, the design and layout of that facility is uh, to, to say that there are um, insufficient sight lines for safety is an understatement. Um, it has a double tier housing units in a layout that um, uh, has um, many blind spots. There are catwalks that officers have to be stationed on, um, which are um, at elevated levels in order to uh, try and see and supervise individuals who may be uh, inside their cell or um, in the insufficiently sized day rooms. The facility has absolutely um, inadequate uh, programming space. There's no programming space on the housing units at all um, and very, very limited shared pro programming space in that facility. The um, uh, the nature of the, um, you know, the design of those uh, cells within those housing units are um, uh, old bar stock format, and so it looks like something from, you know, a, a very dated uh, uh, movie or something. Right. It's like, not like not equipment like for modern reference, like Chernobyl, I think, of like the show Chernobyl that's been out there. It's it, kind of it, belongs somewhere in that Soviet. It's, it's um, good for a movie set, but but yeah, wholly inadequate yeah. for for the criminal justice system that the city yeah. is. Um, uh, supporting um, through the proposal of this project. Right. Um, so, so and then and just, I, I, they came up this summer uh, in, ex in extreme heat. Um, um, it has no air conditioning system. Well, how did you air condition? Um, how did you uh, deal with the heat uh, this summer, for example? So yes, um, thank you for raising that um, issue. Our, it, it, I think it uh, 
very clearly identifies that the conditions with which um, people are uh, living and working in the city's jail system are beyond woefully out of date and insufficient for a humane um, uh, climate controlled experience. The um, department has a number of procedures to try and um, alleviate um, and to make people as comfortable as possible who are in the facilities, either living, working, or visiting. It involves uh, uh, water, uh, ice, and fans. Um, you know, there's really not um, uh, much more beyond that. Ice and fans. Correct. Because you can't uh, retrofit a new uh, air conditioning system onto that building. To, to um, install the ductwork in order to do a forced air system um, in a facility like that, um, it would, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but as I understand it, the, uh, the construction materials used to build that facility, the, the rebar and the uh, concrete, it, the, it, it wouldn't work. You couldn't bust the hole through for the through the concrete to put a. It wouldn't be very effective. Correct, and then, then it follows with the additional information that we were uh, just discussing that you can't do anything about the absence of, of uh, existing space for those uh, necessary support program, education, mm -hmm. and um, you know, reentry services that are critical to this program. What, what year was it built? Sorry, this isn't like a... In the 1950s. 1950s. Thank you. Um, I mean, I have a, you know, my, my opinion on this is that we, we talk a lot about how terrible Rikers is and the jails on Rikers. Um, uh, I believe that the jail in downtown Brooklyn is just as bad, um, if not worse. And, um, and I feel very strongly that that building uh, needs to come down. Um, and uh, so kind of wherever we go forward, that building should not be part of our criminal justice system um, uh, on into the future in the future decades. And I think that we have, you know, we have this opportunity to have an impact on that, and I think that we should take the opportunity. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear that it's not a, it's not a rehabable um, uh, uh, building. It's the, and and I'm, I'm, in some sense, I'm glad that the, the project 10 years ago, the proposal 10 years ago, did not come to fruition because that would have done some rehabbing or try to retrofitting and so um, uh, The Brooklyn uh, proposal is uh, a higher density and higher height than the other proposals. Um, can you explain why, um, why that is? In particular, the density. I, 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 just from a land use perspective, we, we do talk a lot about height, but density is the whole envelope of the building, and, and this has, you know, right now it's a proposed density of 16.35, uh, is that right, or 85? It was in the presentation. It's in the presentation. Yeah, it's not a pop quiz here. 16.36. 16.36. Yeah. Um, significantly higher density than the other the other sites. I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Why why this site would have a higher density? Does that mean it would have a higher um, population, or what's going into that? Julia can speak to this issue. Sure. Uh, thank you, Council Member, and we understand that density is a key concern for the community and mm -hmm. yourself, um, and continue to work um, to reduce the the size and density of these facilities with your office. Um, it's a, in large part a result of the size of the lot itself mm -hmm. is smaller than in the other uh, facilities, particularly Brooklyn and Manhattan have smaller lot sizes, which drives the density up because the uh, programs that we are seeking to provide for these folks um, require more space. The, the needs of the people inside are, are tremendous and we wanna provide for um, all of the programming that, that uh, meets our vision of criminal justice. So it's a question of efficiency of space. Right. Um, and did you, I, the community early on had um, a number of times asked about examining a, a, a second location. So not, not saying that this location is, is um, inappropriate, but that it might be insufficient um, to meet the needs in Brooklyn. Were you able to go look in other locations in Brooklyn to see if they were viable? So there were uh, a few suggestions that were made to us, obviously, including by your, by your office for us to mm -hmm. look at. And uh, we did follow up, but we determined that there were not other viable sites. Uh, and really that proximity that this 
facility provides to the courthouse uh, mm -hmm. is what makes this uh, a particularly viable location. The other side's being in the Navy Yard that where was, they were. At, exactly, and that was per, per suggestion. Uh, we did follow up, and there are a number of federal issues uh, as it relates to that site. Right, right. Um, um, regarding uh, traffic patterns and um, a big issue that we have in downtown Brooklyn around uh, on-street parking of placard or quasi-placard vehicles, vehicles with um, a business card uh, in the dashboard, a, um, a COBA card on the dashboard, um, another union card on the dashboard, um, you know, a note that says I am, a, you know, a correction officer, whatever it is, there's a, we have a, a, a illegal parking problem in downtown Brooklyn. Um, how are you planning to address this issue with this proposal? So uh, I can, so I'll just say, in this proposal, separate from the placard issue, uh, as you know, there is a below grade parking that is provided as part of this proposal. How many uh, parking spots? 292. Okay. Uh, so that in the intention there is to dr address the issue right now of uh, staff parking in the street. So we understand that parking is a concern. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Department of Transportation is here who can speak to uh, the, our, uh, our efforts around addressing placard abuse across the board. And sorry, um, before we get to that, um, uh, maybe Commissioner, you could uh, speak to this. Why? Why do um, staff need to drive to work? Um, a lot of us take the, take the train to work. Why do they need to drive? Uh, well, I can tell you that um, our correction officers aren't required to live in the city, and so some travel from upstate, some travel from Long Island, and so they use their vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, I, before Department of Transportation comes up, I, I want to assure everyone that um, I am committed to following the laws and the rules of the city with regard to parking. And I was just at the Brooklyn facility the other day, and I could see why people were upset with our staff. Um, when those issues are brought to my attention, I have the Bureau Chief of Security remove that person's placard and so they lose that privilege. I would hope um, that the PD is treating our staff who abuse the privilege of, of any kind of parking spot to treat them like anybody else. Um, and I support the following of all the rules and the policies with regard to that. We are committed to being a good neighbor regardless of what borough that we're in. And just to be clear, it's not, I'm not singling out uh, correction staff. It is uh, every, uh, every uniformed uh, uh, agency staff uh, in the city and every non-uniformed agency staff in the city. There's DOT um, uh, cars that are abusing parking privileges. There are, um, you know, DEP. It's 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 across the board. It is so we're not we're not trying to single out um, corrections officers. I appreciate that. I also wanted to point out that because of our, our different tours of yeah. duty, that people also. Um, take their cars to work rather than because they might have to leave at four in the morning Correct. things like that or get there at four in the morning yes. yeah. um, right that makes I mean there's there's some there's some uh, rationale to that um, but but it's it's a, it's an ongoing issue so I do appreciate the the, the parking um, um, provision here do you want to speak a little bit Rebecca, Rebecca to the I mean, I'll just go on council's going to swear you in oh sure okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in response to questions will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please state your name before you respond. Rebecca Zach, and I do swear that I'll tell the truth. Hi, Councilmember. I know uh, we work pretty closely with your office and that you've reached out to us pretty consistently about placard abuse in, in your mm -hmm. district. And we continue to make changes as, as we see necessary, but the city, including DOT and NYPD, we're um, working towards technology that will help better enforce placards throughout the city. The mayor announced his initiative back in February, and we continue to work towards those goals. And as this process moves forward, that process will move forward too. Okay. And if you have, if you ever see a DOT vehicle, please let us know. Okay. 
they're, they're around. Downtown Brooklyn, it's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. Um, Glomani's got my number, so. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, moving on to um, kind of some broader issues um, uh, with criminal justice reform measures that the city is in control of. Um, if, uh, if we had, if, if money wasn't an object, um, and we could implement um, every type of criminal justice reform measure um, in the, uh, to the scale that we uh, could, uh, could be, you know, to the maximum scale, what would we want to do uh, with the current tools that we have and, and even looking at new and innovative tools that we aren't currently using? We had an unlimited budget. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of things we would want to do. Uh -huh. um, I think we would first want to build from a foundation of strength. We have had enormous success with diversion programs, giving judges an option uh, to have people await for the disposition of their case uh, in the community as opposed to a jail. Mm -hmm. um, there is an opportunity there for uh, expansion. I think we want to be able to also give judges the option not to sentence people to city sentences at all. Um, there have been big city and uh, council investments in alternatives to incarceration. Uh, that by itself uh, creates a kind of virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm. The less jail you have, <laughs> the less jail will be used. Mm -hmm. um, I think we want to uh, continue to encourage the state uh, to make very, very significant reforms in parole. Uh, it is the only part of our population that is increasing. Um, technical parole violators. Technical parole violators, which are now almost 10% of our population. Mm -hmm. um, surely state legislation would be helpful. Uh, and just to be clear, that's, that's people that are doing something that me, I wouldn't get in trouble for, um, but they would because it's uh, somehow a, a violation of their parole. They've, they've been, there are people who have been released from state prison. Um, they're now under supervision by the state, by parole. They have a number of rules that they have to follow mm -hmm. that, aren't, that violating them aren't by themselves violations of law, mm -hmm. although they can be, uh, curfew, associating with certain folks, et cetera. Smoking marijuana at this point? Potentially, yeah. I mean, that's different Exactly, lies. exactly. Yeah. Um, and there are, are a ton of things that could be done uh, to ensure that jail is not the first stop. Mm -hmm. um, and to the extent that people are in jail, that their cases are heard in a timely manner. And then I think um, most profoundly, given how dramatic the changes have been in our justice system, even in the last five years, and obviously building on you know, a history of a lot of work and also errors of the past 30. Um, most profoundly, we've seen just a change in the way in which New Yorkers behave. Um, fewer and fewer crimes are committed. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to um, look earlier and earlier to prevent uh, people having contact with the justice system mm -hmm. uh, and ensure that that is never an option. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a really very fundamental change. Mm -hmm. uh, and there has been a lot of investment in this administration, mm -hmm. um, in jobs, in play, in uh, physical spaces. Uh, but I think that's something that we need to turn to with even more attention. Things like a Cure Violence Initiative, um, uh, so I think cure violence, crisis management. Yeah, I think the, uh, the MAP Initiative Neighborhood Stat, which is mm -hmm. uh, not exactly about crime, um, but about all the things uh, that promote safety, like mm -hmm. investment in jobs, uh, mm -hmm. universal summer youth employment for those uh, mm -hmm. areas, uh, investment in physical spaces, making parks and, uh, and uh, the developments uh, mm -hmm. more inviting. Uh, all of those are important pieces. Right. So I have here the 
the Closed Rikers Just Leadership Build Communities platform a good place to start, I think. Um, if, <clears throat> if we were to propose um, to you all a list of investments that we think might be wise um, to pursue, you'd consider it? You'd, you'd take it under advisement? I think that's what this process is all about, and mm -hmm. we're obviously committed to working with the council uh, on these issues that are of importance to all of us. Great, great. Um, Two more questions. One is uh, therapeutic beds. Did, one, did any of my colleagues touch on the therapeutic beds issue and, and kind of where that where we are with that and how many sites we're looking at within the health and hospital system? If you already answered it, uh, you don't have to answer it now. Uh, so I spoke on it briefly. Okay. I said that we do have a feasibility study underway. Uh, it's looking at a small number of different locations throughout the uh, health and hospital system. And uh, obviously, as, as I said earlier, this is a study as to the viability of whether a subpopulation of people with particularly acute, complex medical, mental health, behavioral health needs uh, could be housed in a hospital-like environment. Uh, and as soon as that feasibility study is complete, we will be able to uh, share that. And our intention is for that to be complete very soon. Um, so that's, that's it for me right now. Um, I'll turn it back to the chair if I have another a question I might come back for a second round. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. We have been joined by Council Members Rosenthal, Miller, and Traeger. We're going to move on with questions uh, from my colleagues. Uh, we're going to a five minute clock. We're going to hear first from the chairs of uh, public safety and um, criminal justice. So we'll call on Council Member Richards and then Council Member Powers. Thank you, Chairs, and thank you to all my colleagues for your work on uh, this important issue. Um, so one thing that has not really been discussed, and, and it's an, a glaring area of concern to me, is the programming um, for the detainees at Rikers Island. And uh, Commissioner Brand, uh, you remember me visiting, I think last summer or the summer before, where I had an opportunity to speak to many of the detainees, uh, in particular about the programming or lack there of programming being offered to detainees at Rikers Island. Can you just go into what is the strategy? So I think you're supposed to provide five hours or, or somewhat, if you can just speak to that, of programming to detainees. Um, can you just speak to what is going on at this current moment at Rikers Island when it comes to programming? Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Uh, programming, especially in the new jails, is the focus of this administration, and, and that's why the housing units are, are, are being designed the way they are, to allow for programming um, in every housing unit so that people can take advantage of that. Uh, so we have been working diligently on, on uh, creating and, and offering up to five hours of non-school programming every day to anyone who wants to engage in that. So um, being clear, we cannot force anyone to, to take advantage of programming, uh, but we offer it. And so, uh, for example, with um, RNDC, we have we recreated the Peace Center that was existing in uh, GMDC when we closed it, and we offer auto mechanics and construction. Um, we, we have um, a, a music lab, we have education, we have enhanced recreation um, for those who wish to partake in um, a different way of living their life. They can take um, classes with um, cure violence folks with the Fortune Society, with other providers that get them thinking about job prospects and earning certificates in gaining skills that when they leave our custody actually could get a job with. All right, because I, I, only I have a few questions. I, I just want to be clear that that was not presented by the detainees at Rikers Island to me. Um, when I spoke to them. Um, so before I could support this specific plan, I need to hear some concrete things on how programming is going to look different. And I understand you can't force individuals at Rikers to take advantage of the programming, but from their mouths, they are not being offered the necessary programming that they would like to take advantage of. Um, you mentioned Elmhurst Hospital also. 
um, in terms of the the um, detainees, uh, who are, who, the the women's facility that's being proposed. Can you speak to any conversations with Elmhurst Hospital um, that you've had in terms of uh, resources um, being given to that hospital if they're going to um, obviously take in more clientele? I think we should just clarify that. Yeah, I'll clarify for the, uh, we presently operate um, a hospital prison ward at Elmhurst and um, this uh, okay. program uh, doesn't represent an expansion of what presently exists there. But you're expecting more women to No, be actually, um, the uh, current population of, of females in the Department of okay. Correction Custody is around 400 and the projection is that that would be near uh, about 200, so about 50% uh, reduction in total population. Okay. Um, but I think there, there should be some conversations if there haven't been there. Um, how many corrections officer jobs do we anticipate we'll lose? Will we lose, will we see any decrease in jobs uh, for corrections officers through this process? So um, we attrit about 100 staff members every month. Um, we don't expect a change in that over time. And um, as I said, that we would, we have been promised that there would be no layoffs. So we will keep track of that as time moves forward to see if people are leaving at the same rate. So yes or no, will, do we in, There will be a decrease in, in a total number of officers from the 10,000 that we have now. Okay, and is there a plan Through to attrition. make sure? Okay. Um, and are there any other plans, have there been any conversations about once Rikers close, uh, closes, any plans for the current facility? Um, has there been any conversation that I should be aware of, that we should be aware of regarding the facility once it closes? No, but I, so I think Liz can speak to what is uh, cons under consideration as we think about the opportunity that the closure of Rikers uh, presents. Sure. So. First, we'd like to get through you, Lerp. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we think that there needs to be a very, very full and collaborative process with a lot of input uh, from many, many different groups, those who have been impacted by Rikers. Uh, there are, as you know, many, many different ideas, some coming from the council, some coming from other groups. Uh, and we would anticipate, should we uh, be successful in getting through ULERP, uh, in creating that kind of planning. How effort. soon after the U ULERP? Very soon. Very soon. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, I hope that there's a, there's a robust community input um, process for this. Um, but let me, just, let me just add that I am hoping that um, through this process that once again there's a real commitment around the programming because this is supposed to be about rehabilitation and connecting folks once they get off the island. Well, they won't be on the island if we, if we pass it back into society to be successful. Um, let me also add that I hope that we are not going to just be rearranging um, the chairs on a sinking ship because that's what Rikers has represented for decades. And for my brothers and family members and friends in our communities, this has not been a place uh, that has pushed rehabilitation um, realistically. So I'm hoping that um, we're gonna do something different here and that this is not the same old song and dance of us just moving people from one place to another place um, with the same exact activities that are happening there now. So I wanna thank the chair, I look forward to working, but once again, I'm looking for, just for me, um, a firm commitment on funding um, for programming, and also I'm looking to see what that programming looks like. So thank you. Thanks, um, and thank you for your testimony. And I'll just pick up right where he left off, which is that you know I remember this effort starting and the Close Rikers campaign, and it was about obviously closing Rikers down by the name of it, but really a process of changing the system, making you know the fairer and safer uh, system. Uh, you know, one glaring thing here in the testimonies is that we're not necessarily proposing 
programmatic changes, is there operational changes in addition to the new facilities? And I think, I think um, uh, someone said in their testimony, we don't want to just change locations, we want to actually uh, have additive value to everybody. And that's the people who work there and people who are in the custody as well. So I, I want to start there. The, um, on the programming, as an example, we still don't meet our mandate, as I understand, in the five year, the five hours of programming. We've had uh, we've had conversations around ensuring that people can pay bail or to be released after paying bail within the time frame that we've done. I think that if we are going to be citing new facilities with the goal of looking towards the future and we are not adding in the sort of operational programmatic uh, changes that this whole effort was anticipated, anticipated the where where uh, we are sort of you know, rearranging the chairs or changing locations without the uh, mission. So I want to dig into a little bit. Uh, the, f the first one is um, around safety. And in Mach J's testimony, it says it's designed to reduce violence with improved sight lines, modern layouts, smaller housing units, better modern practices. Um, can, I, can you provide us a clear examples of how, for instance, sight lines or smaller housing units or better modern practices will make people safer? What in, what in a day-to-day -day situation Situation, does that actually mean in terms of keeping somebody safe, either an employee or somebody who's in custody? So if you recall the drawing that was up, um, if you look at a uh, modern housing area versus what we have now, what we have now is a linear design. And so you have a large amount of people walking through the housing area at any one given time and typically one officer on the floor who has to maintain visual uh, sight lines with everybody and what they're doing. In a modern housing area, everything is combined in one location so that the officer, um, it's, first of all, it's smaller, less people to keep an eye on. Um, there would be access to recreation, so folks who weren't engaged in programming or inside during the day, not having visits or going to court, would have access to recreation whenever they want. There's, there's program spaces built into each housing area so that the programs can be delivered in the housing unit. Therefore, if there's an alarm or an emergency somewhere else, the entire facility doesn't shut down which causes movement to shut down, which causes programming delivery to shut down. So if there's no interruption in your housing area, the day can go on as planned. And so you have an opportunity to reduce idleness, number one, and, and engage in some activities. Number two, you have smaller units so officers can move around and keep an eye on everyone. You have direct light. Um, into the cell area and the housing area, which just creates a more humane environment to be in every day, whether you're working or living there. Um, and the housing areas will be wired for uh, use of tablets, um, individual tablets where programming, if you don't want to engage in a group program, you can do your programming, read a book, um, and do other things on your own tablet. And so, Having that ability to have all of our housing areas wired for um, internet service, we can also do commissary through that, we can do televisits through that, we can um, have email, we can do things that the jails that we have now were just not designed for. Okay, I have, will have follow-up questions for you, but I am on a time, so I'll, I'll continue. Um, the price tag has been brought up, obviously, around the price tag of locating, citing new jails. Um, none, I, I've not heard a lot of talk about cost savings that are achieved through a plan, whether it's our transportation, capital, uh, capital investment into a aging infrastructure right now. Do you have numbers on uh, cost saving anticipated by uh, relocating or, change, or, or you know, building new facility, modern facilities, and can you share with us the, what those numbers might look like? So I don't have a, a thorough projection um, presently of cost savings, but I will, can specifically answer your question with respect to the transportation because I think um, fundamentally, uh, you know, a core value that's represented in this program is keeping people close to their communities and close to their um, to their courts and their attorneys and services. And we know that there's a very high correlation between boroughs of residency and um, uh, boroughs of court cases. And so with respect to transportation, the Department of Correction presently spends about uh, $40 million 
million dollars on the cost of transportation, and that is, um, you know, uh, forty million dollars annually. Is that annually, the? correct, and it's um, approximately, um, you know, it could be up to seven fifty to a thousand people um, a day that are moved to and from whatever facility they're in, either Rikers or a borough, to another borough for court, and because um, some, you know, only a small number of people are presently in the borough of their court of arraignment. So the um, cost savings there, um, we don't have a specific dollar, but we know they would be um, significant. Can you, um, so I, I don't want to belabor the point. If, if you, if it would be helpful, I think, if we also could have an understanding of how much money saved through a plan of, and also over the long term as we're adding, we're building new buildings, that to me, we should anticipate some less need to do patchwork capital improvements onto buildings Absolutely. in addition to not having air conditioning and other cell, cell doors that don't lock, things like that. Yeah, and I think much of um, that, and especially as it relates to personnel cost, um, once we have um, uh, the design build, um, assuming this ULURP is approved, and we have uh, you know more greater understanding of the design of these buildings and the number of uh, what we would refer to as a post, an assignment where we would, and on what number of tours the Department of Correction would need to staff areas of the building, we could um, establish a, a, non, a better, a more concrete understanding of the operational costs from a personnel perspective, which certainly drives, um, obviously, a lot of um, of the ongoing uh, expense of. Okay, I, I just, I'm sorry. Much is my last question. Um, this came up earlier, but I just want to ask this again: Is there a plan for how the uh, Rikers will be closed, and what phases, and what new facility, which, in which order the facilities will be built and operationalized? So we're still uh, working through that plan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Jamie can speak from the Department of Design and Construction, but you know, with the ultimate timeline of 2026, I'll let him speak to the details. Thank you. As I stated earlier, Council Member, uh, we are working on the plan. Um, I should take the opportunity to mention uh, what's been brought up a number of times, which is uh, the city has authorization from the state legislature to use the design build approach to build these facilities. This gives us some great advantages in being able to deliver uh, cost effectively and in a timely manner, as well as being able to incorporate innovations and best practices from across the country because we really will become the owner of choice um, for people who would want to come in and deliver high quality facilities. So uh, because of that, we're working on a program management plan, including a full schedule. Certainly the schedule incorporates closing Rikers and the Barge and opening the four new facilities in 2026. Uh, and we'll be adding further detail to that over the coming months. Well, when do we have a completed plan that, that tells us when new facilities open and uh, existing facilities either close or you start relocating people. Um, we're, we're working on the plan right now. I, I can't give a specific timeline. I just Do we have it before we vote on it in uh, October? I, I'm, I'm not sure that we will in full, um, but we can certainly provide you with further details as we develop them. I, I, I just would like to push you guys a, a little bit on this one. I mean, there are communities here that are uh, uh, here, obviously, concerned about what the plans are in their district. And I, 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 I support the plan. I, I want to be clear about that. But I, um, but I think that it, it, it's, it's, it is a little unfair for to us not to have information about what the phasing will be like and what the plan will look like. We are here at a land use hearing to talk about this, and we don't have clarity on which, which of these districts will get the facility in what order, not to mention we have like a women's facility in Queens that uh, we want to relocate people off of that perhaps quicker. And I do think it's important that the council and, and us and the communities that are impacted here have some clarity on what the plan might look like before uh, in at least the coming weeks or, or sooner than I think anticipated by the administration. Thank, Thank you, you, Council I, Member. I, I, I would just want to add um, to be responsive to your to your concerns, which um, we um, absolutely are um, mindful of assessing um, the those that are presently in custody, and as um, was was discussed at length earlier, the expected continued decline of our um, uh, population in custody. But there are considerations that um, you know uh, are underway and that will continue to be underway as we assess um, the needs and the housing needs and the, and the risk and the custody um, requirements of, of who those specific 
um, individuals are at which points in time that drive uh, an assessment of uh, what facilities that are presently in our uh, criminal justice system in New York City are necessary in order to support those individuals and the housing um, and, the, and their custody as we move through um, the design and, uh, the, and build of, of new facilities. Thank you. We're going to hear now from Council Members Lansman, Gordenchik, Ku, and Gibson. Good afternoon. Um, as you know, I chair the Committee on the Justice System, which oversees the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. And um, I can say how happy I am today to finally be at this point, after we have had so many conversations, both in the formal setting of this chamber as well as informally. Um, and of it may not be known to most people, but my district is actually uh, 150 feet or so from where this jail in Queens would be built, so I have uh, that interest as well. Um, I was a little surprised over the last uh, year or so to see objections being raised uh, to this plan um, by those who say that they want to close Rikers Island but offer no other meaningful solution for where people would be housed. Can you tell me system-wide, uh, what is the capacity of our current New York City jail system, Rikers and the, the existing jails in the boroughs? The capacity, not the Yes, Sensing. our current, our current um, uh, what we refer to as um, uh, beds of standard, which are the number of available beds that have, are, um, are uh, on our master facility um, uh, documents with the State Commission of Correction, is approximately 11,000. 11,000. And this plan calls for, once completed, about 4,600? Correct. So that represents a substantial reduction in the capacity, in the ability of New York City to jail people, correct? Correct. Well, that represents to me, I think, an extraordinary accomplishment in making it very, very difficult for future mayors and future councils to go back to a mass incarceration model. And it severely, severely limits the ability of the city to use incarceration as a means of addressing public safety issues. Of the current population, it was about 7,000 we're at today? Correct, correct. Roughly how many are from Queens or have Queens cases? Whichever way is easier for you to answer that question. It's about 900 um, uh, Queens residents. 900 Queens residents. And currently none of them are detained in Queens, correct? The Queen's facility is not an overnight housing facility, correct? And I just should qualify with the issue of residency. I just want to be clear. Residency is um, uh, self-identified, and so we do have a, you know, a fair percentage of folks in our custody um, where we don't necessarily have their borough of residence um, on record in the departments. Right. So it's about 700 people, given that, that qualification that you just mentioned, who are detained somewhere other than their home borough why is it important from a criminal justice perspective, from a public safety perspective, for people to be detained as close to home as is reasonably possible? The research has shown that maintaining uh, close contact with your support system in the community that you come from is actually a positive influence. And so when you not only have um, a support system close by who can come and visit and keep that communication and that support system going, um, which gives you hope and keeps you motivated to do well and to, be, and to get out. Um, you also have the availability of providers. So if you have um, attorneys or you ha may have a, a counselor that wants to come see you where, where you had connection in the community, they're close enough to come and continue that connection while you're, you're being housed with the DOC. Now, you've been a corrections of, uh, professional for how long? I'll just say over 35 years. Okay. In your professional opinion, does the establishment and the existence of this jail in Queens pose any public safety threat 
to the people living in that community, to my constituents, some of whom live, as I said, about 150 feet away from where this jail will be built? No. Well, I thank you very much. I appreciate the partnership and the collaboration that we've had to this point. Rocky, as though I sometimes make it, um, I know we have a long way to go, uh, but I look forward to continuing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's no longer good morning, it's good afternoon. I was worried it might get to be good evening. Um, I, well, we'll be here for a while, right, Madam Chair? Um, I have to tell you, I am more than a little bit concerned about the inability of this panel that's before us to answer questions this morning, um, especially um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Torres Springer said these buildings have not yet been designed. Is that an accurate statement? I'm, I'm remembering what you said accurately. So if they haven't been, is that a yes? I Council member, they ha the design hasn't been advanced past uh, the, the master plan stage, which what, is what the, well, the EIS studies. So they haven't been designed, that's what I'm hearing. And if they haven't been designed, we have had a very, very difficult time, to put it mildly, getting uh, questions on financing. Um, I'm in favor of closing Rikers Island, as are most of my colleagues in the council. But I also am responsible to the taxpayers in the district that I represent, and their property taxes are going through the roof. And you're telling me, when we, we were here for the preliminary budget hearings led by Chair Drum, um, Dep uh, Director Hartzog wouldn't answer at the beginning, or she couldn't answer at the beginning or at the ending hearing. And finally, on the executive budget, we heard eight and three quarter billion dollars. And now you're telling me that these haven't been designed, so how do I have any confidence in taking this vote that these numbers are accurate? We are talking about an incredible amount of money that the city is going to expend. We want people detained by the city to be in humane conditions. We all agree on that. But I do have a, a great deal of difficulty beyond that with the numbers that you have not really been able to provide. Thank you, Council Member. Um, and, and I do want to reiterate, we certainly, the administration shares your concern to make sure that uh, we're adequately budgeting for facilities and responsibly using taxpayer dollars. Um, the cost estimate uh, that served as the basis for the budgeting was done based on the master plan facilities. Um, so construction professionals are able to take a master plan and create a cost estimate. Uh, the thing you want to be careful of at that stage is to make sure you have enough contingency as the design develops. And so that's the number that we're carrying. Um, I don't we'll want to interrupt you, but being uh, in and around government for over 30 years, I, I understand all about contingency, especially work that's done by the city of New York. Right. Um, the question that I have additionally is last year, um, in my questioning of uh, commis the commissioner, um, it was revealed that it had been at least 29 years since the city has built a new jail facility. So now we've been over a, another year and a half, so it's over 30 years. Who's actually designing this? Have you hired outside people? Because there's, I don't know that there's anybody left from 30 years ago. Sure. Um, so, uh, council member, as I was mentioning a little earlier, um, we are uh, very pleased that we have the ability to use the design build method and do want to support uh, the members of council who have helped us with the state legislature to, um, to get that ability. So design build means that we're able to create an, uh, an integrated team uh, of construction and design professionals, construction managers, engineers, architects, um, who are able to deliver the project and to do so, uh, and this is, I wanted to come back to your point about contingency, to do so in a way that we expect to be cost effective, we expect far fewer change orders and cost overruns, we expect far fewer scheduled delays. Um, and another advantage of having that ability is we expect to be able to attract uh, best in class services uh, for those who have delivered uh, criminal justice facilities elsewhere across the country and, and even uh, around the world. Uh, and Design Build really gives us that capacity to create a team like that, have a competitive process to attract the best and brightest to come in, finish the design, and deliver the facilities. I appreciate the Design Build. I was, I was at the opening of the second span of the Kajusko Bridge last week. It looks nice. Yes. Hopefully it'll cut down on uh, some people's commutes. But um, I am also concerned, and I, some of my colleagues have touched on this also, that um, 
I don't know who's going to be here after the end of 2021. We know that the mayor is not going to be here. He's term limited. I don't know who the next mayor will be, she or he. I don't know. And um, it concerns me greatly that we are investing what may turn out to be $10 billion um, without a plan that, um, and you can hear from my colleagues, is a great deal of unsatisfaction um, this morning uh, because we don't have all the details and we're going to be asked to vote on this in a very, very short period of time. So um, my admonition to you um, is that we need answers and we need them before we vote. And um, this is a critical investment that the city is making um, and it has to be done uh, with answers. I understand that there are always contingencies in life, but I really don't feel satisfied at this moment as somebody who is supporting this proposal um, that we have what we need. Um, and that's not just coming from me, but it's also coming uh, for my colleagues whose districts are going to host these uh, facilities and the chairs of the committees. And I want to thank, um, we got eight seconds left. I could talk a lot in eight seconds. I want to thank uh, Chair Adams for indulging me at this time. So thank you for your answers this morning. Um, and uh, ma Madam Chair, I, I may just, uh, that if you don't mind, I may just respond quickly to um, uh, part of the council member's last statement. Council member, we certainly share your concern for the importance of how the process moves forward. I did just want to make a couple of notes. Um, uh, it, it is true that because we're using design build, um, there's a level of design that will be advanced after this process. And so we're uh, thinking very carefully about how to put reviews in place. We're going to be developing a set of design guidelines that will be the subject of the procurement. We've created a design advisory group. Uh, the council's represented on that group, as are the borough presidents and other representatives, uh, to look at the guidelines as they pertain to how the buildings will fit into their surrounding neighborhoods and communities. Uh, we'll be uh, taking the designs to the Public Design Commission through their normal process. And in the course of doing that, of course, regular updates and briefings for all the elected officials, council members, uh, the community boards, the neighborhood advisory committees, the Manhattan Joint Task Force uh, that's been created, um, and a lot of stakeholder uh, input and review of the designs as they advance to make sure that they incorporate all that input. Last question, are there any state or federal dollars, or is this all on, all on us? Uh, there, there are no state or federal dollars. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Council Members Koo, Gibson, and Lander. Thank you, Chair Adams. Uh, hi, yeah. Some groups uh, we have met have serious issues with the draft uh, EIS environmental st impact statement and have claimed inaccuracies uh, relating to the renderings, high public impacts, open space analysis, and more. So what is the administration uh, doing to ensure everyone's voice is heard and respected during this process. Uh, what actions will be taken so that the public can come in on this um, plan? I invite Julia from the Deputy Mayor's Office of Operations to speak to this. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, we are aware of the, the, um, the accusations that you're referencing. We did take a look at them. Um, our EIS was prepared in accordance with all of um, the requirements and is accurate. Um, but I think more to the point of the broader engagement, uh, we understand that folks in the communities are concerned about the height and, and the bulk of these buildings. And as we've said a number of times, we are committed to working with both council and the communities to um, meet our uh, criminal justice goals and the vision for this program in as efficient uh, a way as possible and, and to um, continue to reduce the size and um, density of these buildings and address the, the neighborhood concerns. Sorry, yeah. So how, how are they going to like, uh, get their voices heard uh, with you? So uh, we are committed to doing continued community engagement uh, through the duration and following the ULERPA pro process, uh, obviously assuming ULERPA is approved. 
Uh, we are committed to still working and meeting with the neighborhood advisory councils, uh, the council community boards, uh, the Manhattan Joint Task Force, uh, and as Deputy Commissioner Torres Springer uh, mentioned, there will be a number of uh, review bodies for design as well as uh, a structure set up within the Department of Design and Construction so that community members who have concerns uh, about the impacts uh, during the demolition and duration of the project have a, a mechanism by which they commu can communicate to DDC. Thank you. Uh, we all know uh, Vikers Island have a lot of problems. That's why we are closing it down, right? So what is the city doing to ensure that the problems in Vikers will not be replicated in the borough jails? How, how will you prevent this happening again? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the, you know, a, the f a fundamental question and why we acknowledged early on that obviously uh, developing these borough-based facilities are one piece of this, uh, but culture change goes beyond and begins before the facilities themselves. Uh, I think that the department spoke to some of the ways in which they anticipate these buildings being different and uh, changes that are being made now as well as contemplated for the new facilities, but Commissioner, Brenda, if there's anything you want to add. So I would just add that we are positively not the same department that we were five years ago, and we are not waiting for new buildings to change our culture. We've hired over 6,000 new officers. We've provided them with training in crisis intervention and de-escalation <laughs> techniques. We've provided them with training in mental health first aid. We've um, developed a new leadership academy so people can develop their skills at all levels. We've instituted a mentoring program um, by both officers and captains for people new to their roles as officers and first-line supervisors. We have um, overall transparency in the agency with our data that we did not have five years ago. We publish our data routinely, we share it with the public, we share it with the council members, and we use that data to make data-driven decisions on, on how to get better. We're working collaboratively with all of our oversights, including City Council, um, who you all challenge us to think differently, to get better, and we do that. And we have a firm commitment by our executive leadership, both uniform and non-uniform staff, to uh, commit to correctional best practices. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Adams. Happy birthday, Councilmember Koo. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here and uh, giving us a real overview of what this plan calls for. Um, there's been a lot that I've listened to in the past couple of hours, so I want to get to a couple of questions and specifics on the nature of the plan. Um, a lot of my colleagues alluded to the process of how we got here, uh, the community engagement, and a lot of things that happened and a lot of things that did not happen. Um, I recognize the administration has done an incredible amount of work to get to today, but I also know the advocates and many of the groups, the women's organizations, did a lot of work as well to get us here today, and so I really appreciate that that, particularly the details, the criticisms, and the critiques, and everything put together really to try to get us to a point where there is a balanced approach to this. Um, my first question is, we're talking about an investment of almost eight billion dollars. Um, the original plan was 10 years. Because of design build, we're now down to seven years. Is there a possibility that with design build, we could further reduce that timeline? And this is, as Councilmember Gradenchek mentioned, the first time in a long time that we're building jails. Um, DDC right now has almost 30 different agency clients that you work with today on a lot of our big projects and, you know, different things of that nature with DOT and others. Um, is this something that DDC is willing to undertake, um, coupled with some of the other consultants and others that you will bring on board? Is this something that you are ready, willing, and able to manage and oversee? I think that's for me. Um, uh, so uh, thank you very much, Council Member, and for your partnership in all of our work, uh, including this work. Um, I, I will certainly say um, 
We're always looking for ways to build faster. Um, and we have, as you know, and we've discussed many times uh, over the last year, created a blueprint for uh, construction excellence for our agency uh, to deliver faster, uh, more cost effectively while maintaining high standards of quality. And so we will certainly be always looking for efficiencies. This is really our uh, best estimate based on a lot of work about what the uh, overall length of time is uh, to deliver this program. So um, we, we really are sticking with that time frame. Uh, in terms of the capacity of the agency, again, I would go back to the point that um, design build allows us to really bring in a lot of innovation. One thing we've done uh, in anticipation of a ULERP approval so that we're ready is we've brought on board a program management consultant uh, that has a significant amount of capacity to help us uh, set up the program, uh, manage the procurement of the design builders, subsequently manage the design, planning, construction activities. And we really believe that uh, by adding that capacity to the very strong capacity of our construction agency, uh, we have a very high ability to deliver this project. Okay, and I also share colleagues' concerns as it relates to cost savings and other measures that this council has consistently been talking about. If the population has been reduced from 8,000 to 6,000, you would wonder why the price tag has not changed. And I understand contingency, but I also understand we have, at times, as an administration, we've held money to the side that has not been drawn down on. So I would hope that as we move forward, cost savings is a big priority for us in this plan moving forward. Um, I want to get to specifics. Um, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of criticism about how we got here, specifically as it relates to the Bronx site. Um, and I also agree with the timeline. As we move forward, we need more specifics. The four boroughs we're talking about, the Bronx is very unique because we do carry the barge every single day. And I agree with my colleague that that has to be taken into consideration if we are talking about doing this in a, in a way that provides equity for all four boroughs. Um, the Sherman Avenue site that has been talked about, that has been analyzed more than once, I just want to do some fact check to make sure that the administration did everything possible to analyze this site and make a determination that it was unfeasible. So the three parcels of land, two of which were state-owned, total square footage was about 120,000 square feet. Is there or was there a minimum square footage that the administration was looking to satisfy in order to move forward on a site? So we didn't have a uh, set number in terms of what the minimum square footage was, but okay. obviously we were looking at what were, vi what were sites that would provide a sufficient square footage to accommodate the program. And so, uh, as mentioned earlier, were we to provide uh, the program at the Sherman Avenue site uh, because of both the awkward configuration but also the small size uh, it would have been a facility that is uh, more than twice as tall as the current proposed location. Okay, as I understand, and Chair, if you can just indulge me for a quick second, the original 120,000 square feet, the height, it, height would have been uh, 50 stories. Um, when you talk about programming, recreation, outdoor space, services for the medical team, the uniform, the civilian, parking for visitors and staff, um, that site itself, the three parcels, would have been 50 stories. Do you happen to know that if it included the underutilized family court annex, what square footage we were talking about that would be added to the 120,000 of parcel? That has to be the last question, Councilmember Gibson. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want to speak to that? Um, I think we can get back to you with more information. I don't have that additional square footage off the top of my head. Okay, but, sorry I'm out of time. Yeah, no, and, and I'll just note that that estimate, we, so we can get back to you in terms of the specific square footage, but that estimate in terms of that approximate 50 story or over 500 feet was considering the portions of the three sites that we could use, including the family court annex. So we did actually include that in the analysis. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to hear from council members Baron Rosenthal, Miller, and Traeger. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel for being here. Uh, Neely Fuller said, if you don't understand white supremacy and racism, everything you think you understand will only confuse you. So realizing that this country's tenets and origins are based in racism and understanding that the population that fills the jails and the prisons are black and brown people who are there because of some stereotypical notions that exist about their inferiority or inhumanity or tendency to be criminals, and judges have said about that criminal tendency from the bench, so it exists, and I'm talking about recently, and understanding that the capitalist nature is to extract as much free or cheap labor as we possibly can, and as we understand that the mass incarceration that came about as a result of the drug wars and that led to the prison, the expansion of prisons under Rockefeller and Carey particularly, uh, exemplify the concept that if you build them, you will fill them. And I'm pleased to have heard from uh, Ms. Glazer who said that the less you have, the less you use. That was said here today. So we need to look at the history of prisons and jails and the detention system in the context of the American history that we are living under to talk about, yes, getting rid of Rikers with all of the problems that, that it has and has manifested and the culture that exists there and not just transport that system to smaller institutions, but to look at programs to look at, as has been mentioned, alternatives to incarceration, to look at uh, the bail reform. You know, Judge Bruce Wright was greatly um, uh, uh, criticized by his colleagues because they called him Cut Him Loose Bruce. Because he said if jail is only if, if bail is only to make sure that the person comes, and if the nature of these crimes are uh, minimal, we're not going to hold them in a jail. And it was, it was a policy that he was the only one that administered at that time. Everybody else, again, judicial discretion allowing judges with their own biases to extract from black and brown people that ability to keep them confined. And someone has, we've talked about a modern and humane system. A humane system would be one where the society provides the education, and again, I think the, uh, uh, Ms. Glatzer referred to that, the education that breaks the cycle of poverty, the jobs, opportunities that they need to be able to function in a society, the housing, of course, that's needed to be able to um, have family units and to be able to get that kind of support. And that's not happening in the jail system. My colleagues talked about the requirements for five hours uh, a day. That's not happening. If it were happening, then we would see a greater educational attainment of those who are incarcerated in prison, and we would see a reduction in recidivism, and we don't see that. So we know the feds are not contributing significantly to the situation in terms of allowing for those who are being detained to have access to um, higher education systems. And we have got to find a way to not jump to incarceration, particularly since we say crime's going down, uh, arrests going down. So if it's going down, 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 why are we now talking about this great need to expand the, the uh, system that will keep people retained? Um, the tenants of this country disproportionately impact black and Latinos. The penitentiary system came about when slavery ended so that there would be free labor 
and uh, convict leasing, and as recently as 10 years ago, the former Brooklyn Borough President used convict labor when he had his great concerts that everybody loves to go to. He used that. He used those persons to set up the chairs and break down the chairs. So it still exists. We know that those who are detained get pennies on the dollar, pennies for the work that they do that builds corporations, again, getting to the capitalist exploited system. So I think we've got to look to how we can take these billions and billions and billions of dollars and invest them in those systems that will elevate people, will educate people, will have students in classes where they are valued as people and as individuals and are taught to respect others in that same light and are given an opportunity to flourish. Um, so I had more to say, but that is a summary of what I wanted to say. So, thank you, Council Member Barron. So, thank you. So, for, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member, for, I think, naming race and bringing that into the conversation. And I think that the points that you make as part of that are critically important. This is a criminal justice reform efforts are fundamentally, at their core, deeply connected to our efforts to address racial injustice. And we cannot divorce what the history is of our justice system, and we need to acknowledge the disproportionate impact that it has had on communities of color and particularly black and Latino communities. And you are absolutely right that that has to be at the core of our work to reform the system. I think it is why so many of the organizations in this room and beyond have elevated this call to, uh, that the city is very focused on right now for justice reform and towards the closure of Rikers is because of that fundamental co commitment to racial justice and understanding that if we don't tackle these inequalities in our justice system, we will not have a more just society overall. The one point I do want to make very clear is that this is, and I think that this uh, came up in Councilmember Lansman's questions, uh, this is not an expansion plan. What we are actually talking about is reducing the number of detention facilities in our city from 11, eight on Rikers Island and three in the boroughs at over 11,000 beds to a total of 4,600 detention beds at four facilities citywide. And so quite the opposite, if you shrink it, <laughs> then we will have fewer people touched by the justice system. And so as we are focused on the closure of Rikers Island and the closure of the barge, it has had all of us put our shoulders to the wheel on all of the things that need to happen to reduce the number of people that come into contact with our justice system. And that is why there was over 11,000 people who were in detention when this mayor took office, why there are around 7,000 today, and why we say that we still need to go further, and there is so much work that needs to happen beyond just us on this panel, but in partnership with the communities and neighborhoods. And council member, thank you. We do have to talk about race, and our focus on addressing the fundamental inequities have to be part of this plan, and I think it's so important that we keep thank that you. at the core. Thank you. We need to, we need to move on. Council member Rosenthal. Thank you, um, and, and like you, I appreciate Councilmember Barron for bringing up all these issues, and of course, shout out to Nicole Hannah-Jones in the 1619 Project, who's making us all aware of the realities of our democracy and what it's based on. I want to ask, um, my focus as chair of the committee on women and gender equity is going to be around uh, what's happening with women. Um, but I think these questions could be extrapolated to the larger population as well. Um, in your testimony, you talk about a fairer, safer, and more efficient um, jail system. All words that we embrace, all of us here. Is there a way to understand how the change in infrastructure in the new borough-based facilities will, re and specifically for the women, will, how is that physical change from what we have now going to um, 
correspond with or by definition inherently result in better policy, a more just policy that we're all looking for. And specifically, we can talk about it in terms of the 200 beds for women or however you want to discuss it. Does that make sense, my question? So I think um, if you reflect back, I'm, I'm not sure if you were here when the presentation um, went up, but the design of the housing unit is a, um, a much more open space, uh, but a smaller housing unit, so there are less people in, in a particular housing unit. We know that women are more relational than men are, and so they form their own communities in their housing areas. With a smaller number of folks who are in a housing area, with the ability to have programs brought right to their housing area, um, it enhances their ability to have a successful reentry. They can, we, we have a myriad of programs designed specifically for the women that they have asked for. We've listened to their voices. We have a new director of women's programs. We have a director of LGBTQI initiatives. And so we are really focused on their success because they come to the criminal justice system through a different pathway. I and we are addressing those risks. I, I'm, we're gonna twist it just a little bit. I've heard that. Um, so does that mean there will be more education rooms built in the, the facility where there will be women? Does that mean there will be no solitary confinement? So we don't have, so there will be no rooms for solitary confinement so we don't re-experience what happened with Laylene Polanco? Does that mean that the um, medical ward, medical area will be integrated in some way, just for the women, for the, now I guess you're saying 200 beds. So all of the housing areas are designed to have medical services in the housing units. What does that mean? So our, our medical providers can come directly to the housing area to provide uh, medical services, do assessments. And that doesn't happen now? The physical layout this right is, now this is at Rikers makes it so that can't happen? The women have to move to the clinic. They have to physically be escorted downstairs to the clinic. And what's holding back the medical professionals from coming to their units, the way you're describing right now? Because that's not the way the facility is designed. All the medical equipment, all the services are designed around a localized clinic. And so what's the change in the medical equipment that I can see in passing this ULERP so that I can know that this is going to happen? So that's the kind of, that's what I mean by how do I see policy, good policy integrated into the infrastructure to know that's going to happen? So I, uh, I'm sure that DOC can answer more, but also Dr. Patsy Yang is here with Correctional Health Services, who has also been working uh, very intensely as part of this plan. And so specific to, I think, the difference as it relates to medical services, it might be appropriate for Dr. Yang to speak. Well, and the very, you know, I'm on no time left, so maybe you can get back to me, but specifically I want to understand why the physical layout right now at the Rosem Singer Center does not allow for what you're envisioning in this new um, facility for women. And I mean, I'm sorry I only have five minutes. I'd, I'd like to have a second round of questioning because this is the first time that I've heard that the expected number of women is 200, which is fantastic. But you know, that that would be the goal, but I haven't heard about whether or not there's going to be a unit that is independently separate for the women and whether or not there's a policy that you're contemplating uh, with this ULERP for the women that would um, change which correction officers will serve the women's population, whether or not it'll shift over to only women. Um, how do I know that as part of the EULER? Yeah. 
Thank you. Before answering, please state your name. Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, Patricia Yang, yes, I do. Um, thank, you thank you for that question. Um, although we have not um, yet arrived at the point of design, um, the work that's been done so far is really pretty exciting for us um, in terms of the new jails are expected to accommodate to a degree that we have not been able to achieve in the current jails because of the facility, the constrictions of the facility. Um, therapeutic, more and more therapeutic housing areas where uh, people will be, um, we, where our staff will be living and working, not living, but working in the same areas as people um, are living. So care, the therapeutic environment, the interactions with the providers, the teamwork between DOC and, and, um, and CHS will be um, training together, working together as a team, working with, with uh, the, our patients. Um, there will be privacy um, issues uh, uh, built into the, the construction and, and the design of the place. Um, it will allow for state-of-the-art equipment, um, lines of sight, good therapeutic areas where we can do individual and group counseling actually on the site, on, in the housing units where people live. And the one thing that I'll just add is, you know, as a council member, as you acknowledge, you know, what there's aspects of this that will be specific to policy separate from the ULURP itself. So what I want to just say is that it has been an incredibly helpful and beneficial process for us to have heard from the women's organizations, uh, both women's service providers and formerly incarcerated women in terms of informing this plan to date. So it's certainly why we are now proposing uh, a women's facility. And we do know that moving forward, there are a lot of different uh, operational questions and considerations, including things like transportation and visiting uh, that we uh, intend to continue that dialogue and relationship with the, these women's organizations so that they can continue to inform the development of the facility. Uh, thank you uh, to the chair for, um, for this critical, very important hearing. I just want to just uh, note that um, we heard, we're hearing a lot and reading a lot about uh, numbers and process, geography. I just like to remind folks that we're dealing with human life here. Um, folks who have not been convicted of a crime, um, who are literally staying in, in inhumane conditions. And I think that we need to have that at the front and center as we approach this uh, uh, critical process and critical critical vote here uh, in, in, in the council. Um, I am very interested in not just closing Rikers, I'm also interested in closing every pipeline uh, that leads to uh, to Rikers and to these types of facilities. And um, as the education chair in the council, I've been very vocal on the need to uh, destroy the school to prison pipeline and to uh, you know, in our school system, we have more NYPD agents than social workers, counselors, and psychologists combined. And that is, that is what's fueling a pipeline in, into our justice system. So the question I have is, as we deal with those who are currently in custody, what is the ratio? How many folks are in custody now? How many uh, corrections officers and how many social workers do you have full-time based in the facility right now? And to be clear, full-time social workers, because the DOE uses a word called access, not referring people, but full-time inside. So we have 7,000 people in custody. We have a staff of 10,000 uniformed officers, uh, and that includes at all levels, so supervisors as well as corrections officers. And I'll have to get back to you on the number of social workers, because not all of that work comes from within DOC, and I, I don't want to give you a wrong number. We, we need to know. We need to know the number of social workers. Because this, to me, is not just about a change of address. It's about a culture change. 
It's about an entire shift on how we treat human beings and help people and support people and not just fuel pipelines. So I just want to just note that to me, I don't just see this issue as just changing addresses, changing locations. I see this as a significant culture shift in how we treat human beings in our city, in our justice system, and closing not just Rikers, but every pipeline to Rikers and to any of these types of facilities. We should be helping people, supporting people, from children to adults. That's what we're about. And I thank the chair for her leadership and her time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Traeger. We're going to yield back since uh, Councilmember Levin does have one of the proposed facilities in his district. Councilmember Levin. Thank you, Chair. I just have um, uh, one quick follow-up uh, to my last question around um, additional community investments and um, programming like alternatives to incarceration, cure violence, et cetera. Um, have you done an analysis, or are you willing to do an analysis of um, if you were to make a certain amount of investment, um, what that could lead to in terms of lowering the overall jail population that uh, would result? I mean, it's, it's a difficult, um, it would be, I imagine, be difficult to do in a rigorous uh, statistical way, but uh, is, have you made any attempt to examine that question? So it's something that we work on all the time. It's it's what the background and backbone has been of the investments that we've made so far. I think we're entering into a period where um, bail reform is going to have a very, very significant effect on uh, all pieces of the criminal justice system and the intersection between the criminal justice system and sort of more civilian infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it very, very difficult to say with any certainty what right. the result of one thing will be as opposed to another. But knowing the effectiveness of, of uh, programs that are, you know, are evidence-based, mm -hmm. um, there's some confidence that, that the more programs there are and the more communities that those programs are in, for example, Cure Violence, if it was in every community, um, it would have an impact. Presumably. Right. We're always looking for the evidence base. We yeah. want to invest in things that we think will result um, yeah. in positive results for people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an ongoing effort and uh, a complicated one that I'd be happy to talk to you about. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Panel, thank you so much for sticking it out with us for almost four hours today. We appreciate your time. Um, we've got lots more questions. As you know, there were a number of questions that were not answered uh, to mine or my colleagues' liking today um, to our specifications, but hopefully over the upcoming weeks we can get there. Uh, we're going to excuse you at this time. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for your courtesy, and we look forward to working with you going forward. Thank you. We are going to go into the public panel session. For everyone that is tested, there will be no woos. For everyone that is coming up to testify for the public segment, we, we of course welcome all of your testimony. I must be candid with you. We have approximately 200 people signed up for this hearing today to testify on the public front. So we are going to be sure that we hold steady to a two-minute clock. We have a number of people outside waiting to get inside, so I'm going to ask everyone that is testifying on our two-minute clock to please leave quickly upon the conclusion of your testimony. Once again, everyone that is coming up to testify, and if you do not need to stay, please testify on our two-minute clock. We will make sure the clock is going to be steadfast. We're going to hold it. So we need you to testify and we need you to exit the chambers immediately upon conclusion of your testimony today. If anyone has extensive testimony that the two minute clock will not allow, we encourage you to email your testimony, your complete testimony to hearings at council.nyc.gov or give it to the sergeant at arms before you leave today. 
and the subject, subject line would be borough-based jails. Once again, the email is hearings at council.nyc.gov, subject line borough-based jails. If you cannot adhere to the two-minute clock, that will be adhered to this afternoon. Thank you for your cooperation. We're calling the first public panel. Marco Barrios, Donna Hilton, Marvin Mayfield, and Anna Pastoressa. Please step up quickly. Please step up quickly. We will assume you're not here if you do not step up. Thank you. You may begin. Please start the clock. You may begin. State your name for the record and be sure to turn the microphone on so that you see the, lead, the red light prior to beginning. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anna Pastoressa. I'm a member of Just Leadership USA. I'm speaking in support of building borough-based jails facility to make sure that Rikers closes as quickly as possible. There are also a number of ways that the mayor plan needs to be improved, improvements that you all, city council, have the power to make. I've been living in, the lower, in lower Manhattan District 1 for over 35 years, and my son was incarcerated on Rikers Island for six years, from 2010 to 2016, waiting for trial. Visits did not come easily at all. We were traveling far away for so many hours, and we endured timeless mistreatment and abuse by corrections officers when we were going to visit him. I do not believe that anyone should be locked up waiting for trial for six years. And I, as a member of Just Leadership USA and a leader of the Free New York campaign, I helped win state reforms that passed in Albany this year, which will keep tens of thousands of people out of jail across New York State. My son, for example, was remanded before his trial. While anyone is still detained, people must be given the opportunity to be near the house, near home, community, near their family, and to give attorneys the possibility to visit them quickly without enduring any abuse. I also ask that the city of New York commit to replacing city sentences with alternatives to incarceration and to diverting people with serious mental illnesses to appropriate programs. By doing that, you can plan for more reduced jail population of less than 3,000 in the next few years. I do have great concern about the Department of Corrections running any facilities where people would be housed. While we move forward with shrinking the jail population, we must also move forward with, with a plan for the Department of Corrections to be removed from running new facilities. That's the way not to recreate small Rikers Island in the city. DOC is too corrupted and like Rikers is beyond repair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good, af <clears throat> well, good afternoon. My name is Marvin Mayfield and I'm a lifelong New York City resident and I'm also a survivor of Rikers Island and the boat. I'm here to show my support for the, for the closure of both of them. Moving quickly to end the torture of Rikers Island is the right thing to do. We are already too late for the people who have died there, the people who have suffered there, and the people who are still suffering there. And just like lobotomies and bloodletting in the medical profession, Rikers Island is a tool of a bygone era which has proven non-effective. And that includes the Vernon C. Bain Detention Center, also known as the boat, which is a modern day slave ship, which is supposed to be a temporary to a temporary fix when the jail population was at about 22,000. I'm here today as a veteran who served my country, not only a person who was incarcerated and direct, directly affected, but as a veteran, as, uh, and I experienced the horrors of the boat and Rikers Island. I'm an advocate who fought for pretrial reforms that will help get thousands of people across the state home to their families. The word patriot 
has lost some of its appeal, but that's who I am. I fight for what I believe in, and I believe that the way we treat the least of us is the way we will recognize the best of us. And like advocates, we are working on multiple things at the same time, and we also expect our city to do the same. We are working on more reforms and advancing and improving expanded programs within these new facilities. The time to close Rikers Island has passed, but the best time to do it is now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us, uh, Council. My name is Donna Hilton, and I am here um, as a directly impacted woman. I served 27 years in New York State's maximum security prison for women. Therefore, I spent 13 months of that time on Rikers Island as an adolescent. And I went through the most horrific, egregious, cruel, and inhumane treatment that I can ever experience in my life on Rikers Island. And so I've heard this morning a lot of conversations about building height, aesthetics, um, what it would look like, what we need. And I just wanted to be very clear that those of us here in this room, we have led this charge from the beginning. It was those of us who said close Rikers Island, not anyone else in this room. And so we've been fighting for this for years. And we continue to fight for this because we are your neighbors, your friends, the people that sit beside you in restaurants, on the train, on the bus. We are here as taxpayers. We own businesses. We have property. We are here as individuals and human beings. And I understand the argument about it being a building, but we have to remember people. We are people first. And if we don't recognize how we are treating people or not treating people, then we are not going to get anywhere. This is 2019, not 1619. And I understand, we understand unequivocally that people commit crimes. But we have to look at the root causes of why people commit crimes. We are all responsible. We are all responsible for poverty, for discrimination, for sexism, for racism, all those isms that continue to isolate us and to uh, oppress us. So if we don't come together as a people, we will continue this culture of violence and abuse no matter where it is. And I agree with a lot of things that have been said. It is not about where the building is, it's about who's running it. And I do not agree with docs running the building. Why? Because they were my worst abusers. My name is Marco Barrios. I'm a resident of Queens and a member and leader of Judge Leadership USA and Close Rikers campaign. I urge the City Council to pass this plan to create a community-based facilities so that we can set a real plan in place to close Rikers. In the course of my incarceration on two occasions, I was sent to Rikers Island to protect my rights to see my daughter. On both occasions, the conditions of Rikers Island were so horrific that I wanted to go back as soon as possible to the maximum security prison that I came from. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe uh, the treatment of a human being by a criminal justice system. Now, I'm aware that the new buildings will not fix all of the problems in our criminal justice system, but they can be, they can be a, the start of progress by bringing people closer to their lawyers, families, and services, by moving the facilities into places where real oversight is possible and by creating physical spaces for the kinds of programs and care that are needed. For the past few months, I have been engaged as a member of the Mayor's Justice Implementation Task Force as part of the Subcommittee on Programming. And that role I have advocated, and I will continue to advocate, for a comprehensive and effective rehabilitative model for every, everyone who is still detained with transparency and accountability to see this approach is correctly implemented. When, I, when anyone is still detained, I say that because our focus is decarceration and shrinking the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Due to the re reforms we already achieved and the further changes we know are possible through our advocacy in the next few years, the city has reduced the planned capacity for the facilities from 5,000 to 4,000. And we know they can be planning for less than 3,000 in the next few years. Um, last and last, Last and not least, closing Rikers and shrinking our jail system will put us on a path to save over $500 million annually. The city can invest those savings on the kinds of community resources online in our Build Communities platform, and we will be there to advocate for that. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your passionate testimony and for sticking with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, the next panel is Evan F. Bacardi. Deputy Borough President of the Bronx, Marika Scott McFadden, Howard Collins, and Alfred Brand. You may begin whenever you're ready. Uh, my name is uh, Evan Bacardi. Unlike most here today, I will not approach this sensitive topic with frustration and anger. I simply speak my piece. As elected officials, you are sworn to a compact between our representative government and the citizens of New York. You promise to listen to the will of our people. I submit that throughout this entire process, in the interest of speed, Legal obligations and due diligence on the part of our government has been subverted. The compact of trust between the government and the people has been violated. We trust you to be stewards of our land, our tax dollars, our people, and of justice. This proposed project has been rushed through for motivations that are yet unknown. Roughly 10 billion of our taxpayer money will go to build these jails with nothing being done to address the human rights violations within the walls of the jails themselves. Without this reform, no progress can be made, and we ultimately wind up poorer, morally and fiscally bankrupt. I submit this to you. You are not under any pressure to approve this plan put into motion by the most unpopular mayor of New York City uh, that we've seen in 30 years. We need to help those left behind by the world. More jails is not the answer. This is an old way of thinking. If you spend that $10 billion in the poorest districts of our city, on education, on housing, and recidivism programs, you shall ensure that our fellow New Yorkers never again wind up behind cold steel bars. Start this process again and let the public guide you on how those funds can be put towards the greater good instead of inhumane cages. Thank you. <laughs> yep, next person, please. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me here today. I am Marika Scott McFadden. I'm the Deputy Bur Bronx Borough President, and I'm here on behalf of Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. to discuss the de Blasio administration's wrong-headed proposal to build a new jail in Mount Haven. The only thing that stands in the way of this dramatic mistake, it, one that will negatively affect the Bronx for decades to come, are you and your colleagues on the City Council. I hope that you will act to protect the Bronx and its residents from the consequences of poor planning and political expediency. I must be clear, Rikers Island must be closed. It is an abomination and a stain on the soul of our city. But that closure should be handled in the right way. Ne the necessity to close this, close this prison does not excuse the de Blasio administration's selection of the wrong site for the new jail in the Bronx. 320 Concord Avenue, which is currently operating as a city-owned tow yard. Instead, the administration has weaponized the land use process against the Bronx in order to protect their plan to build a new jail on the wrong site. Mount Haven and its residents of Diego Beekman have fought for decades to overcome the crime, drugs, despair, and abandonment that plagued their neighborhood. They rolled up their sleeves to turn it back into a livable community it is today. And I'm adamantly opposed to the burden the proposed borough-based jail for my borough will place on the community's poorest urban communities. Unfortunately, this site ignores both their hard work 
and the Lipman Commission's proposal to place borough waste jails near courthouses. Instead of reaching out to the community and engaging on this site selection, the administration has decided to impose a monolithic, oppressive structure adjacent to a community of reclaimed apartments, homes, and schools in the name of political expediency. You, members of the City Council, have the ability to right this absurd wrong and force the city to select a better site for the new Bronx jail. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, good afternoon. This is uh, Udav Samanek from the GNA Institute. Um, basically, I'm just trying to state that this system has been handed down from a, uh, let's say, a privileged class that has instituted a prison system that hasn't worked for us at all. As far as the city, as far as the nation, we have the highest incarceration rate. So um, to have people come back and forth through prison systems is very um, enduring. And, and uh, it's also enduring on, our, on the taxes that we're using, and we're not getting anything out of it. So for every person in the, in the schema of this, not just the persons that are suffering, but you know, the taxpayers to the, to, to the people sitting here before us, um, we have to do something that is, that is going to work, which is I you know, propose uh, rehabilitation centers and, um, let's say, in-house schools where people are, are actually, you know, if they, they sell drugs or something like that, they can actually, you know, get some skills and go out there and get a job and not come back. So the, the thing is that the system is pumping out so much money and nothing's coming out of it. So it's obviously a failed system. It's not even a, you know, a plight to keep it around. It's like how can we, how, how soon could, can we get a new plan in is, it should be the real, the real discourse of this all because it, it's a failed system. If we go to other countries around the world, we see plenty of systems that are not geared to, to just, uh, you know, a couple of races like this, and, and they work. They work for, the, for everybody of the nation, and they reduce the crime rates, as in Netherlands and, and a few other countries in Europe, for, for instance, I know. So it's, it's, it's a matter of us getting a grip on, on the understanding of, of how we're going to move forward to, to institutionalize a better system that works, and not something that keeps on messing up and, and it actually poses risk because people that go in there are grouped with the wrong people a lot of the time. And there's no um, comprehensive care or nature towards it that we're saying, these are, these are our neighbors, you know, these are our children, like somebody. So that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, can you just state your name for the record? Samanich. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw the opening. I didn't. Did we call you up for this panel? Howard Collins. I heard, I heard my name on the wall. Thank you. Right. We didn't call you up for the panel. So <laughs> we called you up for the panel. Howard. Okay, my name is Alfred Brand. I'm chairman of the Kew Gardens Civic Association, an organization that has been in continuous existence since 1914 and is sought out by all elected officials for our input. There was no community association, civic association, residence association used to provide input for the Lipman Commission report or the subsequent work by the city to develop the uh, borough-based jail system before it was dropped on the public with glossy brochures. There is no community input that is significant, and for that reason, the ULERP application has to be denied. This has not met the standards of ULERP. On technical matters, there are buildings at Rikers that are only 30 years old. Rosie is the name of one of them. These buildings are described as terrible places. They're not terrible places because they're 30-year-old buildings. They have to be because they are, they are uh, poorly maintained and poorly administered. What guarantee do we have that building new jails and moving the same administration into the new jails is going to be any different? There's the brochures that we've seen and the PowerPoints that we show from the city show recreation space, outdoor recreation space it's described, yet the little peripheral uh, so, uh, area is a small area within a building, and it's described by the city as an outdoor recreation space. 
these descriptions by the city are meaningless because they have no basis in fact. The buildings have not been designed. We have no assurance that the communities will be satisfied, and we have no assurance that the inmates who ultimately will occupy these spaces will be properly serviced. For those reasons, I believe that the ULERP application must be denied. Thank you. Thank you. Howard Collins, are you speaking? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Howard Collins. I'm the president of the Borum Hill Association, and the Brooklyn Jail is in Borum Hill. I represent about 12,000 residents in the neighborhood. Uh, I was a member of the uh, Brooklyn NAC, and my neighborhood understands and agrees with the moral imperative to close Rikers. It has to be done. At the same time I say that, we are having a big struggle with the proposal as is that will double the size of the jail. It will be a skyscraper of detention, a monument to incarceration, an insult to Brooklyn and the entire city. We are suggesting an FAR of eight to 10, not 16.36. Uh, we want to know, it came up in the hearing, mentioned uh, psychiatric services, mental health issues. There's an RFP being put out, but we have been asking in the NAC about numbers, about sizes. If the current system, it's been said that a third of the prisoners have mental health issues and half of that third have severe issues, why aren't they out of the system now for this, their safety and the safety of the people who work there? I'm gonna hand in my written comments, but I have one more suggestion for the city council. Please take heed. At some point, Rikers, this will happen. We will empty Rikers, and there'll be a big chunk of land. I am suggesting that any sale, lease, construction, and resulting property taxes be put into a fund, dealt with as pilots, and that those funds go to the communities that have the highest crime rates, funding education, homeless outreach, substance abuse, and any other program that cuts off the, the, the need to incarcerate people. Build communities, not bars. Okay. Um, thank you for the courtesy, Chair Adams. I just want to, uh, Howard, thank you and Borham Hill Association and all the members of the uh, Brooklyn NAC who have uh, given a tremendous amount of time and thought and conscientious effort to a constructive process. Um, so I hear your concerns loud and clear and look forward to continuing to work with you over the next several weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panel. The next panel up. Alethea Taylor from the Lippman Commission. I think the judge left. Oh, hi, Judge. I would so want everyone to applaud for you, but I'm not allowed. Judge Jonathan Lippman. Thank you. Thank you. Herb Sturtz. Stanley Richards and Siku Shakur. Please come up quickly. Panel, please remember to state your name for the record prior to speaking. And please be mindful of the two-minute clock. You may begin. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Lippman, the chair of the Rikers Commission, and we've been building this roadmap for two and a half years. And if two minutes, what can I tell you? What I can tell you is that we're, a crossroad, we're at a crossroads, critical to the future of New York City. We will either close this miserable, horrible place forever, or will these shameful, these shameful jails continue to exist and harm New Yorkers for decades to come? I'd ask you to just consider a few basic things as you deliberate. First of all, there is wide support for this plan our commission did a poll that showed almost 60% of New Yorkers support closing Rikers and building local jails. We can get the population down to 4,000. We've proven that. A couple of decades ago, it was 22,000 uh, people. Now it's seven. And with fewer people in jail, 
New York is as safe as it's ever been. We have proven that justice, that justice reform and public safety can go hand in hand, and they are not mutually exclusive. Finally, what I'd stress to you is that there is no viable path to closing Rikers that doesn't include borough-based facilities. You can... You can, you can argue the detail of it, the, the height, the side, the sites, all of those things. But rejecting this plan will mean Rikers continues to exist for generations to come. That's what will happen. And that cannot be our legacy. This, in the end, is a moral issue. The Rikers Island jails disproportionately impact black and brown communities, and they are an affront to humanity. They are an accelerator of human misery. They hurt public safety, don't help public safety. And you can't make it better. You can only go around the edges. We must shudder Rikers and once and for all remove this stain from the soul of New York City. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge. My name is Alethea Taylor, and I'm in, I, I am in support of the borough-based facilities plan. I'm a former executive director of Green Hope Services for Women that provides trauma-informed care for justice-involved women. I'm a member of the commission. I also consult with the New York Women's Foundation. I've also worked on Rosie's, uh, Ro the women's jail, and I am a family member of a formerly incarcerated individual. My focus today uh, is about women. 80% of women in jail are mothers to young children. The overwhelming majority of women in jail have extensive histories of childhood and adult physical and sexual and emotional abuse. Many have substance use and mental health needs. They need success and attainment, not containment. Rose M. Singer Center cannot provide adequate trauma-informed care or healing to those women, including women with children on Rikers. It's very physical environment prevents it. Furthermore, Riker's isolation makes it incredibly difficult for women to maintain contact with their children and other family members. Worse, the horrific prevalence of sexual assault on Riker's and the lack of accountability for it. Clearly, we need to do everything to make sure few women as possible ever end up in jail. We have much better options, like organizations associated with the Women's Community Justice Pro Project with a record of helping women get the care they need with low recidivism. The city should invest heavily to grow programs like this. We must properly support those who are incarcerated, keep them safe, give them the tools uh, to get out. Women should be housed together in a single facility, such as the su suggestion of Lincoln Correctional Facility. This is a once-in-a-lifetime chance to turn hope into reality. The alternative of doing nothing or waiting for a better plan is unacceptable. If this fails, we condemn countless women to this continued in inhumane uh, problem at Rosie's. Thank you, and I hope you support this plan. Good afternoon. My name is Stanley Richards. When I was young, I spent about 10 years behind bars for the harms I caused to my community, including two years on Rikers Island. When I came home from prison, I dedicated my life to helping people like me succeed on a different path. Today, I am the Executive Vice President of the Fortune Society, Vice Chair of the New York City Board of Correction, and a member of the Lippman Commission. I know the hell of Rikers, and I know it has to be closed, and it has to be closed now. Every day it stays open is a day our loved ones and neighbors are harmed. That goes for the people who are incarcerated there, for those who have to visit their loved ones, and for those that have to work in those facilities, for whom all of them, most of them, are people of color. We need drastic action right now to change the dynamics of the jails that we currently have. We cannot wait. We cannot wait. Shutting Rikers and replacing it with borough-based system is our best chance to get a handle 
on this unacceptable level of violence in our jails and to hold everyone accountable to make sure that our jails are safe. With a much smaller system, so much of the money we now spend on the Department of Corrections can be invested in, in the communities, in the community that I come from, Soundview Projects. We can invest in schools, mental health, substance abuse treatment, and diversion programs. We could do better than we're currently doing. We must do all we can so that people never go to jail in the first place. Then imagine this. Imagine that we use Rikers for good. Imagine putting green infrastructure out there. We could close the power plants in Queens and Bronx at that spew out po po uh, pollution and hurt our children. We could stop the th thousands of gallons of human waste Thank you. that Thank enter you. our water. We can close Thank Rikers you. and do it now. Thanks Thank very you. much. I'd like to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Holden. Please begin. Good afternoon. My name is Sabin Shakur. You can tell I'm new at this here. Um, my name is Seku Shakur, and I'm a case manager at Bronx Connect. Um, for the last five years, I've been actively involved in all things re relative to criminal justice and criminal justice reform. I spent 34 years in the Department of Corrections. I've been every maximum security prison in the state of New York. I know the difference between an uh, overly populated facility, poorly ran, and a small facility which takes more interest in programming and therapeutic services. Um, if we're talking, it's obviously we're gonna close Rikers Island, is what we do with p people inside. So if we look at the smaller facilities, staff will have more opportunity to get to know people, see them as human beings. You, the prisoners will, have, will not be worried about the more violent behavior that's gotta take place in there, to get people more freely about going to school, be involved in programs, I know the difference. When I go to Attica for the first time and get off the bus, someone's picked out and someone's beaten up, welcome to Attica. I go to, I go to a place like Eastern, you get off the bus, welcome to Happy Nappy. It's a big difference. A small facility with more funding and different people to ch in charge of the programs. I believe, based on my personal experience, that closing Rikers Island is definitely something that we need to do in our communities, and the small facilities are more better for the community in large. You don't hear people upstate in the communities talking about they worry about their property taxes going down in Danamora and Sullivan and no places. They're not concerned about that because it doesn't happen. They're not concerned about public safety because that doesn't happen either. People aren't escaping from communities, from prisons. That rarely, rarely happens and it wouldn't happen in the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, or Manhattan either. So that's not a concern that we should be worried about. We should be worried about what kind of services the people in prison are gonna have. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Herb Sturz, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Lepman Commission. In 1961, I co-founded the Vera Institute of Justice and then served as Deputy Mayor for Criminal Justice and Chair of the City Planning Commission. I'm testifying today because New York is close to ending the odious pretrial penal colony on Rikers Island. The four borough-based jails that would be authorized by this application are essential to this effort. Without this site selection approval, Nothing will happen. This is not an easy decision, but City Council is not used to easy decisions to make. But I also know the Council appreciates the urgency of supporting an effective alternative to Rikers Island. In the 70s and 80s, the City sought to shut down Rikers for the same reasons that exist today. Now we have a chance to close Rikers once and for all. I know the Council has come concerns about the unique approach of designing and building the new jails, but I believe the city responded to that very adequately this morning. Strategies now are being developed by women and men of goodwill to enjoy, enjoy vigorous community engagement as design progresses for each site. Without the Council's approval, 
we will lose the opportunity to rectify what Rikers has become, an egregious injustice itself, undermining our great city. It's really now or never. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, panel. Hi, everybody. I'm Councilmember Stephen Levin. I'm going to take over chairing for a few moments to allow our chair, Adrian Adams, to grab a bite to eat. Um, the next panel uh, in opposition, Sylvia Hack or Hayde, uh, Queens Community Board 9, Ada Kennan, Queens Residents United, Charlotte Picot, Forest Hills South, Christopher Marte, Neighbors United Below Canal, and State Assembly Member Yulin New, uh, Assembly District 65. Okay, whoever wants to begin. Is Mr. Marte in the room? I'm sorry, is Mr. Marte in the room? Oh. Okay. Sorry? Uh, that's, sorry, no, no. Okay, whoever wants to begin. Hello, my name is Sylvia Hack, and I'm representing Queens Community Board 9. There has been absolutely no community involvement in the design or thought for this jail. There are also a lot of fairy tales that you've heard here. And this ULERP is a travesty because you don't know what you are going to get. Because ULERP is based upon having a design, having a plan, knowing about the programs, and not just hoping for the very best. And that is a travesty because the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure is the only procedure in this city that communities have to try to keep their communities strong, vibrant, and improved. And you don't know what you're going to get from this. And that is a travesty. And in terms of some of the things I have heard here, which started with lies from the department, of, the mayor's department of criminal justice, on September 20th of 2018, when the deputy mayor testified to my stunned surprise that when asked about community involvement, she made the statement that there was a significant amount of meetings, both opened and closed, with the communities and the neighborhoods. Well, let me tell you, it may be for some other borough, but it never happened for Queens. The only meeting we had when we were in, presented with a fairy tale look of these beautiful sketches was a meeting that our city councilwoman had called in which there were eight or nine of us present. That is not what I call a significant amount of community involvement, both open and closed, et cetera. So no one here has really ever raised the point about what does this mean for the communities that are hosting this? Kew Gardens, which is a part of the board, is a 100-year-old com community. And 
I don't know that anybody here actually believes that a jail really winds up integrated with a community, particularly when the city has totally ignored that community. Thank you very much for your testimony. Okay, hello. Good afternoon, my name is Ida Vernon, and I'm a member of Queens Residents United. This group represents neighborhoods in Queens, such as mine, that will be impacted by the 30 plus story, 1.9 million square foot mega jail that Mayor de Blasio wants built in Kew Gardens. This is the biggest jail that's planned by footprint. I'm not here to oppose the closing of Rikers. I'm here to ask the city council to vote against this ill-conceived and incredibly expensive jail plan that some of us call Jailgate, a plan that will divert vital resources away from communities. The one thing that this jail, this jail plan is guaranteed to do is to enrich well-connected builders and others that stand to profit from high-rise jail construction. The mayor wants the city council to rubber stamp this scheme. The, the city council needs to act uh, check on this mayor who is accountable to all of us, the people of the city of New York, as the council is. The jail plan is the product of an undemocratic process that excluded residents of the neighborhoods chosen for mega jails. It came out of backroom meetings of an elitist establishment, including some of the individuals who testified here and with all due respect, the Lippman Commission. To these folks, we are just specks on the New York City map. There has been no meaningful outreach to our communities, contrary to what they tell you. And this four in one ULIP process is inadequate to evaluate a plan that is as much or more about people than it is about buildings. Of course, we, uh, the people who live in the communities where the jails are planned, care about our communities. We have to, because no one else does. The mayor doesn't. He made that clear in a meeting months ago in Queens when he waved away our concerns. And up until this point, I think that the four council members, who I understand, who represent the districts, as well as my own council member, Mr. Lansman, who just for the first time today acknowledged that it's across the street from my neighborhood, um, they have whole hog been supporting the male's jail plan. It is not progressive to disenfranchise communities throughout the city and divert resources away from our school children and our seniors, from the homeless and the addicted and the mentally ill in need of treatment to keep them from ending up in jail place. Borough-based advocates constantly invoke the mantra of the moral imperative of closing Rikers, which they then falsely equate with building big skyscraper jails. Is it not a great moral imperative to invest in New York City communities by giving residents the educational, housing, and if, other resources that they need to become productive members of societies? If, if you can wrap up your comments, that yes. would be appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you. This is not justice. This is jailgate, and I ask the council to please vote against it. Thank you. Thank you. Do this, folks. Do this. I do this when I agree with somebody. Everyone can do this. Can you yeah. see it? Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> My name is Charlotte Pico, and I'm on the board of a seven building apartment complex two blocks from the proposed jail in Queens. Something's going on here, and it's not criminal justice reform. The, the mayor and his team have conflated closing Rikers with approval of this plan as if one cannot be accomplished without the other. The planning commission and most council members have bought into this misguided ideology and decided that this purported, purported higher purpose gives them the right to dismiss the no votes of five community boards and borough presidents and betray their own constituents. If this happens, it is the epitome of a system gone awry. The city council was not set up to act in a vacuum independently of the citizens they were elected to represent. The residents of all the affected communities feel abandoned because the council members of the four impacted districts have inexplicably aligned themselves with the mayor. They know that the council traditionally defers to the wishes of the member in the affected district, but this is the first time in New York City history that a design-build ULERP for all boroughs is subject to a single vote. This massive project impacts far too many people for you honorable council members to forfeit your sound judgment and independent vote. 
There are better, faster, and cheaper ways to close Rikers without building Yankee Stadium-sized structures in residential communities. We have 14 existing jails that can be renovated in one year versus eight at a fraction of the cost. If the incarcerated numbers are going down, why build these massive jails? The detainees will not benefit from experimental towers with little outdoor recreation. In Queens, most detainees will not be closer to relatives and still have to be transported to different courts. Remember your charge to represent the people who elected you. We urge you. you to vote against this ill-conceived project. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and folks, I just want to let you all know, the Sergeant at Arms just told me there's 187 people that have signed up to testify. So if we can please keep an eye on the clock and wrap up your testimony exactly when the clock hits zero, that is going to be, that's the courteous thing to do to everyone else that is in the room. I'll be here all day no matter what, but I, I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to testify. What? Uh, 198 people have signed up to testify. I want to be respectful of everybody that's here in the room. Thank you. Assembly member, thank you. Hello, sorry. I represent a lot of people, so it, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to talk like the Micro Machine Man. Um, I represent the 65th District, uh, and it includes the current intended site for the Manhattan Detention Center. And I'm sorry. I feel like, you know. We will hold the time for you. Thank you. Folks, I, I know that tensions are running, running high, but we, this has to be an orderly hearing. We cannot have disruptions throughout the hearing or else we are disenfranchising our neighbors. Today is the, today is the, is the council hearing on this topic, and we are here all together to discuss this issue. There are a lot, there's a variety of opinions I know that tensions are running high and there's a lot of a very strong, passionate opinions on this. If we can be respectful to one another, uh, that will go a long way towards making sure that every voice is heard. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, apologies. Um, so. I just want to note that the horrific deaths of Khalif Browder and Leiling Polanco exemplify the disturbing treatment of pretrial detainees and blatant failures in maintaining our criminal justice system. Um, Rikers Island is unequivocally an inhumane and decaying institution that must be shut down, um, but we believe that this can be achieved in a different manner than the current process. During the initial Rikers Island Closure Task Force meetings, the mayor's administration planned to expand and refit 125 White Street, the current detention complex in our community, to rebuild it into the Manhattan Borough-based detention center. Based on the 125 White Street site, um, we had a lot of different meetings with stakeholders, elected officials, and community boards, but that site was then changed and then changed again, um, and many community members fought against the different site changes and stated that this location, um, the, the former location that they had, would not work as the site for the project. The mayor and the city then responded by beginning the EULA process and producing draft scope of work documents for 80 Center. The city then claimed that the 80 Center Street location could not be the site for the plan, citing unexpected costs and complications. Um, with the different changes, we believe that you know this is not standard protocol. Other applications would not have been permitted to proceed with significant changes, such as a site change, and that's why we believe that there should be different Euler processes. Um, there's no doubt that the New York uh, that New York needs real criminal justice reform. Recognizing that need, I worked with my colleagues in the state legislature to create comprehensive reforms to our criminal justice system. This year, our legislature eliminated cash bail for most misdemeanors, ensured the right to a speedy trial, and passed additional criminal justice reform legislation that is crucial to reducing our detainee population and creating a fair justice system for all. We believe that adding more beds in jails does not benefit our community. It only works to give privatized jails more money. Benefiting private jail owners should never be the priority over the needs and well-being of New Yorkers. We urge the council to vote in opposition to these plans. As we have already noted, this process was flawed from the start, and we must restart to work uh, on a holistic approach that places true community engagement as a priority and provides humane and effective reforms to our criminal justice. Thank you, Assembly Member. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you very much to this panel. Next panel in favor is Colvin Granham from Rikers Independent Commission, Dijon Tatro from Fortune Society, of course. Robert Fisk Jr. from the Lippmann Commission, and Vidal Guzman from Just Leadership Close Rikers. Oh, and uh, we've been joined also by Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Come on down. Thank you very much, Chair Levin, and all of the members of the committee. I want to say that as the Borough President of Manhattan, we had a year before even the discussion, a task force. We worked with the NAC, and now we're combining all of the stakeholders. And on July 10th, we had a fabulous, very robust, and extremely articulate group of people testify on this topic. So we're taking it very seriously. And I do support a borough-based jail system. It's an important step, although not the only step in moving toward a fair justice system. So I'm going to talk about two issues because I'm very conscious of time. One, of course, is that the city is asking for 30 percent more floor area ratio than what is allowed under current zoning. And they have provided, with all due respect, and I watched every minute of your earlier hearing on television, they have provided no justification or explanation for this FAR. And you look at other jails and other places like San Diego, the Manhattan facility is twice the size. So far today, right now, there's no proposed design, no rationale for why such a large building is needed, and I think that's unfair to the community. Number two, you heard very articulate uh, information from Councilmember Chin about Chung Pak Complex. It's adjacent to the proposed development. It has businesses, daycare, and of course, a lot of seniors. And what we want from the city in terms of this building, Chung Pak should be given the opportunity to purchase the land beneath the complex for well below market rate, with a deed restriction to guarantee permanent use of a nonprofit. Number two, we know about the businesses and the employees that will be displaced. We have to make sure that the businesses have a place to go and that they come back at a good rent. And third, um, it should be protected during demolition. That goes without saying all the ways in which you protect seniors right next door to the building. I want to just uh, mention in conclusion, because I am very conscious of time, contextual, humane, small businesses, chum pack, borough-based jails. Thank you very much. Thank you, Borough President. My, na my name is Robert Fisk. <clears throat> I'm a senior counsel at the law firm of Davis Polk and Wardwell and a former United States attorney for the Southern District of New York. I was a member of the, right, uh, the Lippman Commission. And I'm here to urge the City Council to support the City's plan to close the Rikers Jail complex, to reduce the number of people who are incarcerated in our city, and to hold those people who are incarcerated in a much smaller system of borough facilities. From the perspective of public safety, criminal justice, and morality, this plan is the right approach. We must take advantage of it and take advantage of it now. The eight active jails on Rikers Island are in bad physical condition, and these conditions and their isolation have produced what so many agree is a culture of violence. In many respects, Rikers Island leaves people much worse off than when they, when they enter. We can and must do better, starting with efforts to incarcerate many fewer people. There's much farther to go, but the progress that has been made over the past few years is encouraging as thousands fewer people are in jail on any given day. This progress should continue as bail and discovery reforms take place in January. There are two extremely important benefits that make approval of this plan so important. 
First, for the smaller number of people who are incarcerated, better designed jails with better visitation areas, improved sight lines, smaller units, and designated treatment and programming space provide an opportunity to break with a terrible legacy of Rikers. Second, the proposed facilities are closer to courthouses, eliminating terrible logistic difficulties involving transporting people to and from court and facilitating visits from family members, lawyers, and other service providers. I urge you to act on this plan. The city has thought it out well, and I second Judge Lippman in saying we must do it now. Thank you. Good afternoon, and first and foremost, I'd just like to thank the council for having us all today. Um, I'd like to also um, thank all the members who support this plan, and particularly thank Diana Ayala for her courage and foresight in this plan moving forward. My name is Daiwan Tetro, I'm the Government Affairs Officer at the Barred Prison Initiative, and I'm speaking today in my capacity as a board member at the Fortune Society. At the Fortune Society, we work with formerly incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people both on and off Rikers Island. And I can say that all of the people that we work with who have spent any time on Rikers Island has described that as the worst experience they have ever had. There's a lot of talk here today about buildings. This is not about buildings, this is about people. And we need to move these jails back into the communities to change people's relationships to these jails. It is convenient. It is convenient for these cities and those communities who do not want these facilities moved into their communities to have people in a penal colony on Rikers Island where they don't have to think about what is happening there, where they do not have to see what is happening there. People need to wake up and see jails every day. And not only them jails, but they need to experience the family members that go in and out of them every day. They need to recognize the humanity that is enclosed in them spaces. And while I agree that jails are not the best place to address the social inequities and social injustices in this society, I do disagree that a jail is a jail. Just like Attica is the worst prison in this state, Rikers Island is the worst jail in this state, state and probably the country. It is a bad place. I've spent 12 years in prison, and I know from everyone I've ever come in contact with that Rikers Island has traumatized them for the rest of their life. We need to close Rikers and close it now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Colvin Granham. I am a member of the Lipman Commission. I also am uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation in Brooklyn, New York. I prepared written testimony, which I will leave for you to read. Uh, I will tell you that Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation is the nation's first community development corporation. Our strategic direction is to close the racial wealth gap. And we have been looking at this issue from that perspective. Locating uh, des detention centers or jails as close as possible to courts is a step toward a more just cr criminal justice system, a step toward reforming a system that contributes to the growing racial wealth gap, and a step to advance a more equitable local economy. The racial wealth gap, as you might know, has to do with the median income of whites compared to blacks and Latinos and other minorities. Um, the median income for whites is 13 times the median income for blacks, and it's about eight times the median income from, Lat from Lat uh, Latino families or Latinx. Locating the jails as close to the courts as possible will limit the economic havoc that jails have on the people who are confined, many of whom are innocent, and their families. Um, we serve people who have been in Rikers and other detention facilities and prisons. And what we know is that incarceration wreaks, as I said before, economic havoc. It harms economic stability. It crushes credit scores. It oftentimes pull, throws families into housing instability. It damages economic attainment and educational attainment. 
And what we need to do is look at all these, all these policies that we have, especially this particular one, from the impact it has on having minority families uh, join the economic mainstream and, uh, and generate some ep economic upward mobility for their families and themselves. Thank you. Thanks very much. My name is Vidal Guzman. I'm from Harlem. I'm the community organizer with Just Leadership USA, the Close Rikers Island campaign. I've been a part of this campaign for the past three and a half years. The Close Rikers campaign plan forced the city to respond. Today, you have the honor of listening to fellow campaign leaders who've been directly impacted and harmed by Rikers. One thing I'm going to say right now, everyone put your fist up if you've been incarcerated on Rikers Island right now. You see the difference between people who actually been on Rikers and the difference between people talking about what we need? You cannot say anything without us. There is no plan without us. Today, you have the honor of listening to us. We are now taking action to ensure our needs and demand are met. I am so proud of this movement we have built. No other effort has come this close to closing Rikers. We now urge the city council to support and improve the land use proposal so the city can move forward with the construction of four borough-based facilities in order, in order to close Rikers. Twelve to four jails directly impact and prove that. We now we have an important win in Albany this year that will help decarcerate and we will keep pushing the city and the state further. But we did the math and the jail population would not get low enough in the next few years for the city to close Rikers without building anything. And we're not leaving no one behind. I was incarcerated at a different time for a total of seven years between the age of 16 and 24. The most human, the most important thing about being incarcerated is improved condition. I survived two years of solitary confinement and I was in the tombs right next to Chinatown. I had once had to climb the wall to try to look out the window. What is humanizing about that? Let's get the glimpse of people saying that, they, that we should just put them in a borough-based facility without improving conditions. That's never going to run through us. This campaign has changed the hearts of the cities to make sure that the criminal justice system, that we are now at the table. And we will not leave the table until we close down Rikers and build community. And there is no plan without us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, panel. Next panel is Paul Yan, Joseph Mirabella, or Misabella, Somali King, and MJ Williams. Panel, I need you to step up very quickly. Nearly 200 folks are waiting. Is there just one person that I call for this panel? If so, if this is the only per what's your name? Oh, they couldn't. Okay, I'm going to call then Maureen Silverman, Caitlin Moss, Patricia Sai, Calamity Alexis. You may begin. Please state your name for the record. Good afternoon. My name is MJ Williams. I'm an attorney and a member of No New Jails NYC. I'm also disgusted, and I'm done being respectful. 
I'm disgusted that City Council has the gall to have a land use subcommittee hold the only public hearing about refortifying, reinvesting, and caging New Yorkers in death and torture chambers. I'm disgusted to hear you say the mayor's plan has anything to do with closing Rikers when you know it kicks the can down to 2026 or 2027 when none of you will be in office, and it does so without a single mechanism or binding guarantee that the Rikers jails will actually close. I'm disgusted that we're here, that we here receive just 120 seconds when you, MOCJ, DOC, Lippman Commission took years to come up with the dystopian notion that you'd solve the horror of New York City jails on Rikers with more New York City jails. And when council members hear the sensible ways to shut down the Rikers jails without building more jails, they say that isn't realistic or practical, and their fellow travelers say, we just aren't there yet. I only have a few seconds left, so let me just say that that is coded language for your laziness, your complacency, your weakness. And please, if you would take a look at me while I'm speaking, I'd appreciate that. For your lack of courage to risk change, to risk crossing the NYPD, police, and jail guard unions. For choosing comfort and safety in your job over the life of people like Laylene Polanco and Khalif Browder. You know, I'd like to use profanity here to ex express my disgust, but I don't want you to clutch your pearls and miss what I'm saying. You have shoved this decision about jailing New Yorkers into a sanitized land use decision about building height, shadows, and traffic. But if this subcommittee votes yes, and your fellow council members then pass this plan, you'll have blood on your hands. And Chair Adams, it would be great if you could listen to me. That decision will haunt you the rest of your tidy, meaningless careers. Vote no. Do your job. Risk your job. If No, do your job, risk your job if that's what it takes to close Rikers without building more jails. Thank you. Hi. Um, I feel like a lot of people are saying that Could the plan state your is. Name? State my name is Calamity Alexis. Thank you. People are saying that the plan is either keep Rikers open and we don't build these jails or build these jails and close Rikers, and I think that's false. We have the ability to close Rikers without building new fucking jails. We don't need to spend $11 billion on incarcerating people when we should be spending money on actual communities, preventing people from going to jail in the first place. If we have too many people in jail, people for committing petty crimes should not be in jail. So if we, don't have, if we don't have enough space in fucking jails, then we need to change the laws so that people aren't in jail for things that they should not be in jail for. It's not about, I don't want people incarcerated near me. It's about, I don't want people incarcerated, period. And this plan, this plan is not about making a more humane jail. I'm not sure how you can have a humane jail because you're still putting people in a cage. But this plan is not about the families of incarcerated people. This plan is not about communities. It's just about, making sure that we can continue to incarcerate people in this city. And I am not fooled, and No New Jails is not fooled by this plan. And there are lots of people in this room and in this city that are not fooled by this plan. And this is not real community involvement. If you really want community involvement, you would have more public hearings and you would have borough-based public hearings. This is not about communities, and it's not about incarcerated people. It's just about putting people in jail. And if you really cared about incarcerated people, we would, we would close Rikers immediately and not build new jails. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Patricia Tsai, and I'm here to represent the Ling Sing Association. F founded in 1900, the Ling Sing Association is one of the oldest traditional associations in Chinatown. The association has thousands of members and is comprised of 18 separate organizations, each of which has at least 80 years of history. Our spendthrift mayor is in a great hurry to commit $10 billion of public funds to build four skyscraper jails in the city. He says this is a moral imperative because the inhumane conditions on Rikers must end immediately. The conditions on Rikers do need to end immediately, but are new jails really the moral imperative here? 
At every hearing, city officials regurgitate that being on Rikers makes family visits difficult. But the NYC ferry route to Soundview opened on August 15, 2018, which bypasses Rikers Island, is less than a 10-minute ferry ride from 90th Street and the East River, and less than a five-minute ferry ride from Soundview in the Bronx. Extending the NYC ferry Soundview route to Rikers Island would transform transportation access there. Ferry boats could make direct connections from existing docks in the Bronx and Manhattan, and transfers could be made from Queens and Brooklyn. Clearly, change of location is not necessary. Rather than spending billions of dollars on construction projects that will only replicate the same broken system in four new sites across the city, why has the city never considered a complete demolition of every structure on Rikers Island and their replacement with a complex of brand new human center facilities that are designed to address the current prison crisis from the ground up? To begin with, being on Rikers will allow the new structures to be low and arranged horizontally. This would offer a far safer environment to all in case of fire, natural disaster, and other emergencies. Contrast that to the mayor's proposed vertical jail towers. Can anyone imagine having to evacuate 1,500 detainees with non-functioning elevators when a fire or other catastrophic event strikes in densely populated Chinatown or downtown Brooklyn? Who will be responsible for the lives of those trapped in the building? How does exposing detainees to this clear and present danger restore their humanity. Moreover, okay. I go next? Okay. My name is Maureen Silverman. I'm here today to testify as a resident of over 25 years in Tribeca. I live in the district of the Manhattan Detention Center that is proposed to be expanded. I am, a, I am a constituent of Margaret Chin. I'm also testifying today on behalf of the deadly exchange campaign of Jewish Voice for Peace. Margaret Chin, I would like to, I'd like first to let you know that mitigation measures are not enough. You need to call for no new jails. You need to oppose the plan just like every other council member needs to because jails are inherently toxic and violent. They always have been and they always will be. In your very own district, Margaret Chin, the tombs were, 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 were renovated over and over again and they're violent and corrupt to this day just like the federal MCC has been in the paper for their continuous violence and the Brooklyn detention centers all jails are violent, and we don't want to reproduce more Rikers, more Rikers in the boroughs. We, we need to, if anything, dismantle the jails that exist. So Margaret Chin and all council members, vote no. No new, no new jails, no expanded jails in Manhattan, the Bronx, the Brooklyn, and Kew Gardens. It's not about not in my backyard. No new and expanded jails anywhere. And the deadly exchange campaign of Jewish Voice for Peace adamantly opposes the borough-based jails plan. And we say, from New York City to Palestine, no more jails, no more cages. And people should know, people should know that Jewish Voice for Peace is the fastest growing Jewish organization in the country. And our deadly exchange campaign says no more, no to the borough-based jails plan. Thank you very much, The deadly panel. The campaign thank you, thank is part of Thank you very much, panel. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. We're going to call the next panel. Rabbi Rachel. Peter Samuels, Kendra Clark, and Dr. Daniel Selling. Rabbi Rachel, Peter Samuels, Kendra Clark, Dr. Daniel Selling. Hi, my name is Rabbi Rachel Timoner. I'm the senior rabbi of Congregation Beth Elohim in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Our congregation has been working for several years on criminal, ju criminal justice reform with a special concern in, on dismantling racism. And in that work, we've we worked on Raise the Age, we worked on bail reform, we work with 
um, District Attorney Eric Gonzalez on trying to dismantle racism in the, in the criminal justice system. Again and again and again and again, stories come back about Rikers Island and the dehumanizing and brutalizing effect it has on the people who are sent there. And I'm here to say that we need to close Rikers, and this is a once in a generation opportunity for us, and it's essential that we do this. Um, we know in the book of Genesis that all human beings are created in the image of God, everyone, regardless of whatever zip code they were born in, regardless of how much money they have, regardless of what color their skin is, there's no exceptions. Every human being is created in the image of God. And so we must not collectively create systems that dehumanize people, that brutalize people, that make people forgotten or feel forgotten. This is the period for the Jewish people. This, this month is called Elul, and it's the period right before Rosh Hashanah when we focus on repentance, when we think about the ways we've sinned. And we don't just think about our own individual sins, we think about our collective sins because we're all held accountable for the sins of our community. Rikers Island is a sin. It is a sin. It is, it is destroying lives. It is throwing away hu human lives. And that is a sin. And so I'm here to say, as a rabbi, we need to repent for this. And we need to end this sin. Thank you. Um. My name is Peter Samuels, and I'm here today to speak in support of the plan to close Rikers Island. I'm on the boards of FedCap Group and Argus Community, organizations that provide social services to underserved communities in New York City. I'm also a member of the Rikers Commission. Um, it did not take our commission long to conclude that Rikers jails are irredeemable and that Rikers is emblematic of much deeper issues in our city and its criminal justice system. Far too many people are incarcerated almost 90% of whom are people of color, and most people who are incarcerated have a mental health diagnosis or a substance use problem. New York City can and must hold far fewer people in jail. The push to close Rikers from the administration and the city council have already accelerated a process of decarceration that has re resulted in 2,500 fewer people in jail over the past two and a half years while crime continues to drop to historic lows. The four borough facilities under consideration now are a necessary path to put an end to Rikers. Safer facilities, closer to courthouses and family members, equipped with proper space for medical care and reentry programs will facilitate more opportunities for success. That is the right and humane thing to do and will ultimately improve public safety. Our commission projected that a drastically smaller system of detention would save our city over $1 billion and a half dollars a year. Far exceeding the cost of bu building borough facilities, enabling long-term investments in other areas. Every day Rikers Island is still open as a day New Yorkers are being harmed. If we New Yorkers fail to act now, fail to seize this moment, the very real risk is that we will lose the chance to close Riker Island, Rikers Island for many years, maybe forever. Please vote to, in support of this plan to close these jails as fast as possible. Thank you. My name is Kendra Clark. I'm the Associate Vice President with Exodus Transitional Community, a preventative reentry and advocacy organization located in East Harlem. Our founder and 90% of our staff are directly impacted, and like almost all of our participants, we have been detained or incarcerated on Rikers in the past. In addition, I'm a leader on both the Close Rikers and Beyond Rosie's campaigns. Most importantly, I'm a directly impacted woman who experienced firsthand the horrors of the Rose M. Singer Center for a period of four months. You have all heard me testify throughout the ULIT process around the abuse, harassment, and inhumane conditions on Rikers, including the deteriorating buildings that lack adequate space for programming and are isolated from family, council, and community. Today, I want to discuss the reasons why you should vote yes with conditions to the mayor's plan, with the conditions being repeatedly outlined by directly impacted advocates. Most importantly, the Close Rikers plan, our plan, calls for 3,000 people or less in the new facilities with realistic strategies to continue to decarcerate while we create transformative healing and justice practices that will allow us to reach our goal of abolition while keeping our communities and families safe at the same time. 
Our Build Communities platform outlines the community and preventive investments needed to end mass incarceration in New York State and beyond. Funding for cure violence interrupters, credible messengers, medical mobile units in lieu of NYPD command centers, diversion centers where people retain all of their civil rights, youth centers, employment training and education programs, etc., will ensure our communities have access to the resources they need to be successful. The money saved through the closure of Rikers can be used to invest in these resources and much more. In addition, the island can be used as a renewable energy source for the entire city, creating better health comes, outcomes for all New Yorkers through the Renewables Rikers Act, which we strongly support and hope you do as well. Furthermore, with respect to the design and culture of the new facilities, we must not sacrifice space for programming and humane conditions for people by reducing the height of buildings to accommodate nimbyism. Reducing the height of buildings should come from continued decarceration efforts and investments for alternatives. And the rest, uh, thank you, you can read. Thank you very much. Thank you, panel. The next panel is Brandon Holmes, Sharon Wig Hargo, Harrigal, Harrigan, sorry. I need to put my glasses back on. Darren Mack, Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips, and Reverend David F. Tillards. This panel is Brandon Holmes, Sharon Whit Harrigan White, Sharon White Harrigan, Darren Mack, Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips, and Reverend David F. Telford. Please remember to state your name before you speak. You may begin when you're ready. Brandon Holmes, the Close Rikers campaign calls on City Council to amend the current ULERP application to reflect our plan, providing a clear path for the city to reduce capacity to incarcerate people by over 75 percent. The Close Rikers campaign advocates for City Council to center three priorities in this upcoming vote. One, reducing our capacity to incarcerate New Yorkers from 15,000 beds to 3,000 or below, from our current 12 facilities down to four. Two, improving conditions for New Yorkers who are currently incarcerated, including folks who have been remanded and do not have the option of bail. Three, reducing our over-reliance on the punitive legal system, making it possible to divest from law enforcement agencies and invest in the communities most harmed by mass incarceration. We will be submitting our Build Communities platform, which contains over 100 concrete policy and budget demands that would support community-based solutions, which can lead New York City to achieving a zero average daily population. We know that a combined ULERP and design build are the right choice to be able to close Rikers on the fastest timeline possible and ensure that not one person is left behind on tour your island. This joint ULERP reinforces that we have a major commitment across this city to closing Rikers, improving conditions, and increasing access to family, courts, and legal supports, which would improve case outcomes and reduce lengths of stay in New York City jails. The community has been engaged since the beginning of this plan because this plan came from the community, specifically from survivors of Rikers Island. As early as 2016, our campaign was mobilizing directly impacted and formerly incarcerated residents of every single borough during the original Commission hearings to share their experiences of how Rikers Island had impacted their lives and communities. Our members met with city officials in each borough to identify areas for improvement and outline our specific priorities in improving this plan to implement the full closure of Rikers Island. While elements of exactly which programs, what design, and even what management structure are still being debated and negotiated, we know without a doubt that if this plan is defeated or delayed, it will mean people will spend more time on Rikers Island with no plan or commitment to closure. We need to do these two streams of planning concurrently, just as we divest from incarceration by shrinking jails and improving conditions. We can improve access to programs and supports for people in our communities. Thank you. Thank you.
Next speaker. My name is Darren Mack. At the age of 17, I was arrested for being an accomplice to a robbery, charged as an adult, and incarcerated on Rikers Island for 19 months. At that time, there were over 20,000 people detained on Rikers. After serving 20 years from a 20 to 40 year sentence in prison, I returned home to the city that I love and found that the culture of violence and human rights violations on Rikers still remain. That is why I got involved with the Close Rikers campaign. While New York City has the capacity to incarcerate 15,000 people thanks to years of activism, advocacy, and organizing, those beds are not filled. We must keep going. This is challenging and complex. This is not about one community or over another or four communities. This is about our entire city. In June of 2017, I approached New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio in his gym to hand him a copy of the Limit Commission report with highlights of the commission's recommendations that were either totally absent or barely mentioned in his plan. The mayor proposed a system that is fairer. 89% of the people in Rikers are black and Latino, and they come from neighborhoods like Bronzeville, East Harlem, and the South Bronx, which have been historically under-resourced. That's not fair. 300,000 to incarcerated personal Rikers for a year, while community centers and communities of color and public libraries have, been, have closed due to lack of funding from the city. That's not fair. Crime in our city is at, is at historic lows, but the NYPD budget is at historic highs. Over, a billion, over $5 billion a year, and our schools have more cops than counselors. That's not fair. Investments are choices, and those choices for too long have created a tale of two cities. The Close Rikers campaign plan is to shrink the system from 12 jails across the city to four borough-based facilities, decarcerate from 15,000 to capacity to 3,000, and put four historic justice reinvestments to build communities. Thank build you. communities in this Euler process. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Reverend Sharon White Harrigan. I am a member of the Beyond Rosie's 2020 campaign movement. And I'm also a woman with lived experience. And after spending over a decade in a maximum facility for women in Bedford Hills, I had the misfortune of going through Rose M. Singer Center. And upon my arrival, I was appalled at the lack of professionalism, decaying building, lack of programs, lack of resources, and lack of respect towards women with a lack of oversight and accountability. There's a culture that breeds violence, disdain, mistreatment, and misguidance within that island. My experience has not been healthy or rehabilitative. The trauma I experienced beforehand exacerbated. There weren't any therapeutic services available unless it entailed medication. I needed a venue to grieve, not be medicated. I needed to process what happened, not be propositioned by male COs, especially since I was there for an attempted rape. The idea of detaining women, then mistreat them, is far worse than the offense you claim they committed. How is the city any better when women are raped, mistreated, used, disrespected, exploited, and devalued? No longer be the problem, but be a part of the solution. And let's envision a world of justice and safety, of healing and restoration. Let's close Rikers now. Thank you, Reverend. Good afternoon, Chair and all others. My name is Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips. Everyone calls me Ms. V. Previously, I did CBT on Rikers and have sat on the DOC advisory board for the past five years. I joined the Jails Action Coalition in 2012 because often people in position to make change do not. 
Often, y'all don't believe the formerly incarcerated or the currently incarcerated individual's truth and trauma. Today, you will hear countless testimonies on systematic torture, environmental hazards, and barbaric violations of human rights. Today, you will hear, invest in NYCHA. Will I sit before you after having brain surgery because of NYCHA? And I'm letting you know, this is not a NYCHA conversation. This is a close Rikers today with conditions that us directly impacted advocates and community leaders have put together. This is an include in your legacy, constructing and implementing mental health divergence centers to decrease the population anywhere from one-fourth to one-half type of conversation. Today you will hear the mayor will not be in office in 2026. True, but every one of us will be around. That means we can no longer sit around blaming, placing blame on each other. We must all step up to do the work. I am realistic. Courts aren't closing tomorrow. And with thousands on community supervision who could be remanded on any given day, we must not leave them behind. Close Rikers and drown the foundation and culture of torture. Many of you have said Khalif Browder's name and lately even Laylene's. Well, today I hold you all accountable. I am here to say what you will hear from others is true. If you don't believe them, read the last federal monitor's report. It came out April this year. Do not fear this journey. Embrace your peace in history. Do what is right and save a life. Ask yourself, uh, Councilmember Chen, ask yourself, regardless of the noise or the traffic or the height of a building, is that equivalent to a human's life? Mm. And for the record, Dr. Homer, who was the former medical director for Rikers, emailed his statement and I submitted it in person today. Yes, Please sir. make sure you read it. I am the Reverend David of Telfort. I am the pastor of the Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church, part of a coalition of churches that have been um, part of the work happening here today. My calling as a clergy person is to walk through life with people during their most trying and joyous times. And that means committing my time and energy to creating a world that allows for their flourishing. And that is what brings me here today. I believe that no one should be held in prisons and jails. Our over-incarceration in this country does not heal, it does not make us safer, but further breaks down our society. And so today I bear witness to the call to shut Rikers Island down. I come to bear witness to a transformative vision to create smaller, restorative, community-based spaces where true healing can take place, spaces where returning citizens can be reunited with their loved ones and communities. As a pastor, I have been witness to the ways in which the violence of Rikers traumatizes black and brown women, children, and men in particular. Rikers is a sin that we must repent from because people in cages cannot be brought to restoration. As important is asking ourselves the question, how did we get here? As a council, your conversation should consider interrogating white supremacist policing practices and holistic support to communities so that education, health care, food insecurity, and mental health needs are met. Vote yes with decarceration as your goal. Thank you very much. Very passionate panel. Thank you so much. The next panel is uh, Renee Levine, Philip DePaolo, Nusrat Zeba, Zeba, Kay Williams, Sandy Balboza. I'll call the names again. Renee Levine, Philip DePaolo, Nusrat Zeba, Kay Williams, and Sandy Balboza.
Remember to state your name for the record and do remember to turn the microphone on before you begin. You may begin. My name is Renee Levine and I'm from Kew Gardens. I want to thank you for the time that I can tell you about, I summarize, a year of frustration and lies and to inform everyone how this project, plan, or at the moment concept, whatever you want to call it, has evolved. This concept is basically about politics and developers. It's more about that than judicial reform. The mayor, wherever he may be at this particular moment in time, and his commissioners, their minions, and public relation, uh, relations people have already had already spent $8 million on a public relations firm before we ever heard of what was happening. Their plan, concept, to build a 30-story jail in our small residential historic community, and I mentioned the word community, which has been bandied about by the Department of Corrections in, con in contrast to, little, to the Lipman Report. There was no effort, as has been mentioned before, to talk to any of us who were the civic leaders of our area. Of our area. Thirdly, the DEIS report was either sloppy or intentionally misleading. Not, not having the financial, financial ability that the mayor has, we had to rely on our neighbors and friends to respond to the flaws and outright ridiculous suggestions, such as putting a crossing guard on our most congested thoroughfare. That would solve the traffic problem. We are a small, middle-class, residential, multi-ethnic, multi-racial community, long-time residents. This plan or concept will have a totally negative effect on our community and our lives. And no, Mr. Mayor, we will not get used to, us at, to, to this as you have asked us to do. We will not. Thank we you. remember and we vote. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Nisrat Ziba. I am a member of DRUM, Daisy's Rising Up and Moving. <laughs> we, we are a membership-led organization of 4,500 South Asian and Indo-Caribbean immigrants, workers, youth, and adults in New York City. I live in the Bronx, which is a majority low-income immigrants, people of color borough, so it is disturbing to me that our city is planning to build four new jails in our communities with $11 billion. My neighborhood, just like other places throughout the city, needs better schools, public transportation, affordable housing, hospitals, mental health services, and jobs. Those are the things the $11 billion should go towards. There is already enough money being spent on jails, but these jails do not provide the real transformative changes we need to succeed. Contrary to authority figures' beliefs, jails do not decrease crimes, but rather increase them because they bring in more policing and criminalize innocent community members to fill the jails they, the jails they build. The $11 billion needs to go to actually preventing people from landing in prison in the first place. Building a whole jail in the Bronx and in other boroughs would mean that innocent lives, especially young people of color, would be criminalized, sent to jail, and lose the opportunity to make positive changes in the community. People in my community want to succeed. We want to see our young people go to school, become leaders, and make change in the community. Many of the city council members who are thinking of voting yes to this terrible plan are in their last term in city council. But your decision to bail these four new jails will have consequences past your term ending. This decision can't be undone. Each of you need to ask yourselves, is criminalizing people of color, young people, immigrants in our neighborhoods what you want to be remembered for? Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Sandy Balboza, representing the Atlantic Avenue Betterment Association and advocacy group for Atlantic Avenue. I have lived half a block from the Brooklyn Detention Complex for 50 years. 
The plan to close Rikers and build borough jails was conceived behind closed doors. Today, there are more questions than answers. Uh, there are still no details about how this experiment will work. Uh, Mayor de Blasio has manipulated the public process to bypass any real community input by lumping the four boroughs together into this unprecedented one-size-fits-all jail, uh, uh, sorry, one-size-fits-all land use application. The mayor and the speaker have evaded the ability of each neighborhood to voice serious concerns. Each community has a very different built environment and different land use expectations and needs, and in many cases are in conflict with the selected site. Furthermore, the Mach J controlled the NACs and did not provide a platform for our communities. In response to the Floyd process and citywide outrage, the four CBs voted against the city plan, the city's plan to build enormous out-of-scale jails in their districts. Borough President uh, Adams has recommended a significantly smaller facility with many fewer beds for the Brooklyn site. Councilman Levin has recently said of the proposed Brooklyn jail, the scale doesn't make sense, the facility that has been proposed is too big, and he also said we should not build excessive capacity. If this proposal is implemented, the Brooklyn and Manhattan facilities will be the tallest jails in the world. Instead, the city should build smaller jails that reflect the criminal justice reforms passed in Albany and plan for 3,000 beds citywide. These new reforms and other city policies will make a large scale jail, uh, the large scale jails unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip DiPaolo. I'm a longtime activist in New York, and um, I'm campaign manager for Victoria Cabranes, who is running for city council in the 33rd district, which covers the Brooklyn prison. Um, she will be speaking shortly. I really wasn't going to testify today, but um, after the four hour of this panel that sat here, I felt I had to say something because um, I'm even more confused about how the hell city planning even let this proposal come to you with such incomplete information. <laughs> For four hours, they, they talked a lot and said nothing. I mean, the council member from the Bronx, he was asking about a barge that's been there for years in his district. And what was the timeline to remove the barge? And they, they didn't even have an answer. They had answers for nothing. It was just like, well, that's under consideration. Oh, we're not quite sure yet. I mean, how are you as a council supposed to vote on a plan when there is no plan? No, no. Yeah. And I, I'm just really confused Again, I, I, I see the lady that was here from the panel is still sitting here, and I'm glad you're still here. And I, and I really wish, there's something that always pisses me off about these hearings is that you make the people sit for four hours while these people talk. It should be the other way around. The people should talk first, and then you get to listen to them, and then let them answer. Once you've heard these people, you've heard people that have been in the prison system and the abuse that they have went through. That's the proper way, in my opinion, to hold a hearing. And I really thank you for your time, and I'm really happy that some of you are still actually here. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Hi, I'm Kay Agdebiyi, and I'm speaking on behalf of Survived and Punished New York Chapter. Um, first, I'd like to start with this quote. We submit that the basic evils of imprisonment are that it denies autonomy, degrades dignity, impairs or destroys self-reliance, um, minimizes the likelihood of beneficial interaction with one's peers, fractures family ties, destroys the family's economic stability, and prejudices the prisoner's future prospects for any improvement in their economic and social status. 
It does all these things whether or not the buildings are antiseptic or dirty, the aroma of fresh bread or stale urine, the sleeping accommodations a plank or an inner spring mattress, or the interaction of inmates takes place in cells or corridors, or in the structural setting of a particular time and place. This was written in a report authored in 1971. We are still dealing with ineffective reliance on lip service reforms in 2019. This is why Survive and Punish New York rises up alongside our comrades in no new jails and their demands to stop Mayor Bill de Blasio's jail, read, death and sexual violence expansion into our communities. We also want to emphasize our support for the coalition's express demand of allocating the proposed $10 billion that would see jails built to instead be put into black and brown communities. Our comradeship with the No New Jails Coalition is grounded in our mutual belief in and practice of restorative and transformative justice models of addressing harm. Many of the women we visit at Bedford and other prisons were also previously incarcerated at Rikers. They know, and we know, new and expanded borough jails would precipitate more survivors to be criminalized and incarcerated. As an abolitionist organization that focuses on survivors, we advocate to free everyone from cages and to do away with every aspect of the prison industrial complex. We see this work as intrinsically linked with the principles that No New Jails has outlined today. The proposed building of new and expanded borough jails empowers the carceral state under the pretext of decarceration, which directly contradicts our mutual goals of prison abolition and is destructive to our city since all jails are inherently inhumane. Thank you. Thank you, panel. You're excused. Thank you so much. Thank you. Calling up the next panel. Oh. You may begin. Um, my name is Key Francis Williams. I am a co-founding member of the Black Lives Matter Global Movement. I am also the national organizer for the Marsha P. Johnson Institute. I'm a proud No New Jails member. Um, this hearing today being the one and only scheduled public hearing for our city council members, I feel is completely disappointing. And it is a total uh, misuse of your power, your time, and your role. I think you're here to represent the people, and represent your constituents. And I think that you have only listened to certain constituents, most of them who are tied to the city under grant city funding and or promise, and I know Corey Johnson's not here, or promised, grants are being threatened to take away money if they don't go along with this plan. See, when we first started this fight, we were told, don't even fight. From someone from the mayor's office that I know as an organizer, this plan is bought and paid for, he told me. It's signed, sealed, it's delivered, it's done. But we as the people gathered together in September and said, nah, we're not having that. We've been fighting this fight since shutdown records. We've been fighting this fight for years, for decades. My comrade here is to survive and punish, which means that there aren't just one story, one experience of incarcerated people. There's not just one uniform voice that speaks for everybody as incarcerated people. We have incarcerated members in no new jails right now that have submitted letters, testimonies, et cetera, et cetera, to share their insight. So when I have people coming to me and saying, oh, I'm the only person that can speak on behalf of all incarcerated people, it's untrue. It's false. Also, let's talk about the fact that this plan is going to impact people citywide. Citywide. And so when I hear Diana Ayala saying, oh, you can get a grocery store if it's in a jail, or when I hear people saying you can get social services, it's got to be in a jail, that's not the risk that my community needs, and we're no longer gonna stand for you guys to come out with these plans, backroom deal, Steve Levin, member deference. Yeah, we talked about that, buddy. We talked about that, buddy. And so, I know that my time, I know that my time is about to be over, but I want y'all to know that even if y'all approve this plan, the people are not gonna stop fighting. Even if you approve this plan, we are gonna be on y'all asses every single day. Because if you approve this plan, if you approve this plan, I'm telling you right now, we will make sure that Corey Johnson does not become mayor. We will make sure that all progressive deals are done. We will make sure that Democrats, Democrats show up. Thank you. That you show up and you do your job and you Thank listen you. to the community boards and you listen to the borough presidents and you listen to community members Thanks who are not bought and paid for by the city. Thank you.
We're going to call the next panel, Reverend Wendy Cal Calderon, Barat Elman, Rachel Carrion, Okay, Rachel's not here. Who are you? Uh, Wendy Calderon. Okay, thank you. Emma Jordan Simpson and Elizabeth Gaines. Uh, Okay, we should have four. I see three. Reverend Wendy Calderon, you're here. Barat Elman. Emma Jordan Simpson, you're here. Elizabeth Gaines. So we're missing. Barat Elman, not here. Okay. Okay, remember to state your name for the record. Is it on? It is on. Good afternoon, I'm Elizabeth Gaines, president of the Osborne Association. A core part of our mission for the last 85 years is to transform jails for the people that live in them, visit them, and work in them. And my predecessor, Austin McCormick, was actually the commissioner of correction under Mayor LaGuardia and was at Rikers Island pretty much when it opened. Um, my first visit to Rikers was uh, in 1978, and over the last 40 years, I've visited as a lawyer, a service provider, and a family member. Over the last 25 years, Osborne has provided discharge planning and vocational programs at Rikers, probably serving more than 75,000 incarcerated people at all jails during that time. We've seen the population go up and down. The words change, the music stays the same. And it will continue to play the same sad tune until the council votes to close Rikers Island. Over the last year, I've had the, it was really a privilege to be involved in the team of uh, architects and planners that produced this master plan. Um, we ensured that people who have visited and lived there and our staff who work there um, were considered in how it would be designed. It's unfortunate that the largest municipal jail union in the country decided to sit this one out when current jails are inherently unsafe for the people who live and work them, work in there. And better design would allow for better jail management at every level. We don't need to spend millions of dollars for people at McKinsey with no experience in corrections writing algorithms about jail management. We need a better environment. It's probably true that the jails are too tall, and this is largely because Staten Island has somehow been allowed to not participate in what every county in the entire United States has, which is a county jail. It's what we do. We don't like big jails, we don't like police stations, we don't like those things, but everybody calls 911, so we're gonna have to have precincts and you're gonna have to have jails. Yeah, I know, it's ridiculous what you guys are putting us through here. This is gonna happen. Thank you. Quiet, Thank you. Please. Quiet, please. Thank you. Your, ti your time's expired. Thank you. Next speaker. I just wanna say, Nelson Mandela said it, he knew a thing or two about jails. It always seems impossible you. until it's done. Thank you very much. Honey, your time is way up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I am Reverend, I'm Reverend Emma Jordan Simpson, and I'm the executive pastor of the Concord Baptist Church of Christ located in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. Our church was founded 16 years before the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, and we have been fighting for freedom ever since 1847. The question is not do we have the political will to nicely shrink a system. The question is a moral question. It's how long will we continue to fund failure? How long will we continue to fund death? I believe prisons should be abolished. 
period. And I lift up Mariam Kaba's definition of what it means to be an abolitionist. It's not some liberal fantasy. It means to work to create the necessary conditions to ensure a future without cages for anybody. When children are born in this city, we will not guarantee them a decent public education, a safe community, access to health care, and a safe place to live, but we will absolutely guarantee them a jail cell. And it doesn't matter how much it costs, we will find the money. My fear is that we have become so tolerant of racism and inequity that we're capable of imagining a future that does not include, uh, that, that we're not capable of imagining a future that doesn't include jails. I'm not forgetting what this city did to the community of Bedford-Stuyvesant when this city installed a, a jail-themed playground at Tompkins Houses for our children to play on. Every time we invest in the fantasy that there will always be people who need to be jailed, we are sinning. And I'm here today to say we need to stop it. Close Rikers and no more new jails. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you so much, council members, and I do appreciate you staying this long to hear everyone's voices. Um, I'm going to ask that we all respect each other, but if you don't, that's okay, because I'm going to still keep on talking. My name is Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne. I'm the executive director of Bronx Connect. I'm asking you today to vote yes to close Rikers with conditions. You have to hold the city as far as you can hold them, but we got to close the hell hole now. Bronx Connect is an alternative justice program that for 20 years has offered community alternatives in the Bronx before there was money to do it. Do you understand? It was the South Bronx churches that were challenged to create a system to take young people so they didn't go to Horizon, so they didn't go to Rikers. So please don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I have seen kids demoralized, raped, traumatized at Rikers for too long. There is no option to keep Rikers closed without some sort of community alternative. And this plan is not the mayor's plan. This plan began formally through Glenn Martin, the founder of Just Leadership, a formerly incarcerated man. And he called all of us together to, to be one voice to close Rikers. And he himself said four years ago, the plan will have to include local community facilities. This was Glenn's own words. Google it if you don't believe me. Okay? So what I'm saying to you is the reason, and I ask you to understand this, council members, if you don't understand the square footage, we're trying to create a more humane system. A system when people can go to bed in their own room and not have the risk of being raped by their roommate. It's as simple as that. We need a humane system. I am begging you, close Rikers now, cross into the promised land, demand a better system, but don't take us back out into the desert. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, as the chair of this subcommittee, I am going to respectfully request that you hold all applause henceforth, now and forevermore in these chambers. Thank you very much for your time. What happens, what happens when the applause takes place is that you are taking time away from the people that we want to hear from, that you want to hear from. So we want to make sure that everyone is heard, and we can't do that when we take time out for applause. So we just really need for you to be respectful to everyone that comes in and is, is courteous to be a part of the panel of these panels. We take them seriously, and we really do need to hear them. We know that you're excited. We get it. We're all excited. We're passionate. We get that. But I really am asking you respectfully to please refrain from applause. We do this in the chambers. We, we do this. And, and believe me, it makes, it's very symbolic, if you will. It's very, very symbolic. You know, in churches, I come from the black church, we talk about make a joyful noise and we do this. But, but for the people who are hearing impaired, they cannot hear this. So we do this 
because it is symbolic and universal and global. Respectfully do this. Thank you very much. Thank We're going to call the next panel. Arlene Parks, Justin Pollock, Ben Yi, Lara Burnback, and Barry Wallner, is it? We'll recall again Barry Wallner. La uh, Lara Burnback, Ben Yi, and Arlene Parks. Okay. The name has been called. Please step up. Okay. Seeing two, I call up Constance Lesold. Or Lesold. Okay, we're still trying to fill the panel. Marianne Casa or Caba. Marianne Caba from Project Nia. That's full. Great. Good afternoon, panel. Please remember to state your name. And remember to turn the microphone on when you begin. You may begin when you're ready. Hello, everyone. My name is um, Arlene Parks, and I am a lifelong resident of the Monhaven community. And I'm also the vice chair and CEO of the Diego Beatman Mutual Housing Association that was established in 1974 under the Model Cities uh, program. Um, I'm here today to um, ask the uh, body to work with the uh, Bronx Borough President's Office and key stakeholders to get the jail in the Bronx cited correctly. We have significant challenges in Monhaven and in my neighborhood where that jail is being cited that does not exist in other communities where the boroughs, where the jails are, are, are at, where, where the jails are proposed to be cited. We've worked for 22 years, 22, that's a quarter of my life, with community residents um, working uh, to stabilize that community as we were inflicted with a drug cartel, crime, and violence. And even today, with all of the significant gains that we've made, all too frequently, we still have challenges with random shootings, drugs, opioid crisis that we are in the midst of. We are in the epicenter of a school that's failed and is not working. We are overburdened with facilities to house the homeless and Accepting uh, services in exchange for jail is outrageous. My councilwoman should not be compromised and not have to accept a jail in order to get the services that the city of New York has systematically deprived that community of for decades. It has to stop. We're tired of it. And so, the compromise for us is invest in schools, invest in housing, turn our children from selling drugs on the street and committing crime and violence, make them captains of industry. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Barry Walder. I'd like to. Uh, when the program was originally started under ULIP, the city decided to put four buildings in one project. That means from all regulations, federal on down, when you're voting on it, you're voting on, if one of those buildings is not acceptable, 
to the federal regulations that are rejecting the whole project. Now, Councilman Koskowitz this morning talked about traffic. She talked about the, at 4 o'clock the rush hour starts in Queens. In fact, it's now 3 o'clock. I live across the street. That's because of the bike lanes. The city has not yet installed bike lanes from Yellowstone Boulevard up to Union Turnpike, which leads right into the intersection of the four major highways. There's also construction going on on Union Turnpike, which is slowing down traffic. They can't go down Union Turnpike for the next year. The city, when they submitted this application, had indicated to us at meetings that the environmental study was not yet complete. This morning, they specifically stated that, oh, they'll go back and do it in real time. What does real time mean? It means they didn't do it in real time before. They probably did it at 1 o'clock in the morning. So now you have an environmental study that we were told was only partially completed in which once those bike lanes are installed up to Union Turnpike, it's going to slow down traffic. Like I said, it had already slowed down traffic so that rush hour now starts at 3, not 4 o'clock. So my question is, if you're approving this project to go ahead, you have to go back and look at that environmental study to make sure that it's accurate. Because from my perspective, from what I understand, it was partially done. They say they're going to fix up the issues, but they'll have to wait a year or more in order to make sure that environmental study is an accurate study. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Constance Lessold, and um, I am the founder of a group called the Committee of 100 to make the Brooklyn Botanic Garden free again. I also work with MTOP over the issues of um, construction uh, planned in the area and uh, stopping the, um, the city's um, proposals uh, to build, allow the building of uh, huge towers that would block the Botanic Garden, um, would put shadows over the Botanic Garden. I had not planned to testify today. I had planned to be down in here, and obviously I am down here and was here for four hours standing outside because I am also a professional social worker having worked in psychiatric departments in a number of our city hospitals and others and I am very concerned about the welfare of people in our prisons and in our hospitals, our psychiatric hospitals. In neither place are they getting a fair shot at a decent life. Uh, they are getting a lot of shots in those hospitals and jails, but it's not the kind of shot we want to see. Um, I cannot stand by, I did not plan to testify, I am obviously not entirely prepared. I cannot stand by though and hear that you plan to spend $11 billion or more, when it all goes up, on prisons when we don't even have a botanic garden that the children can go to, the people coming out of prison or coming out of homeless shelters or coming out of what? Only a free Friday morning, $15 otherwise. Thank uh, you. We cannot have that. I, I must say that I am familiar with Rikers Island. I have been to Rikers Island to visit people. And I will continue to be interested in both the cultural thank you very life much. of the city you. Thank you. Next and speaker. Thank the you. prisons. Thank you. We and they're the next related. Thank you. We don't have any money thank you. in we Brooklyn. We hear you. Thank you very much for being here. Next speaker, please. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Miriam Kaba. Um, I'm here today to uplift the legacy of my teachers, Bo Brown and Eddie Ellis and Angela Davis and Kathy Minor and countless other incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people who really have taught me over the years how easily so-called reforms actually result in the expansion of the carceral state rather than its diminution. I'd like to use my two minutes to say a few words about being realistic. 
realistic and unrealistic are words that I've come to profoundly dislike, as they seem so often to be used in situations like this to discredit anyone holding open the possibility of making changes that would improve the lives of the poor, of women, of people of color, of queer people, of gender non-conforming people. And to be clear, building four new jails is not going to help anyone but the contractors who build them, the bankers who lend the city money for those new cages, and the politicians who continue to demagogue public safety. These days, there are a lot of people who say they're upset about mass incarceration and crowded jails and detention centers and police violence, and yet they constantly dismiss serious challenges to these institutions as unrealistic. So I know unrealistic has been floating around discussions of how to best close Rikers. Let me say that to accuse those of us opposing the construction of four new jails across the city as the only possible way to close Rikers or the best way to close Rikers, to call us unrealistic and delusional is to ignore over 200 years of U.S. history. The Walnut Street Jail opened in 1790 as a reform, and reformers have been supposedly reforming jails and prisons ever since. We will be back in this room, I promise you, in 10 years if these four new facilities are are built, calling these facilities inhumane. That's right. That is the that is the history of the criminal punishment system. So to me, you want to know what's unrealistic? What's unrealistic is the idea that building new jails will improve anyone's lives. Jails and prisons don't work. They significantly don't reduce any sort of violence, and they don't reduce harm. Jails are violence, inherently so. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate it. I didn't have all of it written down. Next panel, Honorable uh, Matthew Dimmick, Craig Lewis, Curtis Bell, Victor Herrera, and Jordan Rosenthal. Once again, Honorable Matthew Demick, Craig Lewis, Curtis Bell, Victor Herrera, and Jordan Rosenthal. I see two. Tamika Graham. <laughs> <clears throat> Y'all ready? Do we have Seymour James? He went together. He went together. Thank you. Seymour James, are you here? Thank you. Lucas Pershing, are you here? Okay, great. Uh, please remember to state your name for the record. You may begin when you're ready. Hello, um, my name is Craig Lewis. I'm from the Bronx. I represent Bronx Connect and the RTG program from Bronx Connect. I was a part of uh, um, Bronx 120. It was the biggest gang raid in New York City history. We went, to, we went federal. Um, I did two years. I copped out to something I didn't do. So I also went to college. I have major knowledge in both jail. I went to University of Bridgeport, <coughs> masters. Um, Rikers Island is a place dealing with organized chaos. And the headmaster of this organized chaos will be the COs. Um, a organized chaos is a complex situation or process that appears chaotic while having enough order to achieve progress or goals. Now, I'm not saying get rid of all COs. What I'm saying is we need to revolutionize the culture of these jails. And by doing so is a fresh start. So I'm foreclosing Rikers Island due to the fact that I know from experience that there's officers allowing gang wars, ill treatment, allowing contraband, you know, hurting inmates, making gangs handle their dirty work. Um, jails are supposed to rehabilitate us, restorate us, like cause us to learn from our mistakes, but that's not what's happening. 
uh, people in my culture, we going in there and we coming out warriors of, of, of Rikers. We coming in there and we fighting every day, each other, and it's a head person that can control that and can stop that and it's not happening. So if we close Rikers, and even if you open up new jails, which you most likely will anyway, if you try to stop the culture of this that's going on inside, for those who have been there, who know what I'm talking about, knows that I'm not lying, maybe we could make a change. Now, as far as Rikers Island's concerned, when I was, damn, I lost, I, okay, well, I'm for close Rikers, and you know, the authority reevaluated. Thank you. If we only had more time, thank you, brother. All right. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Demick, and I am the administrative judge for criminal matters, <coughs> excuse me, in Kings County Supreme Court. I'm also a member of uh, Judge Lippman's com commission. Now, when Judge Lippman asked me to join his commission, I was highly skeptical of the idea that Rikers Island could or should be closed. However, after a year of meetings and listening to the experiences of former Rikers detainees, their families, correctional mental health and other experts, and most importantly, visits to Rikers Island, I am now firmly convinced that as a community, we have no other choice. I'm also the presiding judge in the Brooklyn Mental Health Court, and in that capacity have experienced the decompensation of accused individuals on Rikers Island and its deeply dehumanizing effect on people living with serious mental illness. Smaller, local facilities will certainly be a better option for them. In fact, for all incarcerated defendants, jails that are close to the courts, their families and their attorneys, as opposed to the isolated outpost that is Rikers, serve justice and alleviate inequalities unworthy of our city. There are many practical reasons to close Rikers Island. Having witnessed the decrepit, dank conditions in which we house detainees, and the spirit-crushing travel to and from the island, both for them and their families, there is one overriding reason for closing it. It's a basement of human dignity. No person, no matter the accusation, should lose his or her personal dignity. Whatever insults human dignity dishonors us. Rikers Island dishonors us. Thank you for your courtesy. Good afternoon, hi, my name is Victor Herrera. I'm a member of Just Leadership and the Close Rikers Campaign. I'm also a lifelong member of New York City, a citizen. Rikers must close in the fastest possible timeline. Rikers must close because of the history of violence and brutality which I personally experienced on Rikers Island and the fear and the traumatic stress that resulted from it. Those, who have, those of us who have been there and are still affected by it, the brutal assaults I experienced and the conditions I was subjected to on Rikers have affected my health, both physically and mentally. Thankfully, the last time I was on Rikers was years ago, but within the last year, my brother was on Rikers Island and my nephew was on the floating extension of Rikers Island, the boat. Another facility unfit for humans. The only way to heal from all the trauma that many of us have experienced in these sites of torture is to begin the process of closure. I support the building of borough-based facilities as a first step toward reducing the jail population and taking a new approach. Because of the advocacy of the people who survived Rikers, we will soon see historic pretrial reforms implemented and the mayor's office has reduced the planned capacity of the borough-based facilities to 4,000. The City Council must also include investments in mental health resources and alternatives to incarceration in this plan so that New York City can plan for less than 3,000 people in detention. For anyone who is still detained, we need to make sure they are housed in much better conditions that support progressive rehabilitation rather than punishment and are located centrally where the community can be involved. We have no illusions that new facilities will, new facilities will solve all of, all of the problems. Changes are also needed in favor of something more like a case management, management type of approach, but nothing about the current jails encourages that or provides space for that. As a, as a lifelong advocate, I'll be there to fight for those changes. The time to close Rikers is now, we cannot delay. At this very moment, thousands of people are sitting there on a the penal colony suffering. We have to start somewhere, and we have to move now. I ask you to vote yes so that we can ensure that no one is left behind on Rikers. The only guarantee of no new jails is the same old jails. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. 
Who's on? Yeah, not on. Uh, good afternoon, council members. My name is Lucas Pershing. I work at Trinity Wall Street Church, which is a few blocks down the road. We're a historic church. Uh, I've been involved in the Close Rikers campaign for a long time. So I'd like to read you a statement on behalf of one of our priests, Reverend Winnie Varghese. Um, Trinity Church Wall Street urges the city council to vote yes to close the jail complex on Rikers Island and support a system of modern borough-based jails with provisions that decrease incarceration and build a system of justice worthy of our great city. <laughs> Rikers Island is a stain on New York that contributes to human suffering, broken families, and community deterioration. Its culture of violence and inhumane conditions creates a human rights crisis that impacts our families and neighbors and the people who are employed there. Many of our congregants have been detained on Rikers, often before their trial, with great physical and spiritual costs inflicted on their souls. Furthermore, we know that over 90% of those detained on Rikers are black and brown, and over 40% have a diagnosed mental health condition. The tragedy of Rikers is therefore a family, racial, and social justice issue, and we must close it as soon as possible. A modern borough-based system of jails that prioritizes rehabilitation and family unity and helps prepare our neighbors to live full and wholesome lives is the morally right plan to advance. At the moment, when family members or clergy wish to visit a loved one detained at Rikers, they must invest an entire day for an hour-long visit. And we know that successful rehabilitation and health outcomes require that a person have connections to their families, social services, and educational programming. And a system of modern borough-based jails supports the environment for these kind of outcomes to happen. The tragedy of Rikers must not be replicated in the new system of justice we are building in our city. To that end, the following provisions should be included in your plan moving forward. One, we must invest in alternatives to incarceration so that detaining a person becomes the absolute last resort after other options have been exhausted. Two, we must invest in communities so that our neighbors have vibrant opportunities and our neighborhoods have vibrant opportunities and health outcomes that are robust. And finally, the era of incarcerating people for mental health and substance abuse issues must end. None of this can happen as long as Rikers stays open, and we urge you to support a plan that focuses on decarceration, closing Rikers, and building borough-based jails. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your testimony. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tamika Graham. I'm a lifelong New York City resident. I'm formerly incarcerated, and I am human. I'm testifying today in support of the plan to go from 12 jails to four borough-based facilities. Along with other formerly incarcerated people, I am also urging the City Council to ensure that this plan also comes with com commitments to further investments in alternatives to incarceration and treatment for mental health needs. Rikers Island must be closed down immediately. It serves no positive purpose. I was on Rikers Island for the first time in 1995, while at the tender age of 16. I had to learn to develop a thick skin, and I had to learn how to survive. Otherwise, Rikers Island would have chewed me up alive and spit me out. When I was back at Rikers Island years later, I found that toxic culture as unchanged as the toxic environment. Because of the work of formerly incarcerated advocates, we've made progress. With Raise the Age, adolescents are no longer at, on Rikers, and we passed bill reform that will keep thousands of people across the city and state from spending even a day in jail. But there's more work to do, and not everyone will be free yet. Rikers is not an environment fit for any human being, and we won't leave anyone behind there. The time is now, and we cannot delay. Moving quickly with this approval process is the right thing to do to match the urgency of the human rights crisis on Rikers Island and the poor conditions on other existing city jails. In closing Rikers, we must also invest in our communities. The downsizing of the jail system will set us up to permanently reduce how much money we spend on it each year. It costs taxpayers $300,000 to jail one human on Rikers annually. We could instead use it for schools, recreation centers, healing and restorative justice centers, credible messengers, alternatives to incarceration, job training, housing, treatment programs, growing gardens, and anything else that fits the needs and betterment of the community. These are the type of investments that will help us over time continue to reduce the jail population in this city and the prison population across the state. But we cannot get to that point without first crossing this threshold. So please, pass this plan and heed the demands of Close Rikers' campaign to make this plan to shrink the system, improve conditions, and invest in communities. Thank you. Hi. My name is Jordan Rosenthal, and I'm the Senior Associate of Policy and Advocacy at College and Community Fellowship, a nonprofit that partners with women with criminal convictions to help them earn their college degrees so that they, their families, and communities can thrive. 
Just as the physical structure of Rikers has contributed to more violence, intentional design features can instead honor dignity, increase re rehabilitation, and ultimately improve public safety. There is a strong body of research connecting one's physical environment to their emotional and psychological well-being, mood, and behavior. Access to natural light, outdoor areas, and ample communal spaces are key components of this practice and would further serve to enhance the success of these new facilities. There must be a prioritization of designing spaces that can support robust programming and services, such as counseling groups, education, vocational programming, family meetings, recreation, and spiritual guidance. This includes creating spaces for medical, mental health, and dependency treatment, including prenatal and maternity care, and gender reaffirming treatment for transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. All of these require more space, which is why we cannot, in response to NIMBYism, seek to reduce the height of each facility so much that these improved conditions are no longer possible. This is by no means the end of the fight. We must continue to push for better and more alternatives to incarceration, decriminalization for, of low-level offenses, and eliminating jail for technical violations of parole among a range of needed reforms. At this moment in time, the strongest measure we can take to decarcerate NYC is to close Rikers and build smaller, safer borough-based facilities. I urge you to vote yes and include your plan and include your plan with the improvements that the Close Rikers Coalition is calling for. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your time as well. Thank you, panel. Thanks Thank so you. much. Okay, we're gonna call up Jose Saldana. <coughs> Victoria Cambranes, Cambranes. Nope. Carolyn Cohen, Nancy Kang, and Janine Ko. Once again, it's Jose Saldana, Victoria Cambranes, Carolyn Cohen, Nancy Kang, and Janine Cole. Howard Huey. Matilda Wysocka, Matilda, Panel members, please remember to state your name for the record and remember to turn on the microphone. When the red light is on, you know it's on. You may begin. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Nancy Kong. I am a lifelong resident of Chinatown. I live blocks from ground zero and from blocks from the tenement and housing project where I was born and raised. Imagine a child growing up in poverty, a child whose family was victims of crime, violent crime, but somehow coming out of that environment and then choosing to live in and fight for that community. That child was me and why I am uniquely qualified to talk about my community and the impact of this jail will have on my neighborhood. Change starts with real investments in our communities and all communities of low income and people of color. It is not about building new mega jails in them. I formed Neighbors United Below Canal and Boroughs United because Mayor de Blasio, Speaker Corey Johnson, and my council member, Margaret Chin, who is not present, resoundingly ignored the community's concerns, the real hazards of, that we've identified 
the illegal nature of the Euler process, and quite frankly, the sheer arrogance of them marching into our community and imposing this ridiculous jail, an experimental, untested, and unprecedented jail in the middle of an already densely populated and neglected neighborhood. This is modern-day colonialism. Judge Littman said that if you oppose this plan, you support mass incarceration. It is this type of racial insensitivity and fear-mongering rhetoric that has suppressed so many voices. It is deliberately pitting one minority community against another. You have the power to do better. Crime rates in Chinatown are increasing. They are not decreasing despite the mayor's rhetoric. Building new jails is not the answer. We need true progressive thinking, not this outdated and archaic plan. We need bold new leadership, leaders who have courage and vision to use the LA example where their city council members voted against a $2 billion new jail managed by DOC in favor of investing in community-based mental health care facilities managed by the Department of Health. Or the Seattle example, instead of jailing people caught with small amounts of drug, they, they are Thank sent to you. treatment programs. People should not be going to jail for services or housing they need. Thank you very much for your testimony Thank today. You. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Victoria Cambranes. Um, I am a candidate for city council in 2021, District 33, um, and a lifelong uh, Brooklynite. Um, District 33 includes the uh, Brooklyn uh, detention complex which uh, I agree with our current councilman, Councilman Levin, that there are a lot of issues with that detention center. However, uh, if you look at the current population of that detention center, it's about 360 people out of a capacity of 815. It's already well below 50% of the capacity. If you look at the capacity of uh, Rikers Island currently, it's about 7,290 people, um, and that's about 30% of what Rikers can hold. So in the meantime, uh, we're already talking about demolition starting in January, removing all the inmates in December. Inmates. This is people, people. people. sorry, people, uh, removing them in December and housing them at Rikers. So if this project is going to be completed in 2026 and potentially a lot later than that, what with budgets and the way the city is run, um, we have to consider that there are going to be uh, people housed in Rikers Island who were in the Brooklyn detention complex for the majority of their, their time. Um, and so the people in the meantime um, are going to be suffering through Rikers anyway. So what are we going to do about that in the meantime is a big question that no one is asking. And in the long term, you know, Rikers Island is a facility for uh, the largest mental health facility in New York City. Half of that money, at least, can be used to ensure that we have proper mental health care for people who really need it. Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Chinese American Planning Council. CPC was founded in 1965 after the end of the Chinese Exclusion Act, and we have community centers in Chinatown. Um, two of our program sites are right across from where the proposed Manhattan Detention Complex expansion would be. CPC affirms that Rikers must close now. In fact, it should have been closed long ago. But we are being given a false choice when we are told that the only way to close Rikers is to open new jails. CPC believes that as Asian Americans, we should acknowledge that our black and brown, black and Latinx folks of color are disproportionately harmed by Rikers and by jails, and that as Asian Americans, it's our responsibility to stand in solidarity with them and to refuse to be used as a wedge in this issue. We oppose the building of new jails, the expansion of the Manhattan Detention Complex, Rather, what we need to do is invest in our communities. We need to invest in the social services and the mental health services and the community services that, ke that serve as in alternatives to incarceration and keep people from being jailed to begin with. We do not need to construct new jails. We need to invest in our communities. We need to invest in mental health rather than using our jails as mental health facilities. And we do not 
support the idea that there is the only way to close Rikers is to build new jails. Thank you. Hi, my name is Howard Huey. I live a block away from 124, 125 White Street, the Manhattan Detention Center. I'm also a member of Neighbors United Below Canal, Boroughs United, and also on the board of Chatham Towers. Dear council members, all through this long EULA process, it has been emphasized the importance of community engagement, including at the start of this meeting. I and many other residents have been thoroughly engaged throughout this process. We have attended many of the community board one and three meetings at both their land use hearings and as well as their full board meetings, we have provided testimony that has been incorporated in the community board decisions. I have also visited over 100 businesses around the Manhattan Detention Center. Over 99% of these have readily signed petitions against this massive jail. The overwhelming comment when speaking to them, to them is this, they say, this is a crazy idea, building such a large jail in this neighborhood. This is not a NIMBY response, as these people have been working every day right in the shadows of the jail without any complaints. So I ask, what does community engagement mean? If the community boards vote no to this plan, the businesses and the residents in this community vote no and have signed petitions against this plan, the Manhattan Borough President has stated that the scope of this project is too large and she re reiterated that today. Margaret Chin herself has commented about the size of, of the jail and she has also reiterated her, uh, her, her concerns about the size. The city has, a, has however, not revised the scope of this plan. It still calls for a 1.2 million square foot, 495 foot tall, tall scraper that exceeds the zoning limits. It requires the City Planning Council to provide a special zoning exemption against the community's wishes. Community engagement has no meeting. If this plan is allowed to continue, I ask that the City Council vote no to this plan. I ask that Councilperson Margaret Chin listen to her community boards, listen to her constituents, and vote no to this plan. Thank you. Hello, I'm Matilda Waisaki. I'm a member of Picture the Homeless, and um, we are um, calling for Rikers to be closed immediately, as well as um, there be no new jails. The homeless population in New York City has only increased in the past few years. People are going in and out of um, our criminal justice system regularly and struggle to get work and housing and end up back in jail. There are billions of dollars that could go to better homeless services or whatever people um, in our communities want, but this is probably the worst way to be spending that. And we're regularly criminalized. This is a nasty uh, loop where we're going into jails, out to the streets or shelters, and so on and so forth. More jails is only going to accelerate that process when we're um, criminalized for trying to pee or protect ourselves from cops that kick us um, if we're just sleeping and because they can, because they got that power. So we at Picture the Homeless hope that y'all will, will be able to um, work with uh, people going in and out and if uh, there's all this money that isn't going to housing that could or any other community initiative, just put it there. It's not rocket science. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, panel. Curtis Bell, Tyler Nims, Zachary Katzenstein, Katzenstein, Zachary, Akila Tomlinson, and Danielle White.
Once again, Curtis Bell, Tyler Nims, Zachary, I'll say Zachary Katz. Sorry, Zachary. Akilah Tomlinson and Danielle White. Panel, remember to state your name. You may begin. Curtis Bell, um, activist for the uh, Catala Center for Health, Justice, and Equity. Um, I'm going to give you a unique interpretation today. We heard many things. I'm formerly incarcerated. I was incarcerated at the age of 17 to about 39. I bring you a very unique experience from this aspect. Prisons are, for one, the greatest blighter of hope. It robs, it steals from people. It steals something very fundamental and humane from the souls of all of us. It could be your mother, your father, but people leaving those conditions never leave the same. There's no such thing as a humane jail. But there is a such thing as a forward-thinking therapeutic jail that is designed behind rehabilitation. As a man, I am a direct product of the crack epidemic. The policy is designed to attack the dealer and the user. So if your mother was the dealer and your father was the user, what happened to the child? The war on drugs did not account for people like me. What they gave children like me was the foster care to prison pipeline, the jail to prison pipeline. But I'm also tempered by the idea that we don't live in a utopian society, nor can we build one, because we are fundamentally flawed and fragile as human beings. And if that's the case, that means crime will exist, and people will commit crimes. I know people right now will not stop committing crimes. So I'm asking this board and this committee to pass this to close Rikers Island, build four humane jails with accountability. Accountability is what we need. There's a fundamental distrust of government. There's a fundamental distrust of each other. But at some point, we have to have faith in our legislative officials, and we got to hold them accountable. No system is perfect. We make it perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Tyler Nims. I lead the staff of the Littman Commission. There's been a lot of testimony today about the need for change in the justice system in this city. And there's unanimous agreement in this room that the jails on Rikers Island are places of misery, and pain and have been that way for decades. There's nothing that I can say today that will express this more powerfully than the words of the people who have been locked up there, many of whom you've already heard from. It is long past time to put an end to this place. This plan comes before the city council with a land use application for borough jails, but it is part of a much broader effort to put an end to Rikers and its legacy. That effort is already making a difference. In less than three years, there are 3,000 fewer people who are incarcerated in our city, which is proof of the power of this idea. But conditions at Rikers are as bad today as they have ever been for those who work there, for those who are incarcerated there, and for those who must visit their loved ones there. This plan is a chance to ensure that the much lower number of people who are incarcerated in the future and those who work and visit these facilities are treated better. There are some people who have argued that this plan provides no guarantee that Rikers Island will close, but voting no to this plan will guarantee that those jails remain open. Please vote yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Zachary Katz Nelson. I'm the policy director at the Littman Commission. And thank you for the opportunity to testify and thank you for listening to all of us today. 
How are we going to close Rikers? We need to invest in our people. We need to invest in our communities. We need to invest in jobs, in housing, in mental health treatment, in substance dependence treatment. We need it all, and we need it now. We want as few people locked up as absolutely possible. And the best way to do that is to invest in our people. At the same time, almost 40,000 people cycle through our jails every single year. 7,000 souls sit in our jails right now. And what about them? We cannot leave anyone behind. No one. No one should be subjected to the conditions in Rikers. Nobody should be subjected to the conditions that exist in the borough jails today. They all need to be torn down, all 11 of them, and replaced with something better. An opportunity for people to actually have access to reentry services, an opportunity for people to be safe, an opportunity for people close to their families, to their loved ones, to lawyers, to judges, so they can actually have a chance to fight for justice in their cases and have a fighting chance for success when they get out. We have this opportunity, this moment, and it's rare. Believe me, we know through history, generations ago, we've tried to close Rikers came again in the 670s and the 80s, again 10 years ago, we never got this far. We say no, now Rikers stays with us for a generation more and how many more of our loved ones will be hurt and harmed? What ripple effect will that bring to our city? But if we say yes, if we say yes to closing Rikers, if we say yes to putting people, anyone who is incarcerated, and God willing, soon one day there will be very, very few and none. But until that day comes, they must be safe. They must be taken care of. We have a responsibility as this city to treat our people. They are our people, our loved ones, to treat them all with dignity. I ask that you please vote yes. Yes and invest. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. My name is Akila Tomlinson, and I'm one of many advocates, a part of Just Leadership USA's Close Rikers campaign. And we support closing Rikers, shrinking the jail system, and improving conditions for anyone who remains detained. I ask you to vote yes to, the, to this proposal with modifications to ensure that investments are made in the kind of community resources where alternatives to incarceration can replace the jail system in the future. For our campaign, the first priority is to reduce the jail population as much as we can and as fast as we can. My brother was held on Rikers for over 600 days waiting for his case to go to trial. I know that Rikers is not a place for human beings to be because that environment is not safe. My brother is not the same after the time he has spent on Rikers Island. My brother was remanded to jail before his trial. That means that even with the important changes that passed in Albany this year that will reduce the jail population, my brother would still be held. My experience as a visitor there is almost as tragic as a person being detained there. I would reserve an entire day to visit my brother as the trip alone is both mentally and physically exhausting. Once I arrived at the island, I had to strip myself of anything that is considered a threat, whether that be my jewelry or something as simple as a pen. Afterwards, I would have to go through security and then take a bus to the facility where my brother was being housed, where I had to go through security again. Sometimes I'd wait an hour to see him because he was waiting for an escort. An escort. The city can change this, and we urge the city council to dedicate yourself to advancing and improving this plan. Through the modifications, the Close Rikers campaign is demanding the city could reduce the average daily jail population to less than 3,000 individuals by investing in effective alternatives to incarceration and to mental health resources, including supportive housing. Please help us ensure the end of Rikers Island. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Daniel White. I am an adult education teacher at the Fortune Society. I'm honored to be here today and be part of this hearing alongside my students and fellow Beyond Rosie's coalition members. Decades of advocacy led the foundation to bring us all here today to discuss a plan that will reduce the number of people confined in New York City jails by two thirds. Such a giant step forward to decarceration in our city will create a real time pathway to closing Rikers Island. Reform so radical, many people say it's impossible. Maybe it was impossible until people directly impacted by the harm of Rikers Island causes this and says this has to stop. New York City can be better. Our society must do better. As a result of this brave leadership, our city finds itself at this imperative crossroads facing us today. 
a chance in history to continue the status quo or an opportunity for change. Focusing resources on punishment, isolation, and deterrence does not facilitate success upon reentry, which is why we cannot talk about improving Rikers Island as a permanent solution. Although improvements such as adding programming offered by agencies like the Fortune Society have been made, and we acknowledge these steps are in the right direction, they pale in comparison to a complete overhaul that the plan the city has today. No matter what, Rikers Island should be far away, intentionally, uh, it's out of sight and out of mind. Continuing to intentionally isolate people far away from their loved ones, communities, supportive services, legal guidance, etc. It will continue the stigma and shame of being on Rikers Island. As long as incarceration exists, the issue and the people it affects should not be cast away as someone else's problem, because this is a societal problem, and it must be dealt with as such. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Thank you for being here today and your time. Lorraine Fletcher, Roy Caldwood, Jeannie Chin, Stephen Freed, and Kay. Letter K. Elliot Felix. Elliot Felix and K of Survived and Punished. Letter K. Noel Fries or Fries, Noel of No New Jails. Panel, thank you very much. Please remember to state your name and make sure that the microphone is on. You may begin. Thank you. My name is Stefan Fried. I'm a resident of Chinatown. I live one block from the proposed jail. Uh, I'm also an architect and a member of Neighbors United below Canal Street. Uh, I have with me a rendering that we prepared as a community, mainly because the ULERP did not have clear images in it uh, showing the magnitude of what the proposal really is. As you could see from this, on the, right, on the right side, this building completely overwhelms the neighborhood. This is the proposed 1.3 million square foot scheme. It has uh, no setbacks and it covers 100% of the lot. Those are the three tenets of the zoning ordinance that have been in effect since 1916 that make the city livable. And the council is being asked to vote uh, on a change in zoning that would change those rules for this area to be custom made to fit this scheme. And as we've heard, the scheme is not fully baked uh, and it needs work. So the plan, what should be happening here, and uh, the Lipman, and I just, back to Lipman Commission, Judge Lippman himself said he did not envision jails this big. 
So this should be broken up into multiple sites if Rikers is to be closed, and there's no one in our community who is saying Rikers should not be closed. But this is not the right plan. And the, uh, somehow there's a panic, it sounds like, that if you don't vote yes today, nothing will ever happen. I don't believe that. This, this, there are other sites within Lower Manhattan, like Pike Street, with an underutilized DOT facility where some of this program can go. So this is certainly not smaller. The FEMA Lipman is smaller, safer, fairer. Absolutely not smaller. This is bigger. It doesn't work. Thank you. Is the microphone on? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Roy Caldwood. I am a retired assistant deputy warden from the New York City Department of Correction. I retired in 1976. I worked on Rikers Island for 13 years. I was present on Rikers Island when the first detainees were sent there. They were adolescents who were housed in Brooklyn. The department broke with tradition. It always kept detainees close to where they lived. When the detainees became more black and brown, that's when they decided to make a change. They decided to send them to Rikers Island, which was a home for inmates who had been convicted. There they were sentenced to from six months to a year. The department had three, uh, very, three uh, buildings in which they could house the newly arriving adolescents. One was a brand new institution. Another one was one that was uh, not very old, relatively modern at that, at that time of, of life. The third was the penitentiary. The penitentiary was built, as the name implies, penitence, punishment. It housed sentenced adults. They served from six months to a year. Now, the penitentiary had a central bathroom. When the inmates returned from work in the fields, they entered into the bathhouse where they took baths, showers, and received clean clothes. The penitentiary, the pen, had approximately six housing cell blocks. They all had face basins and toilets. Mr. Colwood, I'm going to ask you to wrap up the time. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Up. We're going to have to ask you to wrap up. The time is up. Well, I'm, I'm, then on, up. Well, I mean, I'm going to come to the point real quick. They house those. It's, it's a long story. It's Can't something. Take a long I'm, story. Gonna knock, I'm gonna stop right now. I'm gonna stop right now. But I'm here to tell you that those detainees were housed in the most horrendous conditions. They had no place to take a bath for months, no access to telephones, no contact visits. I can go on and on. Packed in there like sardines, over 300 to a cell block. It was horrendous. In spite of all of that, the black warden, James Thomas, he succeeded in convincing the overwhelming majority of those detainees that we had concerns about them, we cared about them, not through speeches and talks, but through positive actions that the de detainees appreciated. Thank and, you. And they shared, they shared their appreciations by the way they conducted themselves, self-disciplined. Thank you. 
I, I would like to present you before I leave with some material. We'll take the material, but we've got to stop you from your sorry, testimony I have it for right now. Look, Time is up. I? Thank you uh, so and much. I, I, and I ask you, uh, I don't have copies of some of this, so eventually you can return some. That's fine. I'm also giving you a book that I have written. This I am giving you. <laughs> Uh, my little book, and I'm certain this is evidence of everything that I have said. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Thank you. You can applaud for that. <laughs> Just this one. <laughs> Thank you. On or off? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm Jeannie Chin. I, I live two blocks from three jails. The entire borough based jail process has displayed some of the most blatantly shameful abuses of city government power under the veneer of progressive reform. Lack of true community engagement, outrageously flawed process, and non-transparent deals have colored and rivaled some of the worst of Donald Trump's lies and dirty tricks. Truly progressive cities like Los Angeles and Seattle are boldly reimagining a society where the mentally and medically ill can be treated in smaller, humane community care models in detainees' own neighborhoods and the incarcerated are reintegrated into society in well-thought-out programs. While New York City's government is racing to ram through sky, billion-dollar skyscrapers while sky, skyscraper jails while destroying their neighbors' neighborhoods. In Chinatown, our location between three existing jails, particularly the Metropolitan Correctional Center, has already put us through the harrowing excesses of 9-11's homeland security, severe street lockdowns, and takeaway of public spaces. This collapsed Chinatown's economy, it destroyed our surface transportation network, and it crippled our emergency service access, taking more than 15 years of street battles, lawsuits, and activism to recover. During this period, police headquarters callously called Chinatown 9-11 collateral damage. Chinatown is again in the crosshairs of city government assault guns. I ask city council members to treat our impacted communities fairly, humanely, and compassionately by halting, rethinking, and resetting this outrageously flawed jail process. What if you or your mother or your grandmother lived next door to one of these monolithic, out-of-scale jails? How would you vote? Thank you. My name is Uche uh, uh, Noel, and I am co-director of, um, co of community organizing with Queer Detainee Empowerment Project, and I am also an organizer with No New Jail New York City. I support the immediate closure of Rikers Island without building a single new jail in New York City. In this vision, I am guided by the analysis of incarcerated organizers with No New Jails who oppose the city's violent, oppressive, and racist jail expansion plan. Today, I am going to read a testimonial of Amer, who has been locked up for 28 years and who summarizes his experience of abuse while incarcerated as too lengthy to recount. The Blasio's jail expansion plan is an irresponsible way to utilize the city's time and resources. Reshuffle the deck and the cards are still dealt and played accordingly. Move the jail around, they are still jail. The prison expansion boom exposed the inherent torture and dehumanization of profiting, profiting from cheap labor and exposed corrections as a means of warehousing America's poor and disenfranchised. 
prisons degrade the human nature of both the incarcerated and the staff. If one finds a moment of clarity to come through the wreckage of one's past, then find the inspiration to repair old wounds, then correction is possible. However, more often than not, the mental anguish, brutality to the body and soul becomes barriers too thick for one to overcome without extraordinary help, help that the system does not and is not equipped to provide. Every crime in America has a social political subtext that necessitates pardoning and correcting by wholesome rehabilitative efforts. Most participants in criminal exploits are born into poverty. When we see a person who is wrong another, we must see the vision of highlight for sight and acute sight to apprehend the social efforts. The mayor should spend 11 billion in a new transformative justice context where each person who has accused harm Please will be empowered. I stand to say that no new jail, close Rikers now, and no new jail. The money should be used to invest in the community. The money should be used Thank to you. create more job opportunities, a sustainable and affordable housing Thank for you. the community. We don't want new jails in our community, we and we want Thank Rikers you. to be closed down right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, panel. Stephen Pacheco, DePaul Shah, Amy Breedlove, Yashkamar Shah, Shanika Fogler, Veronica Echeverry. Panel, please state your name before you start. You can begin. My name is Deepal Shah. Dear Chair Adams and esteemed members of this subcommittee, my name is Deepal Shah and I'm Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Center for Court Innovation. I testify today on behalf of the center in support of the city's efforts to close the Rikers Island jail complex. The city's plan represents the culmination of a serious research and development process that should serve as a model for the rest of the nation. It is a major step forward for the city and away from an outmoded approach to cor correction that isolates New Yorkers in a de facto penal colony. We can and should do better in this in 2019. Since 1996, the center has dedicated itself to the development of safe and effective alternatives to incarceration. We have been credited with helping thousands of defendants avoid money bail and pretrial detention. The center also provides research support and expert assistance to hundreds of criminal justice reformers around the world. One such process, project was our work with the Independent Commission of New York's Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform, aka the Littman Commission. Since the release of the commission's report, the center has been working with city officials, the state court system, prosecutors, defense agencies, community leaders, and others to implement the report's data-driven recommendations to reduce the use of jail while maintaining public safety. In general, we endorse a three-pronged approach to reform significantly reducing in unnecessary incarceration, closing Rikers and building small, humane jails, and developing imaginative public uses for Rikers Island. We hope to make jail a last resort rather than default setting. Local jails will continue to be necessary for just a small fraction of the criminal justice population. We must ensure that these facilities are places where genuine rehabilitation can take place. This is the promise of the city's proposed plan, to help the justice system live up to its commitment to treat every individual with dignity and respect. The city's plan is not perfect. No plan is. 
There has been vigorous debate about things like cost and congestion and the scale of buildings. Vigorous debate is one of the things we do best here in New York. That's been made clear here today. Community input has made the city's plan better, and the community should continue to be involved at every step of the process as the plan proceeds, but there can be no debate that we should move forward. Thank you very much. I know we was going down in order. Um, so good afternoon, council members. My name is Stephen Pacheco. I'm a Bronx native of 20 plus years. Um, 20 of that I've spent in Vanessa Gibson's district, um, and now I'm in uh, council member Torres's district. Sad to see he's not here. But I work with the, from punishment to public health department at uh, John Jay College, uh, also known as um, P2PH. P2PH is a collaboration of academic research, policy, and direct service agencies focused on accelerating reforms at the intersections of public health and public safety. We focus on stimulating dialogue across disciplines and accelerating the adoption of proven strategies that address the underlying causes of criminal and antisocial behaviors. I've also worked across various, various sectors such as policy and philanthropy, and I'm a formerly incarcerated person. And while this, this issue hits home for me, I think it's a travesty we have in this conversation without the people who are actually incarcerated right now. Today we are discussing a special moment for our city. The opportunity to shutter the horrid jail facilities of Riker Island may not come around again for another 50 years or more. And so it is with that fervor that I make my appeal to city council as we approach the closing of Rikers. In this moment, elected officials are tasked with finding an equilibrium, as highlighted by many of those gathered here this, um, this hearing, almost uh, like 200 and plus. We recognize the current plan to construct and redesign four borough-based facility facilities has flaws, but at this special moment, we also recognize the dangers of letting perfection stand in the way of progress. While this, with this sentiment in mind, I encourage you to con consider three essential elements of community wellness social, emotional, and financial, as you seek amendments and improvements to the borough-based plan. How are we investing in the social, emotional, and financial well-being of the communities surrounding the, planning, the planned borough-based facilities? We encourage City Council to broaden the perspective of the City's plan to close Rikers, and P2PH is eager to lend its wellness framework to help move the City efforts forward. Thank you for your time. Have a great evening. Hello, my name is Shanika Fogel. I'm a member of Just Leadership. I was also detained on Rikers Island for 22 months while awaiting trial. This being my only experience with jail is one that I will never forget. I can recall the times being in a cell with temperatures over 100 degrees. Correction officers chose to preserve energy instead of human life. No one should have to endure the conditions of Rikers. We must set a clear plan in place to close Rikers, so I ask you to vote yes to this plan. But you can also use your power to improve this plan. Tell Mayor de Blasio that along with passing this plan, the city must commit to more investments in alternatives to incarceration and mental health resources. I was housed with women who were clearly battling mental illness, but instead of being properly treated, they were mistreated due to their illness by being locked in their cells. Some will react by expressing their frustrations by either attacking other women on the unit or spreading feces in the cell areas that the rest of us were exposed to. Yes, they may not have been maintaining their hygiene, but that could have also been because the time was not taken to properly diagnose and treat them accordingly. I also know that these new facilities are just a start and that advocates like me will keep working to make sure the entire management of them is restructured with support staff, not Department of Corrections for interaction. Along with that, we need to change the language so that the behavior change will follow. No more inmates or offenders. Addressing people, Mr. and Mrs. instead. Transform building and transform culture will reduce recidivism, which Rikers Island will never be able to do. I urge you to use your power as city council to end this suffering and support this plan, including the improvements that those of us from the Closed Rikers campaign have named. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just restate your name again? Shanika Fogler, F O G L E R. Not Thank the you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Yash Kumasha. I'm from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and uh, I'm like my my experience is. Uh, very critical in the sense that I'm part of the Rikers debate team where I 
usually go twice a week uh, and teach debate skills and do like recre recreational activities with them. So to be honest with you, we really need to close Rikers Island. At the same time, we have to consider that we will, we will not gonna make the same mistake as it present in Rikers Island, such as the staff attitude towards the inmate. It has to be more positive than, than it's currently now. To be really honest with you, I'm, I also I want to link Rikers Island controversy to ACS. Because like I, I did physically a uh, tour in a horizon where staff attitude was so negative, was so negative that I feel like this guy shouldn't be working with ACS facility because of that attitude, you know? So like the, there was a guy who was former NYPD cop who used to work there as metal detector, who was like, if you want to work with juveniles, you are dealing with the animals. So you know, like this type of attitude, which sh we shouldn't have in the first place. That's it. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Veronica Chaveri. I am a social worker and career manager at Getting Out and Staying Out, also known as GOSO. Our mission at GOSO is to empower young men ages 16 to 24 years old who have been involved in the criminal justice system to avoid recidivism by reshaping their futures through educational achievement, meaningful employment, and financial independence. Our aim is to promote personal, professional, and intellectual growth through goal-oriented programming and comprehensive social support services. GOSO has been working at Rikers since 2004 to provide early reentry services to young men, including offering court advocacy, career counseling, mental health services, and reentry preparation. We speak not only from the perspective of service providers, but also on behalf of our participants. Right now, we work with almost 200 young men who are currently detained in the New York City jails. The hazardous and unclean conditions of Rikers are not only a human rights violation, but can affect the physical and mental well-being of individuals. These jails are unsafe for anyone, officer, civilian, or detained person. Addition additionally, these jails, as they historically have been structured, do not have rehabilitation in mind. Though more programs and opportunities have been offered by DOC in recent years, many people in NYC jails do not have equal access to school, work, and programs. For these reasons, GOSO asks you to vote yes on the city's plan to replace Rikers with smaller borough-based facilities. It is imperative that people who become incarcerated remain connected to families, friends, and community members, as well as program opportunities. People, regardless of justice status, do better when they have ample support behind them as they work towards their goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, panel. Appreciate your time today. Thank you. Rose Asa. Scott Jacobs, Sandy O'Hearan, Lucas Chung, Sandy Redburn, is it? Ryburn? Not here. Okay, Sandy's not here. Dean, uh, Dan Schwartz? Okay, we'll do it one more time. Rose Asaf, representing Code Pink. Oh, good. Scott Jacobs, Sandy O'Hearan, Lucas Chung, and Dan Schwartz.
Lynn Ellsworth. Anthony Dixon. Andrew Hall. Mike Giavello. Sorry, it's Milo. Oh, Milo, I'm sorry. All right, we're going to call them all one more time. Milo, Giovanello, Andrew Hall, Anthony Dixon, Lynn Ellsworth, Rose Asaf, Scott Jacobs, Sandy O'Hearin, Lucas Chung, Dan Schwartz. Michael Dunn. Shashi Kamara. Tom Burns. Okay, we're going to go with the three of you panel. Thank you so much for your patience. Four is coming. Okay. okay, if we have four, we're going to call another name. Sherrod Coley. Sherrod. Evan Wagowski or Wajowski, Evan. Nora Benavenides, Chris Casey, okay panel, let's go ahead and roll, please state your name, thank you. Hi, my name is Rose Asif and I would like to start by saying that this hearing is a farce. I see y'all on your phones, are you listening? to the people talking in front of you in the one chance that they get to give input, you're on your phones, and that's highly upsetting um, and disrespectful to the one chance people get to give community input. This is not a community plan. Um, and secondly, you're holding New York City hostage by saying that the idea that the only way to close Rikers is to build four new jails, that's a lie. You can close Rikers and build no new jails. You're not decarcerating by building more jails. You're not planning a future of prison abolition by building more cages to put people in. And as people said before today, there is no such thing as a humane cage. There are $11 billion, probably more, because this plan is highly unplanned, so it'll probably take more money to build these cages than you think it will. $11 billion that could go into community funds, that could go into education. NYCHA is about to be sold off and privatized, and you're talking about building new jails. Um, so I'm just really disappointed. Thank you. Steve, Rory, nice to see you again. Thanks for staying. My name is Dan Schwartz. I'm here with No New Jails in IWAC, NYC. There's no denying the horrific and pervasive violence against people caged on Rikers and the structural oppression that many who are released face over a lifetime. But I wish I could say that we're all here today because we see this as an emergency. If Mayor de Blasio, Mock J, the Lippmann Commission, and the CPC actually thought of it as an emergency, they would make a binding commitment to close it, regardless of any other factors. Instead, they are seeking opportunities. Does City Council care about the difference? As our elected representatives, you have a duty to listen to everyone, not just gigantic law firms, not just corporate architects profiting off of confinement, not just a police force that is addicted to destroying lives, not just a commissioner who should have recused himself from Tuesday's vote. 
Tyler Nims has expressed a desire to see our city reach a point where jails are no longer necessary. But if cops and prosecutors find that they have unchecked power and bed capacity to jail people, they will do so to the maximum, even as the city's incarcerated population plummets, even as the reasons for incarcerating people to begin with are continually exposed as reinforcements of, of inequity and trauma, the kind that lead to crime. Anything else is an authoritarian lie. Look no further than the, than the NYPD's recent fair evasion campaign. How would building design fix that utterly racist attempt to criminalize poverty? All these site services Mock J listed, why place them in jails before placing them in communities to the fullest humane extent? How do Jonathan Littman or Dana Kaplan have any control over whether wardens or COs use the secrecy of their structures to torture people, as they do every day across the state? Why won't you end pretrial detention? This is not harm reduction, this is harm reproduction. By approving this plan, you are telling every incarcerated person that they deserved it. It just should have been a little sunnier. What Tyler described is a hostage situation. Do what we say or we keep torturing the people on Rikers. Some emergency. The city has $11 billion to spend. Spend it where it counts. Thank you. My name is Milo Giovaniello, and I'm a student and an organizer with No New Jails NYC. I was born and raised in New York. I support the immediate closure of Rikers Island without building a single new jail in New York City. In this vision, I'm guided by the analyses of, among others, currently incarcerated organizers with No New Jails who oppose the city's violent, oppressive, and racist jail expansion plan. Today, I'm going to read the testimonial of OSHA, an incarcerated organizer with no new jails who opposes the jail construction plan. OSHA is a black transgender woman currently incarcerated in a men's prison in upstate New York. My incarceration on Rikers was not a nice one, being placed with men. In upstate prison, it's hell. I'm sitting in the SHU box in Elmira, and I'm having a hard time getting my undergarments. It's also hard to receive and get medical attention. I'm waiting to see the dentist. They have one dentist person, like really, just one. Reporting things such as sexual abuse or sexual anything is bullshit. I thought I was supposed to learn things in prison, but the only thing I have learned is CO officers are the true criminals, and these counselors can't teach us shit because they themselves don't know shit. To shut down Rikers without building new jails, the city should spend its 11 billion on programs that actually work to keep people out of cages. Let's not waste 11 billion on jails that will only have poor people, transgender people, black people, and Puerto Rican people. Jails do not help people. They do not teach people anything but to hate and be more corrupted like those officers who work in the jails now. Let's use that 11 billion for something wonderful and meaningful, like affordable housing for LGBTQ people and women who are being abused by their husbands. How about using that money to help people who are living with HIV? That money could be used to run good after school programs so our young princes and princesses can better themselves. Why not use that money for better assistance for those who are coming out of jail or prison? Use that money for mental health programs for all minorities, for better programs in schools, to get all homeless people off the streets and build safe and affordable and warm homes. Y'all want to make America great? This is how you start. Building new jails and putting LGBT, black, Mexican, and Puerto Rican communities in them does not at all make America great. In fact, it shows how ignorant America is. Thank you. Let's be smart and use that $11 billion to help our people, not destroy our people. Thanks Thank very you. much. Hello, my name is Michael Dunn. I live in Brooklyn, and Mr. Lander is my elected official. I am a licensed master social worker in the state of New York and have a certificate in public health administration and policy from the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. I strongly oppose the uh, construction of these four new jails, and I'm actually joined in this by the American Medical Association, which identified mass incarceration as a public health crisis, in particular in uh, contributing to people's mental health crises, in the spread of preventable infections, such as hepatitis C, and in the awful, regular, routine, and sanctioned sexual violence that people are forced to suffer at the hands of our carceral state. Um, I'm going to quote from Angela Davis in the book, Why Are, uh, are Prisons Obsolete? Uh, this is the 1996 Human Rights Watch about sexual abuse of women in US prisons. Our findings indicate that being a women prisoner in US state prisons can be a terrifying experience. If you are sexually abused, you cannot escape from your abuser. 
grievance or investigatory procedures where they exist are often ineffectual and correctional employees continue to engage in abuse because they believe they will rarely be held accountable administratively or criminally. Few people outside of prison walls know what is going on or care if they do. Fewer still do anything to address the problem. You are in a position to address this problem and you are going to choose, because you are cowards, to build four new jails. And I invite you, I invite you to do better and imagine a world without prisons. In the last 15 seconds of my time, I dedicate this silence to Laylene Polanco, who died on Rikers Island. Thank you. Darlene Jackson. Yes. Melissa. Um, Yakin. Yakin or Iken. New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Melissa. I'm here. Okay. Nigel Quirtz. Quirtz. Nigel. Kiris. Peggy Herrera and Tracy Gardner. I'm doing. What do you think? You need anything? <laughs> this is it. That's all I need. Thank you. Chips? No. Uh, an apple? Oh, bread. Okay. No, I better not. Panel, please remember to state your name before you begin. You can start. Okay. Um, my name is Darlene Jackson. I'm a project coordinator with the Women's Community Justice Association, um, the Beyond Rosie's 2020 campaign, and a supporter of the Close Rikers campaign. Um, I support the ULIP allocation to Close Rikers Island with the conditions that include key recommendations by people, families, and communities directly impacted by Rikers and diverse from $8 billion that the city spends on law enforcement and invest in people and communities that is equity driven and addresses the root causes of incarceration. Um, also, decarcerates um, from 15,000 people detained to less than 3,000 people from 12 city jails to four and close Rikers Island by 2024. The Beyond Roses campaign is an effort to amplify the voices and experience and needs of women um, that have histor histor historically been overlooked when it comes to mass when it comes, when it comes to incarceration. Um, we work specifically, sorry, uh, we, it's, it's to expand a turn to, to to expand attorneys to pre-detention and incarceration programming to reduce the number of women at Rosie's below 100 and to close the Rose and Signature by 2020 and support a reopening of a new standalone centralized secure service in which trauma-informed facility, specifically in Manhattan, uh, for any woman who identify as a woman and also to reinvest the savings from closing Rikers to better serve women, families, and their communities. Um, I also want to indicate that I know that um, I want to thank the Mark, from Mark J for listening for women who are currently detained on Rosies and formerly incarcerated and um, in a proposal to have them um, cited in the four proposed uh, facilities and now uh, in one house in the Queen site. But what I, I, would, I would ask the city to consider to, um, to further reduce the population to 100, because with, with our decarceration efforts, we believe that it could, be, it could be housed for 100 women instead of 200 that's being proposed by Mark J. And, um, and also to consider um, a standalone facility you know, outside this Judah application at, at some point. Um, but I do want to say that um, it is a right Island, it is a public health crisis. It is an environmental health crisis. People that are detained there are are specifically mother, uh, specifically women are you know mothers of, of children, um, homelessness, drug addiction, and so the city needs to really really address you know the root causes of incarceration, and they have the opportunity to do that right now. Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Melissa Yashan, and I am a senior staff attorney in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. NILPI works with communities across the New York City area to combat inequality, injustice, and infringements of civil rights. Our Environmental Justice Program has advocated to end the inequitable distribution of environmental burdens in our city for over two decades. NILPI is a partner in the Close Rikers Coalition due to our strong belief that the decrepit facilities built on a deteriorating landfill pose serious health hazards hazards to all detainees and employees on Rikers Island. We demand the city shutter the corrections facility and explore the possibilities to use the space on Rikers Island for renewable energy. We urge the council to approve the ULERP before it to facilitate this. NILPI spent more than two years collecting documents from various city agencies regarding the environmental conditions at Rikers and detainee health conditions. Our survey showed that the environmental conditions at Rikers correctional facilities pose a direct threat to human health and well-being. In particular, the plumbing is so dysfunctional that facilities systematically fail to provide clean running water and properly working sewage systems, contributing to conditions that exacerbate a number of illnesses and health challenges for detainees. The picture that these documents paint illustrates the urgency to close the island as soon as possible. For this reason, NOPI supports this consolidated ULER process and urges the council to vote yes in moving forward with a borough-based jail system and community facilities while also ensuring that the new buildings are signed, sound, designed with physical and mental wellness in mind, cited equitably, and include key improvements that I have detailed further in my written testimony. We look forward to continuing our work with the Close Rikers Coalition, City Council, the Renewable, Renewable Rikers Coalition, and the administration to ensure that Rikers is closed as quickly and as soon as possible, and that the detainee population continues to decrease while investments are made not only in communities, but in transforming the blight of Rikers Island to a source of renewable energy for our future, the only thing that this toxic island should ever be used for at all. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nigel Kiros, and I'm a policy analyst and attorney at the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project is a national organization that works to exonerate the wrongfully convicted and reform the criminal justice system to prevent future injustice. As a member of the campaign to close Rikers, the Innocence Project is deeply grateful that the City Council has recognized the overall negative effects that Rikers has had on the people of New York City and disproportionately people of color. The Innocence Project hopes that this process will mitigate the abuses and tribulations of those people held at Rikers who are presumed innocent, including some awaiting trial for years. With the anticipated dramatic decrease of pretrial detention in New York City, we hope to see fewer people pleading guilty to crimes they did not commit to just to avoid time in jail. The nation's more than 360 DNA-based exonerations demonstrate the problem. More than 10% of them, proven innocent through post-conviction DNA testing, had originally pled guilty to serious violent offenses. When you consider the number of people who plead out when the charges and stakes are lower, we believe an enormous number of innocent people plead to lower level felonies and misdemeanors. There is much work to be done between this commitment by the city and full imp implementation. The IP is urging the city council to vote yes on the plan to shrink the jail population and build borough-based facilities to enable the closure of Rikers and to negotiate imp important improvements to the plan including commitments to investment and community re resources. Those in individuals that are housed at Rikers, many of whom are presumed innocent, are subjected to terrible conditions, isolated from legal representation and support of family and loved ones, and ex access to courts. They are often shuttled on long back and forth court dates, housed in deplorable conditions, and subjected to violence at the hands of others being housed and even correctional officers themselves. These issues can be remedied by the construction of new, more centrally located borough-based facilities with more programs, space, and more humanizing design. Thank you. All right. yeah, I think we're good. Hi, my name is Peggy Herrera. I am a lifelong New York City resident and a mother and a grandmother, not only to my own, but to the many young people I work with. They are young men with lots of potential, but also with lots of trauma and pain that gets overlooked my 20-year-old son also lives with the impact of trauma. He took a turn and ended up in a Sorry, ma'am. Um, your microphone is microphone. not on. There you go. 
At first, I didn't know where he was. I didn't hear from him for three days. When I finally found out where he was at, I made my way to the Rikers Island barge in the Bronx. He told me he was in the bullpens for three nights on the floor with roaches climbing on him and he still didn't bathe. No phone call, no bed, no bath. The jail population in New York City is the lowest it's been in 40 years. So there are no shortages of beds or staff in those facilities to explain such inhumane treatment. We must do better. The fact that Rikers and the boat are so isolated makes it easier for this abuse to happen with little oversight. Closing Rikers is urgent. The plan proposed is a start, but we urge the City Council to make important modifications to improve it. The City Council can insist that the City make a targeted $30 million investment in expanding alternatives to incarceration. The type of programs focused on a therapeutic approach that would really benefit my son. Insist that a city agree to a 100 million investment in mental health resources. Through these commitments, reduce the jail population to less than 3,000 people in the next five years. And these new facilities must be operated differently. People must be treated as people, and the city must detail plans to limit the role and the power of the Department of Corrections so that these facilities can actually support rehabilitation. Please help us to win improvements to this plan and to close the United States' last penal colony and the floating jail here in the Bronx where people are suffering right now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tracy Gardner. I'm with uh, the Legal Action Center. And I'm here on behalf of the New York City ATI and Reentry Coalition and its 11 members. We're pleased to make this statement in support of the administration's plan to close Rikers. I'm going to use my time to name the organizations, Bronx Connect Cases, College for Com and Community Fellowship, the Center for Employment Opportunities, um, oh, uh, Center for Community Alternatives, EAC Network, Fortune Society, Greenberger Center for Social and Criminal Justice, Legal Action Center, Osborne Association, and Women's Prison Association. Um, these groups have been working together for about 30 years um, in different configurations, um, but started initially with funding from the State Assembly, and then more recently has in, um, uh, it gets funding from the city and the city council, and I want to especially acknowledge council member Drom, Powers, and Gibson for being such champions of this work. Um, our programs provide an array of services that do not lend themselves to one fixed or uniform cost figure, but I can confidently say that almost all of our services are vastly less expensive than incarceration. And these services can include housing, other non-criminal justice support services, such as mental health addiction services that are responsive to individual needs. We are here to support the development of borough-based jails as the only logical way to close Rikers. Um, we were mentioned as uh, in the Lippman Commission that the only way to do so is to expand ATI and reentry, and uh, recently enacted reforms, as, as people have mentioned, really emphasize the need. We have long believed that the, a strong ATI and reentry system would enable um, less reliance on corrections. We did a blueprint about this, and I'm going to conclude. Um, we are especially concerned that as jail population is shrunk, those that remain have serious and complex needs like serious mental illness and addiction. It is unacceptable that the city jail system is a critical component of the city's health care system. Okay, but, but that is the reality that currently exists. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. Thank you. Time's up. Thank you so much. Thank you, panel. Christina from Survived and Punished New York. Trisha Lynch. Nurse Atziba, I believe she testified. Mm -hmm. 
Anna Goldstein, Nesar Bhutan, Hunan Das from Drum, Naja Guyo, Gayo, Naja. This is this is a gentleman. Maxwell Greer. Kiva Carmen Frank. Shai or she Loak. C H I L O E K. Winston. Is Winston here? No more space. Okay, panel, please remember to state your name. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Goldstein, and I'm the New York City Environment Director at the Natural Resources Defense Council. We're a national environmental organization uh, based here in New York City. We're pleased to be here today to support the closure of Rikers Island jails and the conversion of this island into what we believe could be a national model for environmental sustainability. The closure of Rikers presents a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to convert an island of shame into a showpiece of green development. While Rikers is completely unsuitable for residential development, we see at least three potentially transformative land uses. The first is using a portion of the island's acreage for green energy. The island could provide space for a giant solar array and energy storage facility that could provide New Yorkers with clean and reliable energy in perpetuity. Such energy plans could allow for the closure of older fossil, fossil fuel peaker power plants currently located in densely populated city neighborhoods and whose emissions pose localized air quality problems, especially for residents suffering from asthma and other pre-existing lung diseases. A second smart land use would be the creation of a modern facility that could convert city-generated food waste and yard waste into valuable compost. Such an operation would prevent such wastes from being buried in landfills where they become major sources of global warming methane emissions, and an in-city composting operation would save city taxpayers tens of millions of dollars that would otherwise be spent shipping food waste and yard waste to distant landfills and, in and incinerators. A third piece of the new vision of sustainability would be to construct a state-of-the-art sewage plant on the island. Four existing city sewage plants closest to Rikers Island are nearly 80 years old. As they approach the end of their useful life, they'll require expensive upgrades. Constructing a consolidated new plant on the island could allow the city to shut down one or more of these older facilities, freeing up the lands where they're now located for community-desired recreation and other land uses. Finally, we propose that part of the as part of the transition, the City Council rename Rikers Goldstein, we have to stop you and stop by the clock. Thank you. Do we have an appearance card for you? Yes. We do. Okay. We'll have to find it. We, I believe we called Anna Goldstein and you're Eric Goldstein. It's okay. Apologies. You're a lucky guy. He's a lucky guy. Okay. Uh, Kiva, 
I support the immediate closure of Rikers Island without building a single jail in New York City. In this vision, I am guided by the analyses of incarcerated organizers with no new jails who oppose the city's violent, oppressive, and racist jail expansion plan and are developing our vision for what accountability for harm looks like outside of jails and prisons. Today, I would like to read the testimonial of Pam Pamela, who is serving a life sentence at Bedford Hills. Pamela says, I am kind, humble, and worthy of being free. A New York City without jails would be peaceful and united. To me, safety means not having to worry about basic needs being met, opportunities being closed, or having to be concerned about being victimized. It feels peaceful and worry-free. Transformative ways we could deal with harm might include therapeutic groups, having victims meet with their offenders under supervision so that they can voice the harm that was done to them, and allowing offenders to apologize or explain what led to their behavior. It also might look like giving back to communities and providing people who have caused harm or been incarcerated with educational and vocational training so that they have something to build towards. Unfortunately, our prisons are schools on crime, don't really re rehabilitate people and often leave them feeling more angry, despondent, and hopeless than when they got there. It's sad but true, and I'm speaking from the experience of watching others over almost three decades of incarceration. The number one thing I've seen that really changes people is education. It opens a whole new world of possibilities and helps people mature enough to own their own responsibility in the harm they caused. And that was Pamela, uh, an organizer from No New Jails who supports the closing of Riker without any new jails in New York City. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nassar Bhuyan, and I am an undocumented immigrant from Queens. When I first came to New York, I was told that this was a sanctuary city, a city that welcomed immigrants and took care of its residents. So when I heard about this proposal to spend $11 billion to build for new jails, I could not believe it. This goes against everything a sanctuary city should be. A sanctuary city should be investing in its people, not in building jails to look people up. I'm sure that many of the council members here today would strongly condemn what the Trump administration is doing nationally. But how are you any different than Trump? When you ask for billions to build jails to lock up black and brown people, and Trump cuts for billions to build more cages to lock up black and brown immigrants. That's right. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Murphy Austin. I'm reading this statement on behalf of Nanja Guyot, who was here earlier but was forced to be removed from the hearing when they expressed themselves earlier in the afternoon. Um, Nacho wanted me to say, uh, I support the immediate closure of Rikers Island without building new jails. In this vision, I'm guided by contemporary and historic abolitionist movements, including uh, currently incarcerated leaders who are building a vision for New York City without Rikers. Um, and Nacho wanted me to share the testimony of Hakim, an incarcerated organizer with the No New Jails campaign. Um, Hakim said, how would I spend $11 billion to shut down Rikers instead of building new jails? The first thing I would focus my spending on is poverty. I would create community gardens so that people can learn how to cultivate the land and grow their own food in harmony. I would create food banks and shelters. We should invest the money currently spent on trapping the masses, on giving shelter, food, and clothing to the masses instead. Then I would focus on education, real education that would help the masses overcome obstacles and learn their true history and purpose. I would spend the money on, educate, on medical resources, including holistic, mental, and physical health care. But ultimately, I would spend the money on programs that actually get at the root causes of negative action and help prevent harm or violence. As communities, we must build these programs so that our people can see that we don't need jails. What is obvious is that the prison industrial complex is big business for capitalism, and generations of incarceration, including future generations, are the perpetuation of chattel slavery. We are a country that thrives off of blood, sweat, and tears of the masses. The judicial system's justice is not prescribed for the poor or for minorities. The judicial system keeps the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer by keeping us at the bottom as workers within the prison industrial complex. A system that places the masses in slavery and calls this correction is a corrupt, hypocritical system. 
Uh, the reality is that the only correction the prison provides is adding money to the capitalist pockets. How shall integrity face oppression? $11 billion in the hands of community. Let's get free. No new jails. My name is Chi Lok. I speak now of the nonprofits that I serve, empowering civic engagement, advancing for the well-being of Asian Pacific Americans, as well as bridging the digital divide in the poorest communities and better mental health service for all people. My aunt Chinatown is the pride, heart, and soul of Asian people, as well as of all the people who work, lives, and enjoy visiting there. Chinatown does not need another me new mega jail. We have carried three jails for decades. In the early 1980s, I was fortunate to work for a, as a youth counselor for a major nonprofit, helping the recently resettled Asian refugees from Cambodia and Vietnam, living near the parade grounds in Flatbush, Brooklyn. At the, at the time, crime was rampant. Many of the immigrants and refugees were helpless as they come home from a day's hard work in the middle of the night just to have their wages robbed and physically harmed. Months and years will pass without much assistance from the police. Once the New York Times exposed their plight, there was assistance to help them. Fortunately, days are over. Crime rates are the lowest in decades. So uh, my question, why is, why is we building massive and tallest detention center in Chinatown or any, any other in four boroughs? The community does not need new detention centers to further suppressing the people in the community. We need is more funding for support our children to improve their education so they can compete in the, in the ever-changing technology world. What we need is more funding for skills training programs so people will have the necessary to acquire a job and make a living rather than resort to other illegal means of support. What we need is more funding for community-based healthcare centers to support mental health services to those desperately needed. What we need is more affordable housing for working poor to stop the ever-increasing rate of homelessness. We need is senior housing, cultural center, nonprofit center, and the support of the small business to grow and thrive. And, and the list goes on. I have serious concern about race by council members. Thank so you. this is a haze. Thank you. Haze process. Thank you very much so, for your testimony. Oh, no new jails. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, panel. Oh, oh sorry, we, one more. We switched. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, so hi, my name is Winston Nguyen. I was incarcerated on Rikers Island for four months this past winter um, at OBCC, Otis Bantam. Um, I, I don't get to say this very often, but I, I agree with Commissioner Brand that, that the jail, um, all the jails on Rikers Island should be closed. Um, I just want to give a few specifics um, to maybe highlight some of the things that she said. I think Dana actually mentioned the difficulty in transportation with court. It is a nuisance, right? You have to wake up at four, but that's not the only thing. I just went yesterday to appear for a friend of mine's bail hearing. He was there. They, they produced him, but somewhere in that mix-up, they didn't think he was there, so he didn't end up being called up. This happens on a regular basis. People are produced incorrect. I was produced incorrectly twice. What that means is the person who should have been there for their case to be called was not there. So they end up having to wait another two months for whatever decision may have happened. This happens regularly. So that transportation from Rikers isn't just an inconvenience. It means two months more that you may not get to see your family when your case could have been settled. Right? Someone else mentioned, uh, I think Member Rosenthal had mentioned the health care issues. The huge difference being on Rikers is it's not just that you're out on an island. Those buildings are separated from each other. So while I was there, if I wanted to get physical therapy, it didn't just mean going down to the clinic. It meant going down, sitting in intake for four hours, waiting for a bus to take me to NIC, which is only like a five-minute walk, but then doing two minutes and then coming back and then wetting an intake again. It takes a whole day, and no one's going to do that. And then last, I think Member Levin and Salamanca, I think you both mentioned the air conditioning. The, the, the procedure there right now is you get a cup of ice during lunch and at dinner. There, there is no ventilation, right? There's, there's a lot of plexiglass. The windows are meant to not open. So it's, the summers are not getting any cooler. So, so in my 16 seconds left, I just want to say, I mean, for all those reasons and many more, I would happily speak on them, but Rikers should be closed now, um, not, not any time later than now. That's it. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Appreciate your passion and your time. Insha Rahman. 
Is it C day? Seed? Nelez, Velez. I want to say Michael Verde, representing Catal Center. Michael Verde? You hear? Yes, we do. Ravel? Verdell? Okay, Verdell. Okay. April? Yeah. Denise from the Fortune Society? April? Jose Marte from Bronx Connect? Jose? Danielle Rosario from the Fortune Society? John Jyler. Panel, please remember to state your name. You may begin. Sure. Good afternoon. I'm Insha Rahman from the Vera Institute of Justice. I'm a former public defender, a researcher, and I'm a longtime New Yorker. And over the years, I've visited loved ones and people I've represented at the jails at Rikers Island, at the boat, at the tombs, at the Brooklyn House of Detention. I've seen firsthand the violence and danger within those walls. And we can't, in good conscience, condone the existence of facilities like these that don't provide safety for the people incarcerated there. We must close each and every one of them without further delay. But here's the thing, for now, they must be replaced with safer and better jails in our communities. And I'll say this, voting yes on closing Rikers and building new borough-based jails is not at odds with striving for a day when jails become obsolete. I truly believe that. As a city, we've already come further than we could have ever imagined in delivering public safety by using incarceration less. And we can, we must, go even further. And here's how. First of all, invest in the services and resources that build our communities. It will cost $260 million a year to provide housing, education, and supportive services. That's a number that the Lippmann Commission uh, put together to determine how much would it cost to properly invest in the alternatives we need so that incarceration is not the default. And before we spend $8.7 billion to close Rikers and build new jails, commit to spending a fraction of that amount on the resources that help people thrive. Second, set the bar high for how low we can go in the use of incarceration. There are 7,000 people in jail today. The new bail laws that go into effect in January 2020 will get us to under 5,000. Parole reform will land us closer to 4,000. By arresting less, expanding diversion, investing in pretrial services, and providing more effective alternatives to incarceration, we can reach an average daily jail population of less than 3,500. I believe we can even go less than that. As we build new jails, think to the future in a day when we won't need them. Build these new jails in a way that allows for flexible and evolving use as future community centers, libraries, grocery stores. Design them as spaces that we would be proud and eager to repurpose for another use. The closing of Rikers used to seem like a pipe dream, and today it's entirely within reach. We urge you to do it now and to push further for a day where we don't need Rikers and we don't need any other jails, but for today, vote yes to close Rikers. My name is Saida and I'm an organizer with No New Jails. I support the immediate closure of Rikers Island without building a single new jail in New York City. Today I would like to share a testimony of Paris, a gender nonconforming person currently incarcerated in upstate men's prison. I wanted to read this letter to make sure that Paris and people like them are not only represented today, but they are really heard. The city has tried its best to keep this plan a secret. The mayor's office has, so, has had several closed doors meeting about the plan. The city has hurried along processes, avoided truly answering questions, and implemented the ULERP on it, this plan in an unfounded way. 
Communities are not happy about this. Incarcerated folks directly impacted are not happy about this. Paris is not happy about this. They state, I was initially in Manhattan tombed. It was dehumanizing. It was filthy. I remember having to strip naked during intake to be made to take a shower without shower shoes. I never felt so degraded in my life. My, but humanity was shown to me by murder suspects and robbery suspects was humbling. They knew that I was a newbie and they see more in me, they seen more in me than the legal system would fail to see in the nearly three years it took me, uh, took for my trial to begin. They knew I did not belong in jail, but they, but I would likely fail to ever prove it because being black, effeminate, and poor, I was guilty of something um, just for being who I was. I learned quickly that remaining true to my core values would be the only way to navigate my pit, the many pitfalls. I still strive to show who I am in hopes to help others be comfortable with who they were meant to be. Instead of spending billions on jails, the city should shut down Rikers and the, spend the money on housing, housing, housing. Who can do anything without knowing where they'll be able to rest, to take care of themselves, to have a safe place, clean place, to think, to be free to come and go without any conditions. One of the other issues that should be addressed is the reunification of all the men in some ways back to their communities. There is no way to know the effects of so many long sentences on families who left in the world. I know I'm for certain that jails and prisons do not deter crime. Prison is not meant to correct anything. The main function is house bodies while their minds further deteriorate. It's all right here. All right, so first of all, I don't want to sit here and act like... Can you can state I, your name, please, for us? My name is Saad, Saad Velez, C-I-D-E. Yes. I don't want y'all... The point of jail is to is for rehabilitation, and the jails that y'all got is not rehabilitation. That's income. Y'all making money, and y'all know that. So that's first of all. You feel me? Y'all get all these taxes, and y'all get these little, like, what, like 20 cent soaps, 20 cent blankets, but then how much y'all spent on those bars? You understand what I'm saying? That's not cool. I did five years upstate. I was in Highland, Finger Lakes. I'm 19 years old for a robbery that I didn't even commit. You know what I'm saying? In the Bronx. So that's not even fair. And like, you know, a lot of people say, when they look at me and they see I got tattoos on my face, they think I'm not really educated and they don't understand. Like one time I got bit by a dog and the owner told me that it's a product of its environment. But then another time, somebody told me, oh, you don't like cops? Don't break the law. You don't want to go to jail? Don't break the law. But what they don't understand is I'm also a product of my environment. You understand what I'm saying? That's from like lack of opportunities in my community. I can't really go out there and get a job like that, especially with what I got on my record. I got three felonies on my record. You know what I'm saying? I can't get a job. I can't really do things I want to do. I, there's no like a lot of recreational centers in my community. Everything is all abandoned. Y'all want to put so much money into jail, why don't y'all put money into avoiding people going to jail? You understand what I'm saying? Give people opportunities in the community. Y'all don't want to see people doing good because y'all want people to keep going to jail. Let's not sit here and act like, you know, like we don't know what's going on in here. We all know that y'all want people to go to jail. Y'all keep opportunities to a minimum. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not going to sit here and act like, you know, we all on the same page. Y'all listening to us, but y'all don't really care about what we got to say. Y'all going to do what y'all want to do regardless. And even if y'all open the new jails, y'all not really going to even put in the proper necessities that people need, because y'all don't care. Thank you. My name is April Denevska, and I'm here with the Fortress Society. I like to use my time, and I just want to say thank you to everyone who's here. I'm sorry, can you just repeat your name one more time? Because we had a little noise back there. Can you hey. repeat, repeat your name? Okay, I'm going to start over. Um, hi, thank you guys for coming. Pleasure to be here. So my name is April Denevska. 
I'm here with the Fortune Society, pardon my voice. Um, I used my time to finish Danielle White's prior testimony. Um, I've seen how the current punitive methodology traumatizes students, distracting from a person's ability to feel safe, hindering one's ability to concentrate in a room with other people, and building walls that won't allow people to be vulnerable. Students have felt afraid to seek shelter in the NYC system after being forced to share space during detention um, and choosing unsafe living options or even sleeping on the trains instead. People without mental health symptoms of arraignment understandably left incarceration requiring mental health treatment and using substances to cope. This is not the way forward and this is not how our city should be treating people. I agree. Um, my students and I are here today looking at you to interrupt the status quo, to understand and send a message to New York City this will not be allowed to continue happening on our watch. Um, please help protect future leaders and strengthen our communities by ensuring we decarcerate NYC, invest in our neighborhoods, and confine the least amount of people possible in the best conditions possible. That'd be all. Hi, <clears throat> my name is John Dryler. Um, <clears throat> I live a few blocks from here a stone's throw from the um, proposed White Street venue. And um, I accept the idea that people who've done bad things should face consequences. But my question is, what if the punishment exceeds the crime? And, and if people do time under such brutal conditions that they begin to feel they've not only paid their debts to society, but overpaid it, so that now society owes something to them, and when they're released, they go out and get it. And that is how a permanent criminal class is created. So it just seems to me that if, if safety is the issue, wouldn't it be great if people could emerge from prison, forget rehabilitation, just emerge from prison without being maimed or permanently embittered or ruined? Wouldn't that be great? And I, you know, I'm, I'm a lifetime New Yorker. I've been here for 73 years. I think we can pull this off. And people have said that these four proposed new community facilities are doomed to fail, and that in another five years we'll be back here condemning these four mini Rikers Islands that we created. Well, I say, how do you know that? How the hell do you know that? Isn't it worth, isn't it worth a try? Isn't it the most important thing in the world to try to make it better? We, we, because I'll tell you something, I'll tell you something, R Rikers Island is more than a place. It is, it is a symbol, just like the Bastille was in, in, in the French Revolution. Rikers Island is a blight on the soul of New York City. It is, a, it is a pit of evil and darkness and oppression, and it has got to go. We've got to do better. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, can, can we just get your name one more time? I'm sorry. Saida. Hi, my name is Danielle Rosario. I'm testifying on behalf of my colleague, Gina Williams, who had to take her daughter to the first day of school today. I'm testifying today as a mother, a Brooklyn resident, an advocate, and an employee at the Fortune Society. I currently live with my daughter a couple blocks away from the proposed Brooklyn Community Jail site. After being incarcerated on Rikers Island, I stand here today, well, I sit here today, in support of building the community jails. If my incarceration experience had a famous title, it would be named after the tale of two cities, but with a much different plot twist. I've been confined in Rikers Island and in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. While Rikers is a jail and Bedford is a maximum security prison, they have many differences and yet much in common. Every day I thank God that Bedford Hills exists and hope that Rikers Island closes. Rikers is a dark, cold, destructive, and dehumanizing place. It dragged me down to one of the lowest points in my life, mentally, emotionally, and physically. I found out that I was two weeks pregnant during intake. 
For the first five to six months, I had to share a cell, which meant struggling with nausea, heartburn, vomiting, headaches, dizziness, legs cramps, leg cramps, and everything else associated with pregnancy in a tiny space with an open toilet all in front of a stranger. Yet the people I was incarcerated with cared for me the most. People brought me food when the guards refused to allow me to eat, sometimes for days at a time. Food is a source of control, and I was told they were going to break me because they didn't like the way that I spoke. I was too tough for a pregnant lady, whatever that was supposed to mean. But like many women, I was subjected to inappropriate physical behavior. Rikers has too many blind spots not captured on any camera. But finally, one day I reached the other city, Bedford Hills Nursery Program, a place with windows streaming in sunlight, walls with bright colors, characters from children's books, and sounds of friendly people singing. I could finally breathe again. I was in a place where I could actually see myself becoming a parent. Some of my best friendships started there and continue to this day. I felt like I could do better there because it felt like a community. I'm forever grateful for the relationship I was able to form with my daughter for those first 18 months, and I wonder if our relationship would have ever been the same without it. Please support this plan because every parent should have the opportunity I had at Bedford, and no one should have to be subjected to the way we incarcerate people on Rikers Island. We are all human. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, panel. Appreciate it. Wendy Pincus, Gerald Lewis, Ed Chin, Joan Bank, Victor Huey, Henry Chang, Marianne Kaba, Shasi Kumura, Diana Petty, Tom Burns, Sean Hudson, Noel Fries, I believe he testified. Cheryl Fedick, Cheryl's here. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna go one more time. Okay, panel, please state your name. You may begin. Okay, uh, my name is Victor Huey. I'm a longtime resident of Chinatown. Chinatown as a community is dying. It's been there for 150 years. The reason why Chinatown existed was because of racism. When the Chinese were brought over to build the railroads, after they finished, they said, get the hell out. You're not a citizen. You can't vote. You don't have any rights in court. So we formed Chinatowns to survive. And over the years, my father, my grandfather served in the United States military. They were not allowed to be citizens until after the war. I am the first generation of children born in the United States because there were no women allowed until 1946. When Chinatown started to grow in 1966, when they changed the immigration law, it went from 30,000 to 300,000 people. Chinatown blew up. We survived. We worked hard. In 1982, when they built this tombs jail, we said no jail. And yet they built the jail 
over 12,000 people marching. And now, here we are again. You want to build a 50-story jail. And what voice do we have? Oh, 9-11, take away the parking, take away the jobs, take away everything. Yet we still work hard. You want to take us, oh, too many Asians in Stuyvesant. Oh, too many kids working too hard in gifted programs. Take that away. Are you improving the city? Or you want to do something to improve the city by providing programs and uniting people instead of dividing people with these bullshit policies? Yes. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Sean Hudson. I'm a resident of the Bronx and a member of No New Jails and Take Back the Bronx. We can all agree that Rikers Island is an archaic, diabolic structure that was created to enforce modern enslavement, creating a culture that breaks and does not rehabilitate those that are sentenced there. We can also agree that this isn't a debate or argument about land or how tall the building is, or who doesn't want it in their backyard. This is about people. This hearing is more than that. It's about how our city's infrastructure is crumbling each and every single day while we plan to spend billions of dollars on new jails. They say there's no money for our children's future, that there's no money to improve public housing. There's no money for that, but there's 11 billion for new jails. There's no money to create affordable housing to help the homeless. There's no money to fix the MTA. Yet somehow, some way, they find billions and billions of fucking dollars to fan the flames of mass incarceration. I ain't watching shit, man. Back up. Fan the flames of mass incarceration for generations to come. In short, we don't have money for classrooms, yet we have money for cages. Yet we, don't have, we have money to keep 500 cops in every subway across the city. Yet we have enough money to pay Eric Garner's killer for five years while we waited for the slow grinding gears of justice that often halt when black and brown lives are at stake. These politicians are nothing more than salespeople. So I guess your slogan is coffins and cages for the poor, freedom sold separately. Being black, or brown is not a crime. Being poor isn't a crime. Being queer or trans isn't a crime. Yet anyone who fits that description is criminalized in this city. Putting prisons in the hood doesn't guarantee the closing of Rikers. Only thing it guarantees is that more victims like Khalif Browder and Laylene Polanco are coming soon to a hood near you. Close Rikers now. Don't build any new jails and fuck all y'all. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I've been here the whole day. Uh, it's clear the message either is opposed or in favor. It's state, clear that the- State your name, sorry. Leonardo Sanders. It's clear that the people of New York is against spending money on jails. We don't need more jails. We need programs for the community to help people not to go to jails. It's, 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 it's important at this point that we, we don't have programs that will be able to help the community. I've been hearing, I've been hearing the whole day that there is no programs, there is, there, but there is money. There is money to, to, to build new jails. At this point, I believe uh, the panel who was here this morning, they should be ashamed of them themselves because they was not able to answer specifically what programs are built for the people who are in jails, for the people who are, uh, who, 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 for the community of low incomes to help them to not go into jails. They was not able to, to say what kind of programs they put on place in order to, 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 to help this community. 
At this point, I could say if you, one program and specifically, we, can, we need cultural centers where people be able to learn music, dance, uh, able to learn to play uh, uh, instrument, musical instruments, guitar, piano, something. Those kind of programs will be able to help the low-income families to have the children busy. Take, and, and that way, those kids will not be able to be on the street on the, doing something else that is, there's, no, don't, there's no need to do. This is the kind of programs what we need. And I hope that the people, the panel was, that was here this morning, be able to hear this and at least to understand that we need those type of programs. Cultural homes, uh, uh, cultural uh, centers for all our community. My name is Cheryl Fetick. Good afternoon, members of the City Council and my fellow New Yorkers. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I am opposed to the new jail being proposed for Kew Gardens, Queens, and to the process being used to support all of the new neighborhood jails. I'm a lifelong resident and homeowner of Rico Park, Queens. I live about two miles away from the proposed Kew Gardens Jail facility, a distance that can easily be walked on a nice day. Rico Park is considered part of the same community as Kew Gardens for many purposes. An activist for most of my life, I am a founder of the independent community action network, ICANN, a group which builds coalitions to work on issues. I am opposed to the proposal for several reasons. I listened to the presentation of the plan for the Queen's Jail and spoke at a hearing before Community Board 9 at Queen's Borough Hall. The plan presented is vague and sketchy. There were few details presented other than showing renderings of a 27 to 30 story building which would dominate the neighboring landscape. I had requested to be present at a meeting with my councilwoman and the mayor's representatives to discuss the proposal. I was told that this was a private meeting by invitation only. I have been active in my community for much of my life. I believe that little or no real community input was permitted or included in arriving at this co uh, proposal. Community input should be and is required. From the presentation I heard, there was really no study of the effect of this proposal on the local community. An environmental impact study analyzing the full effect of the local area is required as part of the legal process to support this project. With little or no, oh gosh, uh, let me just finish by saying, even if these facilities are built, it does not guarantee that the programs and the policies that we, we want to help defendants and help the people who are now being abused in Rikers or elsewhere will be helped. The, pro the proponents are assuming that those programs will be there. We're putting the money into the facilities, billions and billions of dollars into the buildings, and then maintaining the buildings. We need to be assisting the people who were in the facilities and the neighboring communities. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you, Ms. Fettig. Hi, my name is Wendy Pincus. I am opposed to de Blasio's plan. Um, I think Rikers should be drastically, drastically reformed. I think 11, uh, 10 billion or 11 billion is a big waste of money to build new jails that are just going to bring the same problems without reforming the system. And when I say that Rikers should be reformed, what I mean is that um, there should be more public defenders, uh, trials should be, um, cases should be speeded up. Um, I believe there should be more educational programs, more programs where uh, the people in Rikers can, are, are more likely to be, uh, get ready for uh, have, having a job. I, should, I believe there should be intervention um, in certain communities. If there's a lot of violence, like if the parents are violent to the kids, if there's a lot of drug use. Um, but I, I believe $11 billion to build new jails that are probably just going to have the same problems is a big waste of money. I mean, it'll cause con congest 
it'll cause congestion in those areas. I mean, Kew Gardens is already heavily congested. Um, I can foresee that if there is, um, if there's a fire or another emergency in a building, elevators don't work, whatever, that the building could possibly have to be evacu evacuated, and I don't think that's the ideal situation. Um, and I, I just think that even if they say uh, $9 billion, you know it's going to run more. It's, there's always going to be cost overruns. Um, I don't know if that's $11 billion just shelled out or if there's going to be bonds and interest. I don't even think 10 or $11 billion represents the true cost. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joan Dark. I'm here on behalf of a Blue Stockings Collective. We are a volunteer-powered and collectively owned radical bookstore and grassroots organizing space. We've operated in the Lower East Side of Manhattan for over 20 years now, not far from where the jail, proposed jail is being built in Chinatown. I'd like to briefly chime in about how saddened I am at the decision to only hold one public hearing regarding this jail plan and further saddened by the New York City City Council's shameful display in dismissing the concerns of the public to hold another day of hearings that would alleviate any concerns over the time we would all have to speak. God forbid the City Council and Land Use Committee actually have to listen to the public before making a decision. The Blue Stockings Collective. The Blue Stockings Collective rises up alongside our comrades in the No New Jails NYC coalition to demand that city council members vote no on Mayor Bill de Blasio's plan to build four new jails in our boroughs. We firmly advocate for the Rikers Island prison complex to be co closed without building any new jails or detention facilities and instead hold that the city of New York should invest the proposed $10 billion into our communities. During the past two decades, we've seen the gentrification of the Lower East Side, an unchecked rise in police brutality, and the continued criminalization of poverty and necessary means of survival for our neighbors. We want a New York that emboldens communities to create what safety looks like for them based on the ideas of community accountability and mutual aid. The subway is covered in ads threatening cash poor New Yorkers who jump the turnstiles. There are notices on the Link NYC kiosks that promote calling 911 on neighbors. And we have community members coming to a bookstore for help accessing health care and urgent needs. That $10 billion in proposed spending must be invested back into communities and neighborhood infrastructure. The communities themselves must decide where funds are needed most. We are compelled to write in solidarity with the No New Jails NYC Coalition in opposition to the mayor's borough-based jail expansion plan. Listen to New Yorkers. We want schools, free clinics, safer, affordable housing to address our concerns of harm within communities, not jails, not police. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. Ramona Fer Ferreira? Ramona? Yep. Oh, Ramona's here. Great. Herbert Murray? Devante Tate? John McFarlane? Felix Guzman? Once again, we have Ramona. Good. Devante Tate? Herbert Murray, John McFarlane, Felix Guzman. Okay, please state your name, you may begin. Okay. My name is Ramona Ferreira and I am a resident of Mitchell Houses in Mott Haven in the South Bronx. I am also a member of the Neighborhood Advisory Committee for um, the Close Rikers Plan for the city. I joined the NAC because of Khalif. I then decided to stay with the NAC after watching the way that Junior was murdered. I bring up the way that he was murdered because I think we keep forgetting that in communities like mine, where for 30 years we have not been properly invested in, 
we have created the types of kids and young adults that murdered him. It is necessary that we move towards the eradication of jails, but it is also unconscionable to me that we turn around today and tell someone like me or someone like Junior's mother that jails don't have a place in my community when his killers do. Through the NAC, we negotiated aggressively, more aggressively than any other borough, to make sure that the money that's going to be saved through the closure of Rikers gets invested into all of the programming that has been discussed today repeatedly. It's public information. It's on the website for Close Rikers. Some of the ones I want to highlight include youth hubs. Teens in my neighborhood between the ages of 16 to 24 don't have access to clinics don't have access to sex education, don't have access to after-school programming, don't have access to quality of life. We included NYCHA because I have the most concentrated amount of NYCHA residences. In every way that we could, we addressed the gaps that this city has created for Mott Haven. We are constantly told we're no longer burning, but we've been simmering for decades and all of you want to act like that doesn't hurt as much as it did then. Stop taking away the power from those of us that took the table and decided with community input what we need to welcome home those that you failed. Um, good evening. Um, hey, thank you. Good evening. My name is Devante from uh, Vocal New York. And um, just like the brother brung up, Earlier, um, the gang I was a part of was also indicted on August 28th, 2012, in East New York, Brooklyn. So, um, Rikers Island have affected myself and a lot of the people in my family and community. I am glad that the city is making efforts towards closing Rikers Island. However, it is very hard to believe in a plan that does not include community investments. The root cause of many of the crimes that people are allegedly on Rikers for is a result of lack of programming, lack of resources, and lack of opportunities. A plan that doesn't co include community resources for people who are, who are in impacted communities is literally turning a blind eye to a bigger problem. I ask that between now and the next hearing in October that the mayor's office at the very minimum create a draft of the plan that includes not only community investments, but an estimated amount of money that will be allocated for community resources. Also, I suggest that you always put first, consider the stories and lives of people personally impacted and even from people who come from those areas when thinking about this plan, because we know what works and we understand deeply. I've heard of people losing office that were on the table because they missed court, because correction officers refused to take them down to court so the judge got upset and thought it was the defendant's fault. I'm telling you from experience that people come home trying to do good for themselves, but are continually denied opportunities, jobs, and resources, which leads them to fall right back into the um, proper lifestyle that um, led them to be in a situation to begin with. I am very fortunate to sit here today because so many people that I know are still upstate and still on Rikers Island that I sometimes forget how many people I know that's in prison right now. Right now is not the time to get caught up in temporary emotions or get caught up in the impulse. We are in a state of emergency. So I, I really beg you to really act now because our people really do need, need, need change as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry. Um, my name is Herbert Murray. In 2016, I joined Jets Leadership USA to launch the closed Rackers Island campaign on the step of City Hall because I myself suffer the inhumane condition of Torture Island. I urge the City Council to vote yes to this plan to build borough-based facilities so we can so we can reinvest ourselves in the rehabilitation of the person who going through these situations. When I was when I was arrested, I was only 21 years old and my daughter was only 13 months. When I was held at Brooklyn House of Detention at first, my daughter and her mother was able to come to visit me. But when I was transported to Rackers Island, which was many jails instead of one, it was full of anger and despair. The only thing I looked forward was visit from my family, but I almost didn't want them to come to Rackers Island because of the horrific conditions. 
My trial dragged on for two years. I remember being dragged back and forth at Rackers Island, waiting all day for court just for it to be postponed because DOC didn't get me in there in time. It was dehumanizing. I strongly feel I would have had a better chance at my fight in my case if I would have remained at Brooklyn House of Detention. Subsequently, I would not have done 29 years for a murder I did not commit. Smaller, smaller borough facility will give us a chance to start over. You hear me speak about facility, not jails because we can invest ourselves in the rehabilitation of the individual who needs help as opposed to jail, which kills the individual spirit. Rackers Island is designed for punishment, not for rehabilitation. Thank you. Good afternoon to the council members. My name is John, and I'm a member of Vocal New York. Today I come before the council to present testimony urging members to support a closed Rikers plan that will simultaneously allocate additional funds geared toward an investment of community resources in the areas that will be impacted by the existence of the borough-based jail strategy. Please understand that while I support the mayor's effort to permanently shutter the Rikers Island complex, I cannot support a plan that does not earmark funding for access to resources such as mental health, affordable low-income housing, job training, and educational opportunities that will stem the flow of recidivism. Without adequate funding to accompany the massive borough-based project, I fear that the ultimate goal of achieving a zero jail population in New York City will never be achieved and will produce negative effects that will be thrust upon the backs of the formerly incarcerated. A lack of funding for adequate housing and other sustainable benefits will force those who are recently released to reoffend and commit crimes against their neighbors or other unsuspecting victims of our society. This result will bolster the voice of critics who currently maintain that the Rikers Island facility should remain open or in the alternative that the construction of jails within the four boroughs will lead to disaster. Conversely, an influx of dollars will put most, if not all, neighbors at ease if the recently released are, utilized, are utilizing or entering job networking and training sites or educational institutions. Fears will also be assuaged if those that are released are observed entering or leaving housing units in which they legally reside. Quite candidly, if the mayor and the council are serious about a successful plan to close Rikers Island, then funding must be allocated toward community resources for those who will be the most impacted. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hi. My name is Felix Guzman. I am a leader of Vocal New York and facilitator of Rikers Debate Project. Uh, my name is, uh, I, sorry, I come to you as a collection of varied lived experiences, survived traumas, experiential vicarious learning, as an, and as an ambassador for community building and civic engagement. I am for closing Rikers and building no new jails that fail. With so many differing perspectives present in the audience and the city council as to how to proceed with closing Rikers and the proposed resolution, one thing should be constantly looked at, what is in the best interest for the, for the community at large. We can agree on one thing, changes, oh, come on. You just erase. Uh, well, uh, can I request to actually start over, ma'am? Please. We can agree on one thing. Change is necessary to assure that the community at large does not suffer collateral consequences of incarcerated of incarcerating persons within the confines of our city. The amount of money is being dedicated to this project is quite high. Nine to 11 billion to build four new borough-based jails would make sense completely if persons detained could, would be returning to community connected to every resource possible that was lacking prior to arrest and housing conducive to further civic engagement. If that is the alternative to closing Rikers, then let that be at the forefront of this debate. It is important to note that persons currently detained at Rikers are presumed innocent until found guilty and as such should have their dignity recognized. Understanding that it is safe to assume that allegations are simply that, allegations without substantiated proof or evidence. 
In an ideal world, America would not reserve a place for jails and prisons, and our system would be the model for all developed countries to follow. As we know, this is not the case. Rikers is unaffectionately referred to as, by those who have su survived it as gladiator school, and for good reason, reason. Noting that jails in New York City, as they are, require major reform due to the consistent culture that has managed to permeate. Right now, persons detained are being traumatized from the experience and are being discharged to community without being connected effectively to community supports who can help such individuals become civically involved. Understanding all sides of the present argument, I would like to spotlight that some countries have taken strides to assure that persons arrested, detained, are able to work towards rehabilitation through academic offerings, trauma-informed therapeutic approaches, restorative victim, aggressor, uh, interventions, and so forth. If new jails are the compromise for closing Rikers, then let's try to build community around that decision. We in this room, everyone here, has a point which is valid as it relates to all sides, but know this, Malcolm, Martin, and Nelson could never have affected change if there was not the inherent desire to build within community for the benefit of all to come. Can we make sure that there is compassion at the forefront while working to address the issue at hand? Do we continue to warehouse as is with new jails or rehabilitate or build community from the moment we walk out, we walk out of City Hall today? Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you. We're going to call the next panel, Shawana Vaughn. Eric Dillon, is it Dillenberg, Eric? Amanda Gabay, Yashumbra, Lucy Cotin, Cotin, Trey Freeborn, Trey Freeborn, Lucy Cotin, Yashumbra, Amanda Gabay, Eric Dillenberg, I believe it's Dillenberg or Dillenbaugh, and Shawana Vaughn. Diane Cardenas, Cardenas, Diane, oh Daniel, I'm sorry. See here, Daniel Cardenas. Rapi Castillo. Wei Wa Chin, Melissa Marone, Amelia Yankee, Dave Thurman, Maggie. Brittany Williams, Ann Renda, we're just going to ask the panel, we're, we're dwindling down, we're going to ask you to please refrain from profanity, from using profanity. Um, during the hearing, we want to hear you. Thank you. Panel, please state your name. You may begin. Hi, my name is Shawana Vaughn. I am the director of Silent Cry and I'm here on behalf of Rosie's campaign as well. And so we're talking about closing Rikers. And everything starts with a foundation. And this island's foundation is toxic. Not only because of what it is, but where it is. It's on decomposing and unstable ground. It emits garbage and poisonous methane gas. And for women, this is a problem for cancer, respiratory issues, and dermatology issues. And the mental health on Rikers is absolutely astounding. And we've all talked about health care and 
money that we can reinvest in community. So I wrote a resolution called Post-Traumatic Prison Disorder because we start with the children of incarcerated parents by building more prisons. And so we can't do this. We have to reallocate and rethink about how we are investing $8 billion and where we're putting it and who we're giving it to. Because if we're talking about reallocating money and creating four neighborhood prisons, are we talking about who's going to build them? Are we talking about what's going in them? I see you giving trinkets and, 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 and things to communities. We're going to give you grocery stores, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. I have not, we're not talking about who's building these foundations because we know they're not going to be people that look like us. You only want to warehouse people in them that look like us. But we're not talking about builders that are brown or black. We're not talking about space for nonprofits in these buildings to holistically provide therapy for the people that you're putting in an unholistic environment. Hello, um, my name is uh, Eric Dillenberger. I'm here from the Walker Street Block Association. Um, council members, I, I have a whole new perspective on your stamina. Um, I've just discovered that fighting for something is exhausting. <laughs> the jails proposed are the tallest in human history. They are budget-busting experiments in carceral fantasy without heed to practicality, physics, or history. For 180 years, we've been building new jails in Chinatown, always believing that the new one would solve the problem of the old one, a system which has proven ineffective. As each jail failed in succession, Rikers was meant to be the solution, and clearly it is not. This experiment will be one of the largest line item expenditures in your municipal budget for years. The priorities are mixed up. If crime might be viewed as pathology, the first line cures are education, health, housing, and nutrition, not jail building. Policing and incarceration are society's last line of defense, not the first, but jail building will eat up all of the resources at the expense of the others. Worst of all, we believe that this experiment will fail. The jails are too tall for practical use. You cannot engineer yourself out of certain physics problems. How do you get inmates, corrections officers, and staff out of a burning tower or timely respond to emergencies? How do you keep everybody safe? In a tower, you do not. Jails worldwide have been low rise for good reason. This is a lose-lose-lose scenario. You do nothing to prevent the root causes of crime. You needlessly carve up residential neighborhoods. You do not protect the incarcerated or their minders, and you mortgage the future of generations. Robert Moses infamously called up, carved up New York with grand visions. You do not Robert Moses your way out of the social problem. You Mother Teresa your way out of it. Feed, house, heal, and protect and educate first, please. Who would you like to be remembered as? Thank you. Mm. I just, before I be, my name is Lucy Coteen. I live in Brooklyn. I am known as a community activist in my neighborhood. I represent myself today. Uh, before I begin, I just want to repeat what Phil DePaulo said earlier, was in future hearings, the people should speak first. Let the bureaucrats wait and listen because they don't hear the people. They come and they don't give real information. They just repeat the same old dog and pony show. And then they don't listen. And I wish more of the council members were, were able to hear us today. Thank you for those who have stayed and listened and for your attention. So um, my question here is, do you know what you are voting for? We are told the size of the jail will be smaller than originally proposed, but there are no new numbers and no new renderings. You are voting on a half-baked plan. There is no public evaluation of how the new Albany legislation will affect the need for new jails or what size they ought to be. This ULIP application is premature. Until a more modest proposal is submitted by the administration, it should be withdrawn. The four community boards voted no or no with recommendations. That is a rare agreement across the city, and it should be listened to and respected. Whether it's 1,500 or 900 beds, this is not a humane way to treat people. You are putting people in cages, and both the jailer and the 
Inmates are forced to behave in an aggressive manner in that circumstance. Years of experience proves this, proves this is wrong. How is putting human beings in cages reform? We need alternatives to putting people in steel boxes. And then I'm going to skip a lot of this because I want to say this is not 11 billion, it's $33 billion. It's 11 billion on new jails, 15 to 20 billion dollars to redevelop Rikers and 250 million for a new training college for correction officers. That is the answer to closing Rikers. If you have 33 billion dollars, if you have 33 billion dollars, put that money into our communities and work with prevention, not putting people in boxes and cages. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Lucy, just one quick uh, rejoinder to that is I just want to, for the record, acknowledge that uh, Mock J, a number of uh, staff members from Mock J are here, including the Deputy Director, Dana Kaplan, who was, uh, who is testifying um, and who has, uh, with her team, been, been leading up this entire process. So they're actually all, all here and have been here for the entire day. Well, that's good to know, but in the future, let's put the people first. Understood. Point taken. Thank you. Hi. My name is Melissa Marone, and I live in Brooklyn. The positive language that's used to describe the proposed borough-based jails, like modern design, natural light, fresh air, all that, um, could have been taken from 19th century penitentiary reformers. And it's similar to how Rikers, which to be clear, should be closed as soon as possible, um, would have been spoken of when it was new. And we don't have to make the same mistakes now. I know that many of you on the city council are supporters of policies to improve policing and justice practices in order to lower the number of people in jail in the first place. And investing in communities rather than expanding jails is what you should be doing now to further that work. You have the power to invest those billions of dollars instead in education, social services, housing, health care, restorative justice, and so much more. Having a more livable city for all its residents would obviate the need to build more and bigger detention spaces. And I also want to speak as a public librarian over in Brooklyn, um, where I see every day how factors related to incarceration, both its causes and its results, play out in public space. Factors including poverty, stress, trauma, mental illness, homelessness, structural racism, inequality, and much more. I know how much the council does to keep New York City's libraries functioning as well as they do, um, definitely especially uh, Council Member Van Bramer, who was here earlier. Um, and I implore you each to think about how the money that this proposed project would cost could be better spent in your communities. This borough-based jails plan will impact the entire city and should not be considered solely as a development project in four members' districts. Rather, these billions should be spent directly on community sustainability and safety, not on new jails. Thank you. Hey, so my name is Brittany. I'm with No New Jails. Um, I'm going to ask some questions that the council members, Levin, Diana Ayala, and other ones who are supporting this plan behind closed doors will not ask. Dana. Does DOC work with ACS through contracts? You're here, Dana. DOC, anyone from DOC? Do you all work with ACS through contracts? Hey, don't tell me what to do. A ACS runs Horizon and Crossroads. ACS, do they work with ICE? Y'all are setting this city up. Y'all are setting this city up because Mock J has already said that the entire New York City jail population has to go to records for years. You're setting this city up for undocumented people to be caged. You're setting this city up for black and brown babies, <laughs> community members to fill these jails because none of you on here are term, y'all are term limited. You cannot, you cannot say to us that these jails, will, records will close right now. You cannot say that, can you? So why are you asking black and brown communities to take this risk? Have we not suffered enough when we're talking about slavery? Have we not suffered enough? 
You all are saying this is a, a plan to close Rikers Island, but we know that the Design and Build Initiative allows you all to say you you have until April 2020 to pass it through Thank private you. and public um, partnerships, you. which Thank we you. know that big banks have just pulled out of private prison is Thank funding you. this plan too. Thank so if they build it, they will fill it, and we know. Thank you. Private prisons, just the same thing. They're going to build it, fill Thank it, and you're going to have testimony. not only black and brown people, immigrants, undocumented people there too. Thank you for your testimony, panel. Oh. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I am going, I really, uh, security would really like to clear the room right now, but I really would want you to hear the rest of the panels that have come and spent literally all day with us, so. If we can maintain some more self-control and respect, it would be greatly appreciated because if we have another outburst, security will clear the room and the panels will be left to testify. So we're gonna call the next panel. Michelle Sildor, Mary Buser, Dave Enelke, Rita Zimmer, Alejo Rodriguez and Daoud Nasheed. Thank you. Okay. Tanya Krupat. Is it Atlee Swanson? Or Ahi Swanson. The last name is Swanson. No? Mm -hmm. So I've called Dave. Dave is here. Good. Mary. Masail Sildor. Masail. Atlee Swanson and Tanya Krupat. Not here. Danielle Panyata, Danielle Minnelli Panyata. Okay. Brian Holbrook, Connie Temple. And Dea Arnold. Or Andia Arnold. Thank you. Teresa Sweeney. Philip White. Yes. Mark Koenig. Charmaine Black. Rona Love. Rona's here. Hi, Rona. Okay. Edwin Santana. No. Thank you. Is it Madez Sydney? from Beyond Rosie's 2020. Rita Zimmer. No. Left, okay. Cynthia Brackett. Beth Chevery. 
Bobby Campbell, Quinn Raymond, Natasha White, Steve D'Onofrio, Frank Gesco, Eileen Jarrett, Brian Kramer, Brian's here. Great. Okay, panel, welcome, and please state your name. Good evening. My name is Misael Sildor, and I'm here to speak in support of closing Rikers and shifting towards a much smaller borough-based system of detention. I'm the program associate of the Independent Commission on New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform, but I want to speak as a child of Briarwood, a proud child of Haitian immigrants and descendant of a long line of freedom fighters, and as a fellow New Yorker. This is not the first movement to close Rikers, but we must absolutely make sure it is the last. To try to stop this process would condemn New Yorkers to continue to languish in dangerous and often merciless conditions on a toxic island. It does not improve public safety to operate an excessively punitive system, and it is an immense disservice to our city. Now is the time to address concerns about the plan, but it is not the time to restart this process. The people power of directly impacted leaders in the Close Rikers campaign and other advocates who've been working relentlessly on this movement got us to this point, and advocates are continuing to improve the plan. Your vote can help ensure that the best plan is put forward, not only to close Rikers, but to drive our city on a new path to invest in true public safety and community wellness. We are already working towards a future where our city holds many fewer people in jail, and we can ensure that momentum continues with approval of this plan. We can create a future where if a person is incarcerated, they are held in a safer, more normalized environment with access to trauma-informed programming and comprehensive medical care, and at the same time, make sure these kinds of services are robust, well-funded, and expanded in our communities to divert people from justice involvement. Plans to close Rikers in the past were defeated, extending the human rights crisis that exists today. There is a long road ahead, but this can be the first step to guarantee us on a path to permanently closing Rikers and transforming our criminal justice system. Please vote in support of this plan. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mary Buser. I am a lifelong resident of downtown Brooklyn and I was also an assistant chief of mental health at Rikers Island, working at the mental health center and what was then the 500 cell solitary confinement unit, among other posts. Based on my five-year experience, I wrote the book, Locked Down on Rikers. Although there's so much I could say about the importance of closing Rikers, I think the best way to convey it is through an incarcerated person's own voice. With this in mind, here is a short excerpt from my book that depicts a clinic encounter at the George Machin Detention Center. I stepped out to the waiting area where Hector Rodriguez was pacing the floor. As soon as I introduced myself, he said, can you get me out of here, miss? Can you get me back to the Brooklyn House? They brought me out here to Rikers last night. And the thing is, my mother's very sick. She'll never be able to make the trip out here. We don't have a car. I'm scared she could die. My bail's only a few hundred bucks, but we just don't have it. Being in jail is bad enough, but at least let me see my family. Please, miss, please. My heart sunk. This was an all too familiar request. The smaller jails are closer to home, easier for family visits, and everyone wanted to go back. But this was strictly a DOC matter, and there was nothing the mental health department could do. I'm so sorry, I said. Maybe you could speak to a captain. Yeah, I will, he said, hopefully. Maybe this is just temporary. Although I hoped he would be sent back, I'd never known of anyone being returned to a borough house. And sure enough, Hector Rodriguez remained at Rikers. But tragically, about three months later, his worst fear was realized when his mother died. The distraught man was brought to the clinic where we tried to console him as best we could. I didn't get to see her, he cried. My mother's dead, 
and I never got to see her one last time. Oh, my God. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dave Elke. Hi. My name is Dave Elke. I live in the neighborhood of the Brooklyn Detention Center. I'm a member of the Justice Ministries Committee of the Presbytery of New York City. I urge our city council to vote yes to this plan that will enable the closure of Rikers and to commit to improving that plan in several ways. First, the closing the remaining active jails in Rikers Island is a moral imperative and human rights crisis. Action needs to be taken immediately to close and demolish at least half of the remaining Riker Island jails, which are not needed due to reduced population and excess capacity. This can create immediate cost savings to provide funds for alternative programs to incarceration. It also frees up land for more productive uses. Two, because of the recent criminal justice reform in the state, the total capacity for rural-based jails should be 3,000 people instead of the 4,000 that is planned. The reduced population should be distributed to the four proposed rural-based jails in line with this. The planned capacity of new facility in Brooklyn and the other three rural-based facilities should each be reduced to 750 people each. This would significantly reduce the height and mass of the buildings. Also, the design should be flexible to enable jail floors to be converted to drug or mental health treatment facilities in the future. Operation of the facility. The city must create facilities with the least restrictive conditions that support a restorative and rehabilitative approach to incarceration as opposed to punitive approach currently in use. The people managing and running a new facility must be capable of willing to, and willing to provide a healing environment. This requires a different social services oriented staff and management with new job descriptions that must run the facility. It's imperative that the punitive environment of the jails not be transferred to the new facilities. Um, finally, closing Rikers Island jails is an urgent human rights issue. We cannot delay closing. It's an embarrassment to our city. Hi, my name is Ms. Rona Sugarlove. I am a member of Beyond Rosie's 2020 campaign, part of the Women's Community Justice Association, uh, activist in LGBT community. Uh, I, we support the city's plan to close Rikers and keep the women at a location. Uh, and we urge the council to approve a plan, but recommend modification that include a standalone facility in Manhattan which would be currently located closer to families and the courts and better serve the unique needs of women incorporating trauma-informed care and programming in a safe and a secure environment instead of a current plan to a target wing to propose Queen's detention facility for men. As a transgender woman caged for 35 years, raped 12 times while in the Department of Corrections, I survived 10 years in solitary confinement with no treatment at all. Any new facility for anyone that is identified as a woman needs to be included programming that are individualized and comprehensive. Services inside should include mental health services treatment that transfer with people back into community. Successfully with wraparound services they should be in the various people when we come out to society so that we could continue these services, which I still haven't gotten since I've been released from prison. Uh, women deserve and should have their own facility. 80% uh, of women on Rose M. Singer facility have had severe trauma inflicted upon them by men. Some alternatives to consider in my hand include the Lincoln Correction Facility in Harlem. We are calling for the Rose Singer Detention Center to be shut down in 2020 with the women's we held back at the loan facility. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Brian Kramer. I'm co-chair of the justice team of the Fourth Universalist Society. Um, we are a Unitarian Universalist church in the Upper West Side. We present the following statement. Uh, the Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York affirms the inherent worth and dignity of every person and is strongly committed to justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. 
as a Unitarian Universalist congregation that has been part of the fabric of the city for over 180 years. We support the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, and we support the closure of Rikers Island facilities. These are a few of the reasons. The remoteness of Rikers location entirely undermines the fair process of a just legal system. Rikers is only accessible by a single city bus line and requires passing through multiple security checkpoints, which takes an entire day. After going through this process, families and lawyers are frequently denied visits because of lockdowns. Because of the location, detainees often have to be awake without meals for more than 16 hours a day just to attend court hearings. The conditions in the Rikers Island facilities are inhumane and a public health concern. Many current and former detainees continue to report living with insect and rat infestations along with leaks and water damage. These conditions are difficult not only for the incarcerated but also for corrections officers who work there on a daily basis. There are multiple reports of mistreatment on Rikers Island ranging from small daily humiliations to occasional acts of shocking brutality. Most recently, Leilene Polanco, a transgender woman, died in her cell two months after she was arrested on a mis misdemeanor assault charge. For these and many other reasons, the Fourth Universalist Society Justice Team stands in solidarity with our neighbors and friends, echoing the voices of those in particular who have directly experienced Rikers. We also support the construction of alternative jails that can provide safe and rehabilitative services to our incarcerated neighbors and uphold the human dignity of all persons. I urge the City Council to advance this plan and fight for the investments we are calling for to improve this plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, panel. I really appreciate you hanging out today. Thank you. Allison Wylands, Jan Lee, Chairman Shu, from the Federation Association Chinese Community, Chairman Shu. Maria Lafaros, is it? And Sean Lin? Melissa Marone, or Maroney? Prudence? Amelia Yankee, or Yankees? Amelia? Jason Wolgin, Waltian, Jason. Betty Vine, Molly Baum, Sylvia Freed, Hillary Ashton. Yes, it is. Abdul Rashi from Drum, Abdul. Farhana Akhtar from Drum. Caitlin Moss on her way. Man Mohaptra. Savita Chisiwan. Okay, panel, please state your name and you may begin when you're ready. My name is Mon Mahapatra and I'm a member of No New Jails. I support the immediate closure of Rikers Island without building new jails. And I will read the statement of Jeremy Levinson as follows. 
My name is Jeremy and I am a fourth year medical student at Mount Sinai School of Medicine here in New York City and also a doctoral student at the UCLA Center for Social Medicine in Los Angeles, where I currently live. I have been studying public mental health for the past five years. Like New York, LA operates some of the largest jails in the world and those jails are disproportionately made up of people who use drugs or have a serious mental illness. In recent years, as the voices of loved ones of these incarcerated people grew louder and class action lawsuits continued to pile up, elected leaders in LA decided enough was enough, that something had to be done. After hiring consultants, the LA County leaders came to a decision. They wanted to build a treatment jail. It was due to our complete frustration at this point that my Center for Social Medicine mentors, colleagues, and I first became involved. As researchers and caregivers, we know too well the disruption and harm that incarceration causes our patients and that our hospitals and healthcare system need to take responsibility for their care. To express our deep concern that the plan would com continue to t the terribly flawed approach that led us to this point, that is to try to use the criminal legal system to resolve failings of our health systems, we met with elected officials. We submitted testimony. We signed petitions, which in fact received the support of the majority of UCLA psychiatry residents. We were told, however, that it was a done deal. Listening to the wisdom of the Justice LA Coalition, we decided to keep trying. We built a larger con coalition, this time bringing in emergency medical doctors and jail-based clinicians. Having worked in the New York City jails, I personally pointed to the success of New York, where health providers have been in the lead. And finally, last month, LA's leadership listened when they canceled the contract for the new jail and turned over the reform process to health leadership. So, it has been quite distressing to return to New York to witness leaders poised to make the same mistake. It is not acceptable to make incarceration the expected outcome of using drugs and having a serious mental illness. But by building new jails, new jail mental health beds, not hospital beds, but jail beds in hospitals, not so-called therapeutic jails, this plan ensures it will continue to be the, expect the expected outcome. It ensures it. Thank that you. is not acceptable. Reject this plan. Thank you for your testimony. Hello, council members. My name is Jan Lee from Neighbors United Below Canal. I'm a Chinatown resident of three generations. We agree that criminal justice reforms are long overdue and change does indeed need to happen. That road to criminal justice is a long one, but that road cannot be paved with the lives of seniors in my community who are gonna be living next to this construction site for 10 years. A year ago when our community was notified in a closed door invitation only meeting that a jail would be built in Chinatown, we knew very little about the impacts of that construction, we now know. Thanks to scholars in the, in the field of medicine at NYU Langone, that particulate matter, noise, vibration, change can so seriously affect our, community, our senior community, some living next to this demolition site, that they will die a premature death. They will die a death where their last gasps of air will be filled with toxic dust, their minds will be confused and disoriented, and the last view out their window will be a massive jail where there was one sunlight. We know that other cities in America have chosen a path that leads to healing, to caring, to providing mental health services support outside of the jail walls. Instead of investing in permanent cages for humans who will only be receiving services inside the jails, we know that investment in services outside of jails is a 21st century concept, while building jails to hold thousands of people forever is a 19th century construct. We know that it's time to learn from the mistakes of Blackwell Island, from Rikers Island, from the tombs, from Manhattan Detention Center, from the barge, so many jails. We know that building more jails where smaller ones once stood is a mistake that keeps repeating itself. It is for some the gift that keeps on giving. Now is your chance to break this cycle of incarceration rather than invest and in invest in people. A singular solution that is centuries old, a so-called cure that is prescribed by an absentee mayor born of concrete and steel cannot be your only choice. Now is your chance to listen to the data, to understand that our fragile minority community will wither under the suffocating weight of this jail, of cages, of antiquated reminders of Blackwell Island, of Rikers Island, of a jail solution rather than a truly modern model of how this city should function. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Savita. I'm a resident of South Richmond Hill, Queens. I am a member of DRUM, Daisy Rising Up and Moving. I am a mother of three children. 
and my husband is undocumented. In 2017, my husband was illegally detained by ICE with NYPD help, and he was sent to a detention center. I organized my community to free my husband and the father of my children from deportation. I succeeded in keeping my family together. It was not easy, but it was worth it, which is why I'm horrified that you people are actually look, looking at a plan to spend $11 billion for four new jails in our city. If you build more jails, they will look for excuses to fill these jails with our people. Building these jails will lead to more immigrants, like my family being arrested and deported. This will lead to more families like mine being separated. I have worked too hard to keep my family together and will not stand by and allow you to approve a plan that will break us, break up any, anyone else family. How can we say we are a sanctuary city if we are putting immigrants in danger? Instead of building new jails, the city should invest in legal services to support immigrants and keeping families together. Invest the, invest the $11 billion in mental health services. In the school, I send my children to. In the hospital, we depend on. The subways, we used to get to work. But do not spend this money on prisons that will remove my family and my community from being able to exist in this city. If you really care about protecting immigrants, keeping families together, being a real sanctuary city, then all of you council members must vote no on this new jail plan. Vote no, vote no on new jails. Vote no on wasting $11 billion to separate people from their families. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, I came here because I have eight years of experience in the fields of trauma and substance use research. And I also, um, ha most, more importantly, I have had my loved ones had their consent and bo bodily autonomy violated through mismanagement of their mental health crisis by the carceral system. I have concerns that treatment centers within the jail system will not be uniquely different than the ones that are already in place, and that treatment centers in the community um, with mobile crisis centers as, as um, included in, that, in, in the plan that they are suggesting um, for better communities is, is the way to go. But what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm mostly feeling right now is confusion, because this was a, a meeting about a land use application. No, I looked in, at all of the supporting documents for this meeting, and not one of them has the word Rikers in it. Not one of them says um, anything about the Better Communities Plan, which I, so I, I support closing Rikers, and I support the Better Communities Plan and reinvesting in communities, but I don't understand why these are being pitched as opposition when what I heard in this room was almost complete. There are 200 people who came here to testify and every single one of them supports closing Rikers in some fashion. I don't understand why we're being asked to choose between doing that and between building these new jails when they're really not in opposition to each other and I feel disrespected that um, that it's being framed that way. And I just want to say, though, also my respect for the formerly incarcerated people on both sides of this issue, um, even though it's the same side and it's your movement that you've built here. And I think that the city owes you more than just reinvestment um, in your communities. It owes you reparations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hi everyone, um, my name is Farhan Akhtar. I'm a high school student from Brooklyn. Today I came here right after school, after finishing my um, first day of senior year to demand, um, to demand um, closing Rikers and without building no new jails in our community. My school has only one college counselor for 1,000 seniors. We have to wait for months to meet with our college counselor. Why can't we use those billions of dollars to hire more counselors in our community? and not building jails? Why can't we use those billions of dollars, build more research labs, computer labs, and fund more art classes, dance classes, or music classes? Um, the bill, um, 
$11 billion should be used to hire more therapists, our mental health care system in our schools, in every single school. The $11 billion should be used for job programs for students, for youth, um, for youth member in our schools. People do not need more prison, prisons to, uh, more jail to prison um, more black and brown people. Why spend $11 billion in building new jails we, when we cannot even fix our overcrowded, understaffed, under-resourced school system? Instead of building new jails, why can't we use that money towards our education and empower our youth? We don't need new jails. We don't need more cops in our school or in our community. What we need is more counselors, more programs, more after-school programs, more teachers in our, uh, in our schools. Building prisons does not solve the reasons why someone ended up in prison. Building prisons only provides the excuse to fill them up and nothing more. Invest in our community, invest in our future. Don't invest into locking us up. Thank you. My name is Abdul Rabani. <clears throat> Character. Who you are and what you do are not isolated concepts, but rather intertwined. What you do speaks volumes on your character. In the coming months, your actions will represent your character. I won't sit here and tell you why this plan of building new jails is beyond disgusting, as my allies have already, already relayed that message. You have decided the voice of the people it doesn't matter to you. By taking that action, you've proved to the people, as representatives of the people, that your character does not stand for the will of the people. Instead, it represents your disloyalty, neglect, ignorance, and above all, your immense greed. I ask that you take a deep look at this representation of yourself. Your view of you is subjective, as is our view of you. If you continue down this treacherous road, these views will spread further and further apart. Therefore, I must urge you, please hear us. Don't just sit here and listen. Take our ideas into consideration as you have taken an oath to represent them. Prove to us that your character is one that deserves to be remembered and reelected. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. Appreciate your passion, and I seriously do appreciate your time. Thank you. Not a single one of these people wanted new jails. Thank just you so very you know. much. Thank you. <laughs> Mia Soto. That's where the money going. I Kim Powell. Better condition. Edgar. Is it Asitio Pan? Edgar. From Exalt. Elizabeth Hovey, Stephanie Coker. Stephanie Coker, Elizabeth Hovey, Edgar, Asitio Pan, Ikim Powell, Mia Soto. Adria Arnold, Carol St. It looks like St. Clair. We'll take it if you have it. Corporation for Supportive Housing, Carol, not here. Thank you. Santos Rodriguez. So Beth Chevery, Nicole Triplett, Murphy Austin, Enid Faye Owens, Anastasia Tomkin, Althea Stewart, 
Stevens. She's, she went. T.S. Candy. T.S. Michael Edelman, King Downing, Utala, I definitely cannot make up the last name. Sumanier is the last name from the GNA Institute. Yes. Jamie Maleska. Okay. Okay. Thank you, panel, for your diligence. Please state your name. Good evening. My name is Mia Soto. I am the community organizer for the Health Justice Program at the New York Lawyers of the Public Interest, also known as NLPI. NLP's strong commitment to racial equity, healthcare justice, and disability rights in New York has led us to support the work of the Close Rikers Coalition and other grassroots organizations, which are pushing for reform in the criminal justice system and expansion of community investments by the city. After polling the needs of the community, NLP urgently advocates for investments in community-based systems and resources that support and keep people safe, especially those with mental illness. An extensive network of neighborhood mental health services is critical for those with disabilities. Additionally, the city can dis, uh, dis um, sorry, decarcerate a significant number of individuals with mental illness if they are diverted to appropriate community alternative resources. Our criminal justice system reflects a historical and continuing lack of investments in the health and well being of communities. Early intervention in healthcare, housing, employment, and other social services is critical to reducing recidivism for formerly incarcerated and re-entering individuals with mental health needs. This is, therefore, the right moment for the city to change the narrative around mass incarceration and make critical investments in resources that can meet the needs of people with mental and behavioral needs. NLPI calls on the city to listen to the, uh, to the community's consistent demands for more effective healthcare services and greater investments in resources that ensure public safety. Additionally, we strongly urge the city to place the welfare and well-being of communities first. Simply by providing free, quality, community-based mental health services that both prevent and respond to mental health crises. By expanding supportive housing, which is the critical aspect of stability for New Yorkers with mental health needs. Thank you. Oh, thank you. By tackling the unemployment and underemployment of communities ravaged by mass uh, criminalization, and lastly, reinvesting in our schools and education to end the generational cycles of poverty and oppression that have neg negatively impacted our communities. Thank you. Greetings, everybody. My name is Akeem Shamar Powell, and I represent Exalt Youth. Greetings to all ladies and gentlemen, members of the city council and guests. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Akeem Shamal Powell. I'm 25 years old. I'm a recent magna cum laude college graduate of CUNY CSR, College of Staten Island. I achieved the GPA over 3.78, and I have a bachelor's degree in English and African diaspora studies. When I was 16, I had criminal justice contact, and subsequently, I was sent to Rikers. Spending close to a week in the middle of the summer of 2011 on Rikers Island amongst hardened teenagers in an adult facility was where I made a decision to strive for better, going against the tide of teenagers reacting with anger and frustration towards each other, and the jail staff was my motive. Although I was mentally preparing for the violence that I heard many inmates and people who were on the rock also known as Rikers Island, undergone, I knew that this lifestyle wasn't one that I wanted for myself. I told myself I wasn't going back. I completed an educational and workforce program through Exult Youth, and now I work as an alumni instructor for other youths who've been caught up in the system. I'm testifying today in support of borough-based jail. I'm testifying today in support of borough-based jail plans and to close Rikers. Throughout my time spent on Rikers, I had a reality check and an epiphany while in bondage. I wasn't prioritizing my high school education by skipping school and not caring whether I failed or excelled. 
and by taking heed to unconducive peers who, who really didn't care about my um, well-being and wouldn't necessarily help me dictate my destiny. Um, fortunately, I was able to get belt out. However, I don't want no one else to suffer through the same experiences that I've been through, or perhaps even worse, um, that others been through. In conclusion, I feel, like, I feel reassured if the city council will vote in support of this plan to close Rikers forever and provide more support and funds to restorative justice and alternatives to incarceration, like ours. I would like to leave you with an important paraphrase. Tupac once described his thug life acronym to mean, the hate you give to little infants Fs everyone. With Rikers Island closing, we will be deviating from the hate we give and insert much needed compassion, care, and concern for our emerging youth. The love we show today will return by tomorrow. Conversely, the opposite applies equally as well. Thank, Thank you, you for allowing me to testify. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, good evening, honorable city council members, activists, and my people from the neighborhood. My name is Edgar Aktiopan. I am 20 years old, and I am a graduate from Exalt Youth Organization. I am here to tell you that I support this plan to close Rikers and to invest in alternatives to, you, to young people being incarcerated. I will tell you a quote that o Oprah Winfrey said at her 2007 commencement speech. This quote resembles my story of my journey and the transformation of a new me. Sometimes you find out what you're supposed to be doing by doing the things that you aren't supposed to be doing. My story of me being able to stand here and being able to talk in front of you all starts the day I was standing on trial for accidentally assaulting an undercover police officer. During my first few visits to court, things weren't looking so great for me. I, I already had a history of misdemeanors Nothing really major, but I was still, I was, I was looking already at one year to, two, to three years in jail. Um, luckily, thanks to my age and the day of which such action took place, I was given my last and final chance. I was given the choice to attend an alternative program, Exalt Youth. Fortunately, I was given the chance to make the most of my situation and turn my life around, and that's exactly what I did. I am now currently back in high school, I started, I was supposed to start with my first day today, but instead I'm here, making the boys. Um, I'm planning on t attending college, John Jay. That's my main goal right now. Um, sorry, give me a second. <laughs> um, I'm also thanks to thanks to um, Exalt Youth. I will. I am now working at a pay internship and plan on staying out of the system for good. My story is an example why we should close Rikers and support opening community-based facilities. Imagine if someone <coughs> like me would have been sent to Rikers. I would have not be here standing and speaking to you. I would have been there doing dumb things. My environment changed once I was given this chance. Thank you. And Thank you one. so much. Congratulations on all of your accomplishments, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would just like to add how um, I visited Exalt uh, last year and just how um, amazed and moved I am at all the work that, that you're all doing. So I want to thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. <sighs> uh, good evening. My name is Michael Edelman. I'm a member of the Dismantling Racism team at Congregation Beth Elohim in Park Slope, Brooklyn. I favor the closing of Rikers Island, its replacement by smaller, more humane neighborhood jails, and redevelopment of the island. Rikers Island is brutal, spirit-crushing, and inhumane. When I visited Rikers Island for voter registration, the building I was in went on lockdown three separate times. A completely unperturbed officer commented that this was normal, a normal part, I would add, of a systemically racist and unjust system. Many inmates are violent and dangerous people. Some of the guards also commit acts of violence. 
Violence and danger lurk there. Violence breeds and festers there. But many of the accused awaiting trial are actually innocent and harmless people. Remember, when you save one person, you save a world. There are thousands in Rikers right now. What will we do about that? What will we do about them? Maintaining Rikers does a terrible disservice to all involved, the inmates, their families, the guards. An outrageous disservice, an expensive, whether measured in blood and pain, fear and degradation. <laughs> the crime of Rikers Island is committed against human dignity and mankind. The immeasurable sin of Rikers Island is committed against God. So close Rikers Island now. Invest in humanity. Replace it with smaller, more humane neighborhood jails that will provide settings for education and treatment, job training, rehabilitation, and maybe even a little sunlight. The time is now. Thank you. Thank you so very much, panel. Thank you very much for your testimony. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Council Member Steve Levin. I'm taking over for Chair Adams for a few moments. Uh, the next panel, Stephanie Garule from No New Jails. Sophia, sorry, Sophia, Sophia Garule from No New Jails. Caitlin Noss from NYU Prison Education Program. Janaki Jai from Drum. Uh, Dipia Chetri from Drum. Uh, Tsering Chiban from Drum. Uh, and Tareg Brown. Okay. Okay, whoever wants to begin. My name is Sophia Gurule. I'm a queer Chicana public defender in Mott Haven and a resident of East Harlem. Councilmember Ayala represents me in the city council here today. I'm here to say as her constituent that I firmly reject the building of new jails and am deeply upset by her lack of engagement with her constituents. Beyond the obvious facts that caging black and brown people is white supremacy in action and jail building can literally never be called radical decarceration, the city council must reject the ULRP application for two practical reasons. The first is that under the current proposal, there is no legal guarantee to close Rikers. This is particularly alarming where DOC is on record saying that incarcerated people in the current borough based jails will be sent to Rikers during the 10 years it takes to build new jails. So let's be clear. This plan will increase the number of people on Rikers without any legally binding guarantee to get them off of Rikers. The plan does the exact opposite of what it says it will do. The second reason is that the data that the mayor's office is using to call this a decarceration plan is fundamentally flawed. The city keeps saying that closing Rikers without new jails is impossible because they can't reduce the city's jail population to 3,000 by 2026, even though Mock J has publicly stated that the city is way ahead of schedule to significantly reduce the jail population. Judge Littman here today said that the city expects the jail population to be reduced to 4,000 by 2026. So according to the city's own calculations, there is now a difference of 1,000 people preventing them from closing Rikers without building new jails. New York City's jail population consists of people with technical parole violations, people with serious mental health diagnoses, people serving less than one year sentences, and people held in on bail. So when the city says that we can't close Rikers without new jails, what they're saying is that they're building billion dollar jails because the mayor and this city council can't be expected to do the work to get 1,000 people 
off of jails or invest in communities to prevent the circumstances that cause their incarceration. Finally, the city's council's job is to represent the people who, who voted you into the seats that you're sitting in right now. This plan affects all of New York City. Member deference cannot apply in this circumstance. It's offensive to all New Yorkers that people at this table right now, including you, Council Member Levin, are pushing for member deference. Do your job. Close Rikers now. No new jails. Sorry, you have to turn on the microphone. Namaste, my name is Janaki Rai. I'm Almos Queens, I'm a senior in the international high school. I'm a senior in the international high school. I'm a senior in the New York, I'm a senior in the काम आमदनी भाई को सादा दक्षिण एशिया रॉय इंडो कोरिबेन समुदाय संघ अप्रवासी रॉ मजदूर अधिकारी लैंगिक अधिकारी सिसिसिसिक रोजाते नियमा काम करते हो मो यो देश मा देश मा नेपाल बड़ा आए को तीन बर्स भाई मो एक अप्रवासी विद्यार्थी को युवती को ना नाताले मो तपार लाई प्रश्न गणना चांस की जब हमी पढ़ने स्कूल में स्रोत को कमी था, हमी शहर को पैसा ले किन जेल बनाऊं चो, इकहरा और वो डॉलर ले मौजूदो, विद्यार्थी रो, विद्यार्थी रो स्कूल में इंटरप्रेटर को आवश्यकता मिलना सकता, मेरो साथी हर ले मलाय नेपाली में समझाने के साथ मल अपनो पढ़ाई में दें दिनों सकता, मो तीन बरसे समा� हमरो साल में मौजूदगी को लागी खर्चा करने स्रोत था माला स्कूल में गए रस सीखने पढ़ने कुरा बाद आप वही कुछ स्रोत आपको काम ले हो माला गांव बाटा आए कि माला घर में समस्या था रोग घरे ले हिंसा में बाजी की व्यक्ति हो हाल ही में मेरा आमा बाबा ले कुछ पीर गाने एवने गोल्ड दोसो आई हैव नो इंग्लिश बोल my dad mom hit me and I want to go like mom syndrome ma die, children syndrome ma. I was go like there. Um, <laughs> mom boss ni se wa, mom boss ni center ma ramro bevasta the na ro mom pastor has mag boss ni mere boss ni mule boss ni baasak bune pani thau mo bete na ro na ezol बनाऊं नहीं कि ना मौजूदा मौजूदा को लागी स्रोता को व्यवस्था करनी माला है मेरो मानसिक स्वास्थ्य को लागी सौ लाकर आवश्यकता सौ यो सारे कुरा जस को लागी दे रहा आर्थिक स्रोत को अवस्था सौ तर तेजले बारे में बने कि कुरा समित भाई को सही ना एक आर और बहुत डॉलर ले जेल बनाऊं नहीं कि हमें जस्ट लाइ खर्च करने यो सब पैसा ले मोर मेर हमरो समुदाले खर्च करो। I am a mere boy. I have a face lots of my problem in my life. It easy to say but difficult to suffer. I want to say something like I was like uh, when two years come here. I, I'm really I'm I'm really sick and I have no use to my left side thank, body. Thank, my dad yes. say, my dad say like you are doing. Sorry, if, mm, if I can interrupt, um, do, can can maybe your your testimony be translated to 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 the council member? That's yes. what I'm going to do. Okay, okay. So okay. It, um, can we can I, allow for an additional. I will I'll read it out loud now in, in English for her. Okay. Thank so. You. My name is Janaki Rai. I live in Elmhurst, Queens. I am 15 years old. I came from Nepal three years ago, and I go to international high school. I am a member of DRUM, Daisy's Rising Up and Moving. We organize low-income South Asian Indo-Caribbean communities on immigrant, worker, racial, and education, and gender justice. I am a survivor of domestic violence. In the past few years, I have been physically, emotionally, and verbally abused by my parents. Three weeks ago, I was on the verge of becoming homeless, looking for a shelter, finding the resources to support me when I was unstable to take care of myself was close to impossible. As a 15-year-old, I am not eligible to stay in a shelter. There was not a single foster home that speaks the language I do. I was sent from one agency to another looking for housing, legal, and mental health support. I am still looking for a mental health counselor. 
If there were resources in my school or neighborhood that could help mediate what I was going through with my parents, maybe I could not, maybe I would not be knocking on doors of shelters and foster care system. Why are we not talking about physical and mental health of people like me? Why are there not enough resources spent on people like me for our future? Many of the people who want to vote for this plan to build new jails always like to say they want to protect domestic violence victims and survivors like myself, but do not seem to care about what I actually need in the community to be protected. I need you to vote no on spending $11 million to lock our people. I need you to spend $11 billion on preventing domestic violence from happening in the first place. I need you to spend $11 billion on preventing homelessness of young women escaping violence at home. I need you to spend the $11 billion on more interpreters and translations in all languages for the immigrant women who are seeking city services. I need you to spend $11 billion on building more schools instead of jails. Our city's focus needs to be prevention, not prisons. No new jail. <laughs> Support to us, please. And thank you. Um, we're happy to, to assist you through the council with any of the issues that, that we can. So uh, maybe after this testimony, we'll, we'll have make sure that the staff is um, coordinating with you. Please support me, support us. My parents doesn't support me. I work in my Jackson High restaurant. They are give one day forty dollars. I pay my home rent. My dad say like pay to rent. They are kick out me. My mom also kick out me. Nobody support me. I go. I join to drum. And they are support me to Divina and like well <laughs> please support me. We, we, we will help you every way that we can. I need translation okay. in my English school. Thank you. Please Thank you. support me, support us. Don't put the jail this money, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Hello, namaste, good evening to all. My name is Dipina and I'm 16 years old. I'm from International High School for Health Science. I'm living in Queens for two years and I have been member of leader member of DRUM for one and a half years. DRUM stands for Daisy Rising Up and Moving. And we organize low income South Asians and Indo Caribbean communities. I want to ask City Council, why we are spending $11 billion for New Zealand, but we are not using that money on really needed places, like our schools, on extra classes, and free tuitions for colleges. My school doesn't have money to buy equipment for our activities. For the last two years, when I was in astronomy class, we had to ride the train for one hour to another location just to use telescopes. As an immigration kid, I am also want to go to better college, but I'm worried about paying higher tuitions. New York City is 65% pe people of color, which includes immigrant communities. It is a huge problem for black and brown people that the city wants to use $11 billion to build four new jails. We need to use that money so we can have counselors in our schools, not more police and more prisons. As the immigrants, when we see police, we don't feel safe. We get worried that we are going to get our back searched and get sent to detention center or be sent to jail. If there will be new jails, there will, they will try to fill up those empty jails. And as we know, cops mainly target black and brown people. We deserve better than jails. We will be ending the root causes of problems, not putting money into more jails. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Good evening. My name is Shereen Churan. I'm an immigrant from Nepal, and I'm a student at International High School for Health Sciences. 
I'm also a youth member of DRUM, Days is Rising Up and Moving, which organizes 4,500 South Asian and Indo-Caribbean immigrants, workers, and youth in New York City. I want the city to spend $11 billion on schools, education, and hospitals rather than spending money on jails. I have a couple of friends that do not speak English and struggle to understand what is being taught in school. What should invest? We should invest in interpreters in our school so my friend can learn and have the same amount of knowledge like other students. The city should spend the money for free tuition for college and after school programs. This money can go to so many more things like improving our subways, housing, job pro job programs, hospitals, the list of what our communities need is endless. And if you ask anyone in our city, what do they, what do they think the city should spend $11 billion on? No one would say for prison, four more prisons. Everyone would list a lot of things I said today. I don't want our city council members to help Mayor Bill de Blasio to build more jails in NYC to lock up immigrants, young people, poor people and people of color. Investing $11 billion to build four new jails in NYC is not investing in our communities. It's actually stealing money away from the things our communities need. Investing $11 billion into four jails is stealing away our community's future. If you as city council members vote yes on the mayor's plan to lock up our communities, then you are just as guilty and as much of a thief of our, our community's future. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. We've just been informed, just for the record, by Sergeant at Arms, that there are not people outside right currently trying to get inside. So, um, if there, I could, I'll go out and check myself. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, to our our chair, and uh, I'll I'll go confirm that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. I see everybody's still awake. Good. Ricardo, is it Rich, oh, Richard Buonomo? Richard Buonomo? Kelly Smith? Judith Plasco? Marie Fuchs? Caitlin Greco? Marie, good. Mm -hmm. That's one. Valentina Jones. Carolyn Cohen or Cowan. I think that's a, that's a two. Susan Miller. Bill Mitchell. Rabbi David Adelson. Okay. Tina Tynan. Just Leadership, and Joe, Black Youth Project 100. Joe, are you here? Okay, all right. Jeremy Levinson, Natalie, it's either Divine or Perrine, Natalie. Nita Bomani, Cynthia Gao, Sarah Klein, Naeem Islam, Andrew Shapiro, Nasar Buyan, Hannah Black, Diana Colavita, Calvin Miscelli Nelson,
Kami Dominguez, Rose Asaf, Zakia, Carolyn Yao, Hi, um, my name is Marie Fuchs. Um, I was born and raised in Astoria, Queens. Um, I'm a member of the Close Rikers campaign, and I've been a member since uh, September of 2016. This work has been done before me coming in, before people that are in this room coming in. So whoever's here right now, you're very late to the conversation. There's been plenty of community engagement, and if anything, it's an insult. It's an insult for you to come in here and tell other people what plans you want in place when we've been putting in work for such a long time. And I'm gonna tell you one thing, at the end of the day, half the people here that are, um, that are wanting community engagement aren't even from the community. Sorry guys, but coming from, from Kansas, Philly, um, Iowa, and being, a, and being a political science major and, and having no plan, having no plan whatsoever, right? Wanting to abolish it, getting to the same place that we want to be at too, guess what? Those things don't happen unless you have a plan in place. And I'm sorry that I'm not addressing the things that I really should be addressing more so is that at the end of the day, the height of the facility and our land use is one thing, but it's very um, upsetting to know that the people that try to align themselves with the same message have no idea what they're agreeing to, have absolutely no idea, no understanding whatsoever of the work that everybody outside of you guys just coming in five six seven a year whatever at the end of the day there have been a lot of people who've been discriminated against in the system who have been directly impacted and I'm gonna tell you straight up at the end of the day I have mental health issues mental illness whatever the hell you want to call it right you're gonna tell me that you're gonna try to take a service away from somebody because you know what when you're admitted to a hospital, they ask you three questions. Are you a threat to anybody else? Are you a danger to yourself? Are you a danger to your community? I'm gonna tell you, at the end of the day, if you're a legitimate threat to yourself, you're doing everybody a disservice by telling them that they don't need the, the services that they need. And I think that we should be voting in favor of the borough-based plan and the fact that you guys come in here and being disruptive and disrespectful, it's an insult. It's all an image and it's disingenuous. And it's sad, it's filthy, it's, it's horrible. Thank you for your testimony. Hi. Turn on your microphone. My name is Tina Tynan, and I'm here to urge you to vote yes on this proposal. I was in and out of Rikers at least 20 times um, because I had drug-related offenses. And being housed in subhuman accommodations, mice, water bugs, showers with horrific mold, and being monitored by petty, immature, disgruntled officers, it created a savage because every time I was released, I would then use an excessive amount of drugs to compensate for the way I felt while on Rikers. People are isolated and forgotten about on Rikers Island. I received visits, but those slowly dwindled down because the people that come to see you are subjected to an all day clown show where the officers are, are really aggressive. They treat the visitors the same as they treat the people locked up there because on the flip side, I visited people as well. But, The city council needs to fund alternatives to incarceration. People with drug problems, people with mental health problems, they need to be offered treatment. Jail sentences did nothing to stop my drug problem. 
Those who are detained need to be held, you know, those that, that are detained need to be held in facilities with conditions that are fit for humans because Rikers doesn't offer that. Please vote yes on this proposal to sh Thank you. Vote yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Joe. I'll be speaking on behalf of Black Youth Project 100 in opposition to the new jail or pro-jail plan. Many speakers have promoted today the false pragmatic binary that we either accept Rikers or we accept $10 billion to create four new jails in every borough, save for Staten Island, alongside a non-binding commitment to close Rikers nearly a decade from now. Oddly enough, to these people, it seems utopian to make a principled call for the end of Rikers alongside a refusal of the creation of any new cages. Some history may help us in clarifying why the, new jail, why the new jail plan is simultaneously entirely unrealistic and sadistic. As many of us recognize, American prisons have long had an intimate link to the racist and exploitative logic of slavery, but we need not start so far back. Mass incarceration, the expansion of the incarcerated population from 300,000 to just over 2 million began in the 1970s as the civil rights movement and the racial liberation movements forced reforms that enabled formal integration into the welfare net the state so consistently denied to native black and brown people before. The state retracted jobs, housing, and redistribution programs, enforced, enforced cataclysmic austerity, and shipped its racist exploitation abroad. Starting almost immediately, the programs of this country that offered some modicum of aid and health were replaced with cages for people the state no longer viewed as useful for their profit. Black, brown, transgender, non-binary, and migrant communities whose inclusion in American society had threatened the apartheid structure that it held it up, while all were all swallowed up in cages. This country then proceeded to build up a parasitic puni punitive geography of prisons, jails, mental asylums, correctional facilities, detention centers, and migration camps. Um, Rikers is only an exceptional product of the prison culture we have. Every new jail that is built will be filled as they have around the world time and time again over the past few hundred years. I wish to offer one more small history lesson. The Ku Klux Klan as a white power paramilitary operated in ways that the respected Southern gentry could not because they lost confidence in the power of Southern ex-Confederate governments to sustain white power. If the new jail plan succeeds, and I mean this with all due respect, the New York State and New York City can rest assured that they will not need the Klan, having instead its unholy trinity of the NYPD, the Department of Corrections, and their snake oil salesmen and governmental and non-governmental organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everybody. My name is Naeem Islam. Um, I live in Jackson Heights, Queens, and I've been living in Queens since 2002 when at the age of nine I came to the U.S. as an immigrant. I don't know if that qualifies me according to some folks' standards to be a New Yorker, but I consider myself a New Yorker and I'm from here. Um, I want to first begin by saying that, you know, a lot of my work in the community is addressing the intersections of the immigration system and the criminal justice system. As many before me have mentioned, the impact these new jails will have on our immigrant communities, I won't repeat their words. But I also want to acknowledge that the fact that we're having this conversation right now about closing Rikers is because of the work Decades of work, people impacted by Rikers, people hurt by Rikers have done, people that are continued to be hurt by Rikers are doing. That's why we're having this conversation, and it's about time that the city listens and shuts down Rikers. But replacing Rikers with four new jails is not the way to do it. This is a false choice, as other, many others have said. This is a false choice that is being put on us, put on our communities by the city. This is a false choice that the city council is upholding through this process. We don't, we, we can have mental health support, we can have rehabilitation, we can have medical support and any kind of material needs without jails. As others have mentioned before, how you vote on this issue will be your legacy. It's your choice whether you want to be remembered 
as furthering mass incarceration or not. Shut down Rikers, don't invest in jails, invest in people. And last thing I wanna add is that if you cannot imagine a world without jails, try harder. And when you can, we'll be here. Also, don't align me with racism ever again. I'm not racist at all, and don't ever think that. It's completely ridiculous for you to come at me with some don't bullshit like that. Don't please. I was so talking about the white people in here, the political science fucking majors that go to Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sir, please go on with your testimony. Thank you very much. We're sorry for the disrespect. Thank you. Please don't call me sir. Um, I'm issuing this statement on behalf of Carolyn Yao. I'm a lifelong New Yorker and currently an educator at CUNY. I oppose the borough-based jail plan and believe Rikers should be closed yesterday. I do not think the way to close Rikers is to open four new skyscraper jails. I don't believe that the same system that cheats people out of livable housing, education, access to food and health care is the same system that is interested in rehabilitating. And even more, I don't think the same system which profits from private contracts to prison construction and food as well as the contracting of prison workers for pennies an hour is trying to decarcerate. It certainly does not care about the dignity of people's lives. Four more prisons means four more revolving doors on cages where the system wants to dispose of black and brown people just living their lives. More prisons means more places to put people who commit crimes of survival, more room for people in for a bail they cannot afford or sometimes don't even know the amount of, more room to keep people just waiting trial, which is most of Rikers, by the way. We do not need friendly neighborhood jails with a Starbucks underneath, especially since the same racist CEOs will be running them. It's not the shape, name, or location of the jail, but about the system. History tells us everything. The testimonies from the formerly incarcerated community to members today also tell us the city has never batted an eye at the level of neglect and abuse in jails. Rikers was once advertised as the most humane jail in its day as well. Why would we believe that the city would take input on new borough-based jails when they won't end the human rights abuses happening right here and now? To reiterate what so many have said before, we need real commitments toward the future. That means money, $11 billion at least, to tackling the crises of NYCHA repairs and schools not having enough supplies, programs, and teachers, just to name a few. Vote no on this jail expansion plan. Thank you. Thank you, panel, for your testimony. Nabil Hussain. Charles Lay, Nusrat Ziba, that's a re re run. Aaron Narap Fernando, Albert St. John, Rosalie Henderson, James Henderson, when I say close, you say right, close. and Jose close. Saldana. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gone through all of the appearance cards. If you wish to testify and have not, this is your final opportunity to do so. Please fill out a, uh, an appearance card. If not, this is our final panel of the evening. Panel, please remember to state your name. You may begin when you're ready. Scott? Okay. My name is Jose Saldano. I am the director of the Release Aging People in Prison Campaign, a grassroots community organizing uh, uh, campaign. I am also formerly incarcerated. Roughly 20 months ago, I was released from state prison after serving close to 40 years in prisons throughout the state of New York. And contrary to you, what you might have heard today, there are no good prisons. Jails. Prisons and correctional facilities are cruel, inhumane, and oppressive places. 
They are an extension of slavery. They destroy entire communities and the lives of all those entangled in them. They do not keep us safe. Prisons and jails are also part of a system designed to neutralize resistance to racism and systemic injustice and have caused irreparable harm to black and brown people nationwide. As a fundamental principle, RAP, the release aging people in prison, opposes prisons, jails, and a criminal legal system rooted in retribution, revenge, and perpetual punishment. The plan to close Rikers Island and, and build new barrel-based jails constitute nothing more than a transfer of torture and the continuation of mass incarceration. Billions of dollars that could and should be used to address our city's lack of affordable housing, adequate health care, and strong community programs is instead being offered to further warehouse our people. RAP opposes jails and prisons of all shapes and sizes and demand that Rikers be immediately and permanently closed. We demand that the City Planning Committee vote against the New York City Borough-based Jails Plan and instead vote to serve the interests of the people instead of serving the interests of capitalism and slavery. Thank you. And I do commend RAP. I commend RAP for all of the work that that organization has done throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Charlie Lai. I'm the director of Chong Park, the building that physically shares a common wall with the Manhattan Detention Center. 37 years ago, 12,000 Chinatown residents protested against the city's plan to build another jail there. The city ignored the community and built it anyway. The proposed 450-foot jail will most directly and severely impact us. The massive replacement would be three times taller than the, our 13-story building and overshadow every other building in the area. This jail could wreak havoc and lasting damage to our senior citizens' uh, housing project, daycare center, health clinic, and 14 small businesses. We are truly afraid that the proposed demolition and construction could threaten and or damage the physical stability and the very foundation of our building complex. But more importantly, we are gravely concerned about the psychosocial, physical health, and safety of our 105 low-income seniors who reside in our building. Our building complex meets the diverse needs of the neighborhood. We are a vital asset to the socioeconomic well-being of the extended Chinatown area. We, of course, want to make sure our building complex and our seniors are protected. We sincerely appreciate the many city agencies, the council staff, council member Chen, Borough President Brewer's active support and attention, but we are an integrated community. We cannot exist without all of our neighbors' ability to thrive. This new jail impacts our entire neighborhood, Tribeca, Soho, Little Italy, and Chinatown. All of our voices and needs must be heard and addressed. Chinatown supports the elimination of the humane conditions, the humane conditions at Rikers. However, it is a huge mistake to madly rush to pass the jails plan without better population numbers, the specific program needs, the jails design, the environmental impacts, and its true financial costs, and a publicly articulated mitigation plan for Chinatown and the other sites. The city council must lead a stronger citywide engagement and democratic process. It is smart planning and responsible governance. Thank you. Peace to those willing to fight for it. My name is Nabil Hussain, and I am one of the organizers of No New Jails NYC. My reasons for saying No New Jails are too many to fit in the paltry two minutes that we get in this absurd Euler process. So today, surrounded by portraits of the white supremacist slaveholders who enslaved my ancestors and perpetrated genocide against the native people of this land and their lying ass quotes about equality, I'll just go ahead and confine my remarks to land use. The land use process that this settler colonizer government is using to expand jails on stolen Lenape territory is completely illegitimate. It is anti-democratic from top to bottom. For the city council, which holds ultimate power in this process, to have just one hearing on the first day of school is just the latest example of their obvious disregard for community input that does not support their predetermined outcome. But we showed up anyway to speak some basic truths. Starting with the fact that this plan to expand jails and leave Rikers open past your time in office has no guarantee that Rikers will close. 
I'm not sure why anyone believes one word from the lying mouth of the mayor who rehired Rudy Giuliani's racist police commissioner, increased the police budget by $100 million to hire 1,300 more cops, and did nothing to hold accountable the police murderers of Saheed Vessel, Dwayne June, Chantel Davis, and more other black folks just in my neighborhood than I can name. Now he's some criminal justice reformer. It's a sick joke that would actually be funny if it might not have generational consequences. This land use proposal to build the tallest skyscraper jails in the world would literally cement a future of incarceration for New York City. Rikers itself was opened as a reform, and there is no reason to believe that this latest attempt to build a humane cage will turn out differently than each other time it has failed. We already know that modern jails and residential neighborhoods are also torture chambers. Look at MDC without heat in the winter. Look at the Brooklyn Detention Center. Look at the tombs. The entire system has got to go, but this jail expansion plan would only entrench it. Let me close by saying that the cowardice of leader Corey Johnson and other council members throughout this process will not soon be forgotten. Just the other day, it was reported that you, council member Stephen Levin, tried to bully other council members into falling into line with member deference and then denied it after you got caught lying on an audio recording. But member deference will not save you from being held accountable for your actions. Reject this land use proposal and spend the money on the real needs of our communities, for education, for housing, including NYCHA repair, for healthcare, including mental health care. You need to shut down Rikers immediately and permanently without building new Thank cages you. to perpetuate the same harm. Thank Close you. Rikers now and no new jails. Thank you very much. Peace. My name is Albert St. Jean. Um, I'm an organizer with No New Jails and also with the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Um, I am also a descendant of uh, Haitian freedom fighters, but we didn't kill our masses and burn down plantations to reform plantations and make smaller ones. I just wanted to get that out there. And that especially goes for the NIMBY folks who are saying no new jails and trying to ride our way, but still saying we should keep Rikers open. Get off it. There's no way we're going to reform a plantation. We want Rikers closed and we want no new jails. Um, and it's also ironic that today you choose to have this on the first day of school. It shows how like transparent you are with the community. I guess this is what democracy looks like and shows your dedication to democracy. If you really want to show your dedication to democracy, talk to your constituents about this plan. Talk to people who are directly impacted, who have been to Rikers Island, but not people who are involved with either of our campaigns. Not people that are involved with no new jails or close Rikers. Go out to the community and talk to people about this plan and see what their reaction is, because we did that. We have it on video. When we talked about what the city could do with $11 billion after closing Rikers, nobody, nobody said new jails. Everybody said all the same things that we're all saying here now. We need more mental health resources. We need more counselors in our schools. We need more things for our youth. We need to invest in NYCHA. It's asinine to me that at the same moment that we're privatizing NYCHA, claiming that we don't have the money for it, essentially privatizing a third of it, yet we are spending $11 billion for new jails. And I've seen the charge for the um, projected expenses for the capital funds in the next 10 years. The new jails outpace everything, everything. That doesn't make any sense. How are you decarcerating by pumping $10 billion into new jails? That's asinine to me. And also, just real quick, having gone to immigration court, I see that mo it's not about just the bars and the mortar that goes into Rikers. It's the system itself that feeds people into the deportation pipeline and the school to prison pipeline. This is what we need to address, how people get in there in the first place. Thank you. Hello, council people. My name is Rosalie. Um, I study health promotion and behavioral sciences, and I'm a community advocate. I firmly reject the plan to build four new jails in each borough. Um, how many of us actually know the history of how Rikers came to be? Uh, Rikers is named for Magistrate Richard Riker, of course, Esquire, who, um, just a little bit about him, his, con his contemptible side gig included uh, rubber stamping from his judge's bench, the paperwork that allowed free black men, women, and children to be kidnapped off the streets of New York City and trafficked down south as slaves. Um, I want to remind everyone in this room that council members currently receive $148,500 a year in base salary, which the council, the council people themselves increased from $112,000 back in early 2016. How can the people who, who are charged with representing our communities have missed 
the mark so blatantly. Many of you have been supposed tireless advocates for the rights of senior citizens, advocates of putting an end to gun violence and securing house housing for marginalized people, yet you seem to be unaware of the jarring statistics around criminalization of, of black and brown people in New York State. Um, to sort of echo what Jose from RAP was saying earlier, the, the number of people aged 50 and older in New York um, in, in incarcerated has doubled since 2000. It now exceeds 10,000, uh, which is, which is 20, about 20% 20 of the New York State uh, prison population. This this obviously reflects a crisis in our prison system and an extension of the culture of revenge and punishment into all areas of our society. All, any scientist, any person who has been in a psychology class knows the results of the Milgram experiment, which is that punishment does not work. All council members have this golden opportunity to end cycles of violence and poverty once and for all. Many of the people on city council, yourself included, Diana, are familiar with the issues of city po poverty, homelessness, violence, and gentrification, yet you all, um, you all are standing in a very, very particular position to end um, the deaths and, and abuse of many, many people in the system. New York failed Leilene Polanco, a black transgender Afro-Latinx woman who died at Rikers due to complications with her epilepsy. New York failed Kayleaf Browder. Um, excuse me. He would not have been, he should not have been tried as an adult or had prosecutors, defenders, and judges so overwhelmed with cases that he waited three years for trial. Excuse me. He should not have spent one day being abused by guards. Thank you, those of you who are making direct eye contact with me right now, and others who are incarcerated there. Council people, stand on the right side of history. Do the right thing. Use the money, use the $11 billion to do what is right for our community, us who voted you into these positions, what we want, what every person in this room wants. Thank Do you. not continue the legacy of Chattel slavery, Jim Crow, and Magistrate Rikers in keeping this jail open. Close Rikers now, no new jails. Thank, Thank you. you very much. My name is James Henderson, and I wholeheartedly oppose this plan to incarcerate more of my neighbors, friends, and family. To claim that this plan is the only way to close Rikers Island is to believe that societal change can only come about if it is given to us incrementally by the ruling class, by these wheeling and dealing government officials who expected their jail expansion plan to be a done deal before the abolitionists and Marxists showed up. These officials cannot be trusted when they say that they will close Rikers once the new jails are built. These officials cannot be trusted when they say that the new jails will be humane. These officials who make $148,500 a year cannot even be trusted to show up to their own meetings. We have to dream bigger and beyond this lose-lose situation presented to us and our city. city. If these jails are built, we will only find ourselves attempting to reform the human rights, rights abuses therein later down the road. The indiscriminate inhumanity of the prison industrial complex is by design, not by accident. Why? Because capitalists profit by caging the working class, especially black and brown people. The only way to ensure that the cesspool of abuse, Rikers Island, is shuttered for good, with no new jails, is to demand it at every turn. Demand $11 billion for schools, housing, health care. Demand a better future. No new jails for New York City. Thank you all very much for your very passionate testimony. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And we do have one more panel. We're going to call up Amy Tong, Alex, Mateo, Tabares, and Jocelyn. This will be our final panel of the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh shit, let me shut this off. <coughs> Panel, I welcome you. I congratulate you for making it through to being our final panel of the evening. So please state your name and you may begin. Hi, my name is Amy Tong and I live in Williamsburg in Council Member Reynoso's district and I work as a teen health educator in Chinatown in Council Member Chin's district. So let me tell you about my day. Today, I went to work. I talked to a bunch of teens about nutrition and exercise, gender and sexuality, STIs, birth control. 
we're having these kinds of conversations that they don't get in their schools, that they don't get in jails. Um, and then I came over here to try to come to the city hall, and I waited at line for an hour for my lunch break because they wouldn't let us in, and then I went back to work. And I talked to more teens, and then I came back again just now, and they, the cops outside told us that the room was at capacity. And for, so there's a live stream right now. And for those who can't see on the live stream, there are hundreds of seats open. And for those who, do, like, the fact that there is a live stream and you're telling us that there are no seats available, and this is like a very public thing, why, what makes you, what, why should we trust you? Why should we trust the Department of Corrections to institute better jail systems? So I am firmly against the creation of new jails, and I am in support of closing Rikers, and both of those things can happen at once. As I was just saying, we have no reason to trust the Department of Corrections. These new jails would continue the inhumane use of solitary confinement, and they would do nothing to hold the DOC accountable for the same violence they continue to commit at Rikers and other jails around the city. The land use application that we are discussing today includes no concrete plan to close Rikers. And when we were standing outside, the, the people told us everyone inside wants to go home. Well, first, have more hearings, talk to more people. Second, everyone in, that you are keeping in these cages also wants to go home. And they have been trapped there for years on bail and on everything that should not be keeping them there. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Mateo, and I'm going to be reading a statement uh, from Decrim New York in support of no new jails. Decrim New York seeks to decriminalize, decarcerate, and destigmatize the sex trades in New York City and state, and work towards real safety for all people who trade sex by choice, circumstance, or coercion. We recognize that the same communities most severely impacted by criminalization of sex trade-related offenses are the same communities most severely impacted by criminalization and incarceration overall. People who are black, brown, trans, queer, disabled, undocumented, ex and experiencing poverty and homeless. Our communities need more resources, not more policing, and not more uh, criminalization. Criminalization and incarceration are ineffective strategies for improving community safety. In fact, by pushing the sex trade on the ground and making it dangerous for those trading sex um, to access support and resources, criminalization and incarceration exacerbate trafficking and exploitation in the sex trades. Further, criminalization creates barriers to housing and alternative, and alternative forms of employment, and in and, in and of themselves, jails and prisons are not safe. Neither are court-tied diversion services, as the Lim Polanco's case has shown us. Her diversion into the Human Trafficking Intervention Court ultimately resulted in her death when bail was set on the original uh, sex work-related charge she received after she missed a court date. And while sex trade related charges in New York City do not account for the entirety of Rikers population, for a significant number of our community members, law enforcement use sex work as an excuse to stop and frisk, harass, and arrest people frequently profiled as sex workers, often resulting in other charges that lead to incarceration. A current proposal before the New York City Council will build for new four borough-based jails without any guaranteed commitment to close Rikers Island. This proposal fails to address the needs of our communities in communities more severely impacted by violence and criminalization. Decrim New York urges the City Council to listen to the demands of non-new jails movement to stop the construction of new jails in New York City and redirect 11 billion in public funding away from jail construction and toward resources that build real community safety. Decrim New York urges the City Council to vote no on the proposal for a borough-based jail system in New York City. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alex. Um, I live in Council Member Robert Cornegie's district, and I support closing Rikers immediately without building new jails. The real questions being asked today aren't even about land use, and they're not about closing Rikers either. The questions being asked today are, should we build more cages to put New Yorkers in, and should New York commit to continuing the violence of incarceration? And it's my strong belief that the answer to both of those is no. Building more jails is itself a violent act. Continuing to criminalize poverty and mental illness, putting those in most need of support in cages instead, is a violence. Holding people in jails before they've even been tried for a crime is violence. Brutalizing and traumatizing those who have committed violence and then putting them back in their communities with no resources is part of that cycle of violence. 
gatekeeping mental health and addiction services so that they can only be accessed inside jails is violence. And to be clear, all of that violence is disproportionately enacted on bra black, brown, and indigenous people of color. The inherent violence of incarceration isn't unique to Rikers, and it won't end if new jails are built. Today's land use proposal doesn't even provide a plan for closing Rikers, just a plan to build four new jails. Instead of spending 11 million on human cages, we have the opportunity to spend 11 million on our communities, making sure those around us are housed, fed, and cared for, whether that's health, mental health, education services, everything that everybody has suggested today. You have the power and opportunity here to take a major step towards ending incarceration and ending that violence. Healthy communities are how we create safety. Prisons are not. No new jails. Hi, everyone. Uh, is everyone hearing me? Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Jocelyn. Uh, I am a member of No New Jails, and I'm going to be reading uh, a statement from my comrade, Ashe, who, uh, who had to leave. Uh, it's a really elegant and really powerful speech. Unfortunately, the uh, two-minute uh, time frame we are given uh, will not allow me to read the entire thing, so I'm going to read an excerpt. Prison is a system set up to punish, torture, victimize, and dehumanize people. America has the highest number of incarceration in the whole world. 41% of juveniles are arrested by the time they turn 23. Children as young as 13 years have been sentenced to die in prison, and our prisons violate the international standard. Solitary, solitary confinement increases instability, and by international law, is considered torture. The mayor is claiming that he will close Rikers in 2027, but we all know that in 2027, the mayor will not be in the office to close Rikers. The mayor is also currently spending over one billion taxpayer dollars, oops, one second, to, oh my God, why is my phone like this? To rent, ren, oh my God, to uh, fix Rikers and what that implies is that Rikers Island will still be open in 2027. And four massive jails will be built to incarcerate black and brown people. The mayor also claimed that closing Rikers is only possible if he builds new jails but well, the focus should be to end the broken window policing, which will prevent our people from going to jail. We are here today to demand that the mayor end homelessness by using 10 billion to house every homeless person in New York City. We demand that the mayor strengthen NYCHA by using 10 billion to repair NYCHA and create high quality, affordable, and sustainable housing for our community. We demand that the mayor transform mental health by building holistic mental health facilities that can serve all New Yorkers with 10 billion. As abolitionists, we are demanding that the mayor listen to everyone and make reforms that do not increase funding, staffing, or legitimacy to prison, but work towards freeing everyone. And we call for massive community investment to address the needs of our communities targeted by criminalization. Thank you for your testimony. No new jails, not now, not ever. Thank you very much for your testimony, panel. Thank you, all panelists, panel, panelists. Thank you, panel. Thank you to the administration that started us off with testimony this morning. Thank you to my colleagues. Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify on these land use items? Seeing none, I now close today's public hearing and these items are laid over. I would like to thank all members of the public, my colleagues, council, and land use staff who are attending today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>